single malt drama, a mafia romantic comedy, Bourbon Street Bad Boys Club Book 3, written by Catherine M. Hurst, narrated by Charlotte Claremont and Aaron Shedlock. Chapter 1, Marco The movies got it all wrong. Scarface, The Godfather, Goodfellas were great flicks, but they only showed the splashy side of the mafia. In reality, the day-to-day -day operations created a metric assload of paperwork. Depending on the day, there were contracts to write, business acquisitions to oversee, and lawsuits. Always a new freaking lawsuit. That's where I came in. Marco Cesare Marchioni, attorney for the mob, or my family's part of it anyway. On paper, the Marchioni Corporation was a multi-billion dollar enterprise with hotels, restaurants, and bars on all seven continents. But like the movies, the reality didn't live up to the hype. The majority of our properties would have gone under years ago, if not for the river of profits from other mafiosi's illegal activities. After Joe, my eldest brother, was murdered, Gabe had taken his place as capo of the family, and my workload had quadrupled. Not because he'd earned himself a seat at the mafia's version of the big boy's table or the fratellanza. That would have been too easy. Nope. Gabe had decided to get us out of the mob, which was a good thing, except for the paperwork. Granted, my current office was a pool deck overlooking the Mediterranean Sea, and I'd traded in my suit and tie for board shorts. However, I had a lot more to worry about than checking items off my to-do list. One mistake, real or imagined, could mean blowing up an already escalating mob war. Gabe clamped a hand on my shoulder. How's it going? I added another name to the ever-growing list of companies to dump and set the laptop aside. If we get rid of anything that isn't turning a profit without dirty money, we're looking at selling 75% of our holdings. That's less than I was expecting. Frowning, he glanced over the water. My entire fam damnly had come to Sicily for Gabe's wedding, but what was supposed to be a two-week vacation had turned into an indefinite stay. I, for one, was ready to get back to my regularly scheduled life in New Orleans. However, that couldn't happen until Gabe brokered a peace agreement with the other mob families. How's Pops? My father lived on borrowed time. Stage four lung cancer had seen to that. While I'd never call our relationship close, watching him suffer sucked. Not to mention, sitting around waiting for him to die made me feel like an asshole. He's resting. It's been an eventful morning. So I heard. What was with all the shouting? I love my big fat Italian family, but I often wish they came with a mute button. Gabe scratched his jaw. Enzo royally screwed up. Between his tone and the mention of our brother, my heart rate picked up speed. A couple of rival mob families had a problem with us walking away from the Cosa Nostra. One capo in particular demanded an ungodly payoff. Time to make alternative arrangements for his money laundering needs and for Enzo to marry his daughter. Praying my brother's mistake didn't have anything to do with him going through with the wedding to Nicolina Lazio, I asked, fucked up how? He forgot to turn off the security cameras before he and Shauna got creative with a bottle of wine. Gabe cracked a grin. The feeds from the mansion go directly to Marchioni Corp's security offices. My God, anyone with clearance can access the recordings. I could only imagine the hilarity that had ensued when the security team got a look at Enzo's do-it-yourself porno. Yep, needless to say, Ma had a fit. I feel bad for Shauna. Ma had a problem with her from the moment she set foot in this house. I thought she'd pop an aneurysm when she found out you'd sent Enzo back to New Orleans with her. I felt bad for Enzo as well, but for different reasons. His heart had always been three sizes too small, but it had grown when he'd met Shauna. Gabe chuckled. Enzo will do what he wants, regardless of Ma's feelings on the matter, but Shauna's liable to put his balls in a jar when she finds out about this. If she doesn't, I'd say it's true love. I admired his optimism, but to quote Tina Turner, what's love got to do with it? Does it matter? The situation with the Lazios isn't going away. Gabe's expression darkened. Like I've said before, we aren't living in a Jane fucking Austen novel. I'm not selling our brother's hand in marriage to get the rest of us out of the business. I appreciated his sentiment, even if it was naive. For what it's worth, Nico doesn't want the marriage either, Gabe smirked. She sure as hell acted like it. Did she? I wiggled my brows. For once, being in the friend zone had its advantages. Namely, Nico had confided in me. One, she hung on Enzo like an ornament. Two, she was homicidally jealous of Shauna. Three, his eyes widened, and the proverbial light bulb came on over his head. 
You mean to tell me she was behaving like a two-year-old coming off a sugar bender because she didn't want to be with Enzo? I tapped the side of my nose. Never let anyone make you think you don't have a brain beneath all that long flowing hair. He flipped me the finger. Now that you mention it, her behavior did seem over the top. What can I say? None of you know her like I do. I'd worship the ground Nicolino Lazio's red soul Christian Louboutins walked on since I stopped believing girls had cooties. What man in his right mind wouldn't? Nico was a model, a wannabe fashion designer, and had a whip sharp sense of humor. Unfortunately for me, she'd friend zoned me at the age of nine. Back then, she preferred older men, namely my brothers. By the time she came of age, my mother and Nico's father had decided she was best suited for Enzo. I absolutely disagreed, but I hadn't gotten a vote. Until now. Stretching out on the lounge chair, I placed my hands behind my head. Nico could marry another Marchione. He winked, but the tension in his jaw ruined the effect. You'd throw our baby brother under the bus. Dante's still in grad school, and I'm not sure he's had his first kiss, let alone dated. Joking or not, Gabe wasn't completely wrong about Dante. While I'd spent more time playing the field than Babe Ruth, Mickey Mantle, and Hank Aaron combined, our baby brother had warmed the bench. Mostly. I met Gabe's gaze and used my professional attorney voice. One of us has to marry the supermodel. I'm willing to take one for the team. He folded his arms and gave me a look that reminded me way too much of our father. No one in this family is marrying Nicolina Lazio. Capisci? Capisco. I understood he wanted to protect us, but that didn't mean I agreed with him. Someone had to do what was best for the family, and it looked like that someone would be me. My phone dinged with an incoming text. I checked the screen and shot upright. Speaking of the devil and Prada, Gabe arched a brow. Is that panic on your face because of business or pleasure? It's personal. I stood and waved the phone. I need to make a call. Are we done here? As long as you stay the hell away from Nico, we're good. No can do, bro. Sure, whatever. I offered a solution, you declined. What do I care? He gave me a curious expression and walked into the house. Shoving my feet in my shoes, I hit redial. Nico answered in the first ring. Marco, thank God. Are you alone? I'm working on it. I grabbed my towel and headed down the steep path to the beach. What's going on? I'm not sure what changed, but my father just announced mine and Enzo's wedding date. She sounded tired and stuffy as if she'd been crying. It's in five days. Keeping my voice low, I said, let's just say my parents got an eyeful of how much Enzo likes Shauna Isaac this morning. Oh, she went quiet. What the hell? Is she upset he's with another woman? Does she have feelings for him after all? This only proves my point, Nico sighed. Enzo and I can't go through with this wedding. We will both end up miserable and bitter. I wanted to run an idea past her, but it didn't seem like the right time. Then again, was it ever a good idea to propose over the phone? I know, Nick, I know. But what are you going to do? I went with my father to speak to our priest this morning. My brain stopped working, so much so, I tripped over a rock and nearly face-planted. You spoke to the man who's going to marry you to my brother? Yes, she lowered her voice. But he cannot perform the ceremony if there's no bride. Pinching the bridge of my nose, I said, I'm not following you. I pretended to go along with it. When my father dismissed me, I made up an excuse. I needed to see the baker. Instead, I went to visit Maria and Alessio. Your old nanny and groundskeeper? I remembered the couple. They'd practically raised her after her mother had passed away. Yes, I told them a little of what is happening, and they have agreed to help me escape. This time, my brain not only stopped working, but smoke seeped from my ears. Are you crazy? Your father will have them and everyone they love murdered. They're leaving Trapani, her voice thinned. I'm going to help them join their family in America. I hated this idea more than I hated her father for putting her in this position. Do you even have a plan? Alessio and Maria are meeting me on the beach with a boat, but it is too small to get to the airport in Pantelleria fast enough, which is why I need your help. I'm happy to smuggle them into the U.S., and afterward, I'll whisk you away to some exotic corner of the world, preferably a corner with a clothing-optional beach. Truer words had never been spoken. I wasn't exactly a happily ever after kind of guy, but a few months with Nico's legs wrapped around my waist wouldn't suck. This is not the time for jokes, she sighed. Who's joking? Sorry, go on. Remember when you said to call you if I needed anything? Oh boy, 
Yes? I need you to meet us off the coast of Formica tomorrow morning. Please, tell me you have access to your family's yacht. I do. If I can convince Gabe to let me off the compound long enough to meet her, I'd find a way. I had to. I'd always been a sucker for a damsel in distress, especially when that damsel was Nico. What time? They're meeting me before sunrise. I did some quick mental math. The trip to Trapani was nothing to sneeze at. Even at cruising speed, it would take six or seven hours to reach her. If I was late, she'd be a sitting duck. Formica is too exposed. Go to our secret place on Levanzo. We can hide Alessio's boat in the cave. The memory of the first time we'd run away from home together crossed my mind. We had been 10 or 11 years old and determined to escape our overbearing families. The two days we'd spent on the tiny Agadian island had been amazing, at least until my father's men had found us by tracking my phone. Don't forget to turn off your cell this time, Nico laughed. Ha ha, are you sure about this? I have never been more sure. I absolutely hated this plan. She was taking an enormous risk by defying her father. I didn't want to think about what would happen if she was caught trying to escape. Nick, I hate to state the obvious, but airports, ferry terminals, and train stations are the first place your father will look. She sighed. I know, but I'm praying he'll search larger places first. If so, we will make it to Pantelleria before his men. Pietro Lazio had an army of employees at his disposal. Some would undoubtedly head to the island. There was no way in hell we would arrive before them. No yacht could outrun a helicopter. Forget Pantelleria. I'm bringing you back here and putting you on the Marchioni Corporation jet. No Lazio would dare set foot in Comiso, not with the current tensions. Current tensions was putting it mildly. A couple of weeks ago, someone had fired shots over Enzo's head. A few days later, armed men had been apprehended in the crowd at Gabe's wedding. The escalating violence wasn't restricted to Sicily. It had spilled over to New Orleans. Enzo's restaurant had been ransacked and his girlfriend's apartment had been burned down. While Pietro Lazio denied any involvement, my brothers and I believed he'd issued the orders. Think about it. It's summer. There are thousands of boats around the islands. Yes, but no buts. My father has spies everywhere, even in Comiso. If he found out I left Sicily on your family's plane, Nico went quiet. It's better if you only take us to Pantelleria. Rather than argue, I decided to table the conversation. I'd have hours at sea to change her mind. Promise me you'll be careful. I promise. She drew a breath. I will text you from my burner phone once we are offshore. And before you leave the house. Reluctant to end the call, I said, we could put Maria and Alessio on the plane, and we could take the yacht to Malta, Santorini. I hear Cyprus is nice this time of year. There is no we, Marco. I have to get them to the United States, and then I must disappear, alone. Yep, I hated this plan. Can you at least tell me where you're going? It's probably best if I don't tell you everything. Nico sighed again. I should go. I stared at the phone after she disconnected. One way or another, sweetheart, I'm going to convince you to become my wife. For a few months, anyway. Chapter Two Nicolina Elliptical machines were great cardio, but let's be honest, working out in a gym doesn't prepare a girl for the real world. Not when said girl is running for her life from the very people who should protect her. I reached the edge of the manicured lawn and took one last glance back at my ancestral home. Portions of the rough stone walls had been built in the 12th century as part of a military fortress. Fitting, considering the mansion had been my prison since I had the misfortune of being born into the Lazio family. Nico, stop! My brother, Giancarlo, charged across the grass. I half ran and half slid down the stony cliff leading to the Mediterranean Sea. As a child, I'd played on these rocks. I knew the terrain, where to step, where to avoid, and how to win a race to the water's edge. More voices called after me, but I couldn't stop moving. Gravity and my force of will saw to that. My father's guards had joined my brother's efforts to bring me back inside. While they had guns and knew how to use them, I doubted they'd shoot me. Then again, the hideous wedding gown my father had ordered would hide most gunshot wounds. 
I reached the small private cove and picked up my pace. Thigh muscles screaming, I sprinted across the shore toward freedom. Though I had no earthly idea what my life would be like in a month, a year, a decade, I much preferred to look at the situation as running toward something new, as opposed to running away from home. Someone fired a warning shot over my head, but I didn't slow. I had one chance at escape, and I intended to take it. The alternative was more than I could bear. A lifetime married to a man I didn't love. Alessio stood ramrod straight at the water's edge. He wore his hat pulled down with the brim obscuring his face, and his clothes were a few sizes too big as if he'd stuffed his shirt to disguise his slight frame. Nico! His bulging eyes and sagging jowls reminded me of a pug, a very frightened pug. Sprigati, I pleaded with him to hurry. He stared at the armed men descending the cliff behind me. Andiamo! Without slowing, I grabbed his arm and pulled him toward the waiting boat. Once he snapped out of his shock, the weathered old groundskeeper had me in the rickety vessel and speeding away from the shoreline before I could catch my breath. Grazie mille. I couldn't bring myself to look back. There was nothing for me in that house, or with my family. Nothing but expectations, duty, and a business relationship disguised as a marriage. Alessio nodded once. Like me, he hadn't glanced back at the shore. Some people were like that. They preferred to look forward rather than watching what was coming for them. Peeking her head out from beneath the tarp, Maria spoke in the only language she knew, Sicilian. Is it safe? Stay down, please, just a little longer. Crouching over her, I used my body to protect hers. I owed them so much. My mother had died while giving birth to me, and Maria had cared for me. With my brothers away at boarding school and my father consumed with work, if it wasn't for Maria and Alessio, I would have been forgotten and unloved. It killed me to think of the trouble I'd brought upon them. No one in Trapani, or Sicily for that matter, would dare risk running afoul of my father. Pietro Lazio, the head of one of the five ruling families of the Cosa Nostra, was the most ruthless of the remaining mafia bosses. Maria and Alessio helped me because they loved me, a fact that both warmed and chilled my bones. Maria tugged my sleeve. We found a bag in the rocks. Is that all you are bringing? It is for you. I'd stolen from my father, but I'd had no choice. I'd given Alessio and Maria part of my allowance and modeling money since my father had fired them for being too old to do their jobs. Once I disappeared, they would have no one to help keep food on their table or a roof over their heads. Maria opened the zipper, gasped, and shook her head. It is too much. You must keep some for yourself. I will take a little. I knew better than to argue. She'd stuff my pockets with euros when I wasn't looking if I didn't keep some money for myself. Alessio shouted over the roar of the engine and the waves, Will you leave with us in Ohio? Not trusting my voice, I shook my head. Where will you go? Maria grasped my hand, and I helped her to a bench seat. A safe place, far from here. I had a loose plan, but everything depended on getting them to safety. After that, I wasn't sure where I'd end up. Thank you for helping me. She patted my hand. There is no need to thank us. You are like a daughter to us. We would lay down our lives for you. I prayed it wouldn't come to that. We traveled the rest of the 12 kilometers from my family home to the rendezvous point in silence. Levanso was little more than a big rock with a fishing village dropped on it. As I'd hoped, the warm weather brought out tourists and locals alike, Boats of all shapes and sizes littered the shallow waters. As kids, Marco and I had spent countless summers exploring the shoreline. Though I hadn't visited our secret place in years, I remembered the way to the hidden cave. 
Alessio slowed as we rounded the peninsula on the northwest side of the island. There, see the tall rock? I pointed toward the rugged shore. It's just on the other side. Keeping his eyes on the water, he asked, are you frightened for yourself or for us? I dipped my chin. Both. I don't think my brothers were close enough to recognize you, but if my father finds out you helped me, a broad grin split his face. They did not notice me in all the years I worked for your father. Now I am one of thousands of faceless old men. I do not worry they recognized me. That makes one of us. Maria offered me a smile that reminded me of happier days. Why did you leave? The entire story. Not only what you think we can handle. We are old, not stupid. I debated sugarcoating it, but I had a shot at a new life. I didn't want to build it on a foundation of more lies. Lately, I'd been so dishonest, I could barely remember what was fact and what was fiction. I was ordered to marry Enzo Marchionni. Alessio tilted his head. He is a good man? He's a wonderful man. For someone else. My behavior toward Enzo over the previous few months had been reprehensible. He had every right to hate me, but I prayed he would find it in his heart to forgive me once he learned the truth. Maria gave me a knowing look. He was never the Marchioni your heart wanted. My heart doesn't want any of them. Marco and I are just friends. Even if I did, things would never work out between us. Marco was a player. Plus, I didn't believe for a second Gabe would be able to break free from the mafia. No matter how sweet Marco was now, the business had a way of changing men. I hadn't left an overbearing father to be with an overbearing boyfriend or husband. Thankfully, Alessio interrupted the conversation. Is that Marco? I shielded my eyes and squinted at the pocket yacht anchored nearest to the entrance of the cave. We were still too far away for me to read the writing on the stern. I'm not sure. I will move closer, but you must hide. He motioned for me to get down. I cringed at the brownish water sloshing around and sank to my hands and knees. This is what my life has come to, crouching in filth. Maria draped the tarp over me. The disgusting fabric smelled worse than the bilge water. I remained as still as possible when Alessio accelerated through the choppy waters. The faster we went, the more the foul liquid splashed. If we didn't reach the yacht soon, I'd need to take a dip in the sea or Marco wouldn't be able to stand my stench. A horn blew three times and male voices carried over the waves. Alessio removed the tarp and helped me to my feet. These are our rescuers, yes? Maria chuckled. Of course it is. Don't you recognize them? They are men now. The last time I saw them, they were boys. He continued, muttering under his breath. Grinning at their bickering, I waved to the brothers. Marco was the only person I could think of to help me, and the next to the last person my father would ever suspect. Marco and Dante were only a year apart in age and were often mistaken for twins. They had the same dark curly hair, startling green eyes, and olive complexion as the rest of their siblings, but that's where the similarities ended. Dante, the youngest of the five surviving Marchionni boys, rarely smiled. He had a cool, calculating way about him that made me nervous. Marco, on the other hand, where do I start with Marco? His expression reminded me of someone who knew the punchline to every joke. He was usually grinning, and he always looked like he was thinking of sex. Not surprising, he had a lot of it. I turned my attention to the two men coming alongside the fishing boat in a dinghy. While Dante didn't seem thrilled to see me, he managed not to scowl. Nico, 
Hi, Dante. Thank you for coming. Grunting his reply, he helped Maria, Alessio, and their bags onto the dinghy. Marco climbed into the boat with me. I'll wait with you. Thank you. I seated myself on the bench and pulled the brim of my ball cap down. Any trouble getting away? Nodding, I said. Giancarlo and a handful of bodyguards followed me to the beach. Marco sat beside me and slung his arm around my shoulders. The tension in his body seemed unnatural. He was normally the life of the party, laughing and telling jokes, dirty jokes. We have a good head start, I nudged his side, desperate for him to tell me everything would be all right. Scanning the area, he walked to the back of the boat. I'm going to drop anchor. It'll make this floating heap of wood look like it belongs here. Okay. Arrange the tarp over the front seats, like you're drying it out. His nervous energy was contagious. By the time Dante returned, I was ready to swim for the yacht. No one spoke as we climbed aboard the smaller vessel and sped away, but both men swiveled their heads back and forth as if waiting for the kraken to rise up and devour us. When we reached the yacht, Dante hopped out of the boat, took my arm, and hoisted me from the gunnel to the swim platform. Maria and Alessio peered over the railing, watching us. Unlike the brothers, they seemed to be enjoying their adventure. Both wore smiles as wide as the horizon. We have to hurry. Marco moved behind me, placed his hands on my ass, and all but lifted me onto the deck. I arched a brow. Was that entirely necessary? Climbing up after me, he gave me an exaggerated shrug, winked, and took my hand. I glanced down, surprised by the gesture. Thank you for coming. I didn't know who else to call. I'm glad I could help, but we need to get everyone out of the open. He led us through an outdoor seating area into the sunroom with twin white couches and a large television. Next came the cockpit, with more seating and an impressive yet simple control panel. The yacht was nice, but it struck me as odd the Marchionni's boat was so much smaller than my father's. In fact, they seemed to live a much less lavish lifestyle than my family. Alessio leaned closer to get a better look at the two computerized screens, a dozen switches, a steering wheel, and two silver joysticks. This is fancy. Welcome aboard. Dante offered the couple a quick smile before turning back to the screens. You should get below before we get underway. I felt as if I should say something, but he hadn't as much as glanced at me. Thank you for your help. Don't mention it. Don't mind him. He gets cranky if he's away from his computer for more than an hour or so. Marco grinned and elbowed Dante in the ribs. He has every right to be upset. I've put you both in danger. The reality of the situation made my stomach hurt. Shaking his head, Dante mumbled, I wouldn't have come along if I didn't want to be here. But the sooner we leave, the better. Marco set his hand on the small of my back and led us down a short flight of stairs into another seating area, galley, and a stateroom at each end of the boat. Home sweet home for the next few hours. Maria and Alessio took in their surroundings. While both had worked for my father for decades, he'd never allow my nanny or his groundskeeper to go near any of his toys. Compared to the modest home they shared, the Marchionni yacht had to seem like a palace. Marco pointed to a closed door. Alessio, you and Maria can take that cabin. I turned to the couple. You should wash up and get some rest. We have quite a journey ahead of us. They exchanged glances. Alessio wiggled his brows, and Maria blushed before they hurried into the stateroom and closed the door. My mouth fell open. I vaguely remember them teasing and flirting when I was a child, but that had been so long ago I'd almost convinced myself they were saints. I mean, really, I thought of them as grandparents. No one wanted to imagine their nonni and nonna getting frisky. What's the plan, Nico? 
Where are you going after Pantelleria? Marco folded his arms. Gawking, I motioned to the closed cabin door. You're not even going to comment on what just happened? You miss a chance to make a dirty joke? He shook his head. I wasn't sure what to make of this side of him. He so rarely showed it. It's best you don't know. His brows climbed into his hairline. You have no idea where you're going after you get them settled, do you? Times like these, I hated that he knew me so well. I haven't decided. He winced and scratched his ear. The company jet is in Comiso. No. I refused to drag him deeper into this mess. It's one thing for the boat to be away from the harbor, but if the plane leaves too, it will be obvious you helped me. Marco tilted his head. Do you have cash? Nope. I'm broke, homeless, and smell like weak old fish guts. I had a mountain of money at my disposal, but I didn't dare access it. My father would undoubtedly be keeping tabs on any bank account and credit card activity. I have enough to get to New Orleans. The last time I was there, I hid a fake passport and the funds to get me to my final destination in a safe deposit box. How very James Bond of you. He spoke in a ridiculous British accent. A girl can never be too prepared. I couldn't help but smile. I knew it. He couldn't be serious for more than five minutes. You probably want a shower. Use the other cabin and make yourself at home. Marco looked me over and did his best to appear more amused than concerned. Self-conscious about my appearance and smell, I hurried to the vacant stateroom. I don't have any clean clothes. Following me, Marco reached over his shoulder and pulled his t-shirt over his head. I had a hard time bringing myself to look away from his rippling muscles. However, as much as I would have loved to get physical with Marco, I couldn't add another complication to my life. I'd always had a crush on him, but I'd known better than to pursue it. I'd have better luck catching moonlight in a jar than tying him down. I'll give you anything you need. He tossed the shirt at me. I hugged the still warm fabric to my chest. My God, he smells like sin. Let me guess, including the shirt off your back? And my jeans, he perused my lower half. Ignoring the flutters in my stomach, I squared my shoulders. I'm good with this, thank you. Okay, but if one of us is going to be running around without pants, I'd much rather it be you. Marco winked and walked back upstairs. Chapter three, Marco. Most people would consider speeding around the Italian coastline on a yacht with a beautiful woman a dream come true. While most people would be right, this particular dream had the capacity to turn into a nightmare quicker than I could pop the cork on a bottle of Dom Perignon. Buttoning my shirt, I joined Dante in the cockpit, took out a pair of binoculars and scanned the Mediterranean Sea. This is a bad idea. My brother hardly ever complained, but he'd repeated the sentence a million times since I'd told him about the rescue mission. I plopped into a captain's chair and answered the same way I had a million times before. I know, but she needs our help. Dante gave me side eye. Where are we taking her? She wants to go to Pantaleria. Is that wise? No, it's not. I mentally ran through the small coastal towns within a few hours of Sicily and came up empty. How far north in the mainland can we get and still be home by dawn? Dawn? Are you serious? I thought we agreed to tell Gabe we went fishing. We'd need a plausible explanation for our absence. Where would two young, attractive, single men go after escaping the family compound? To find women. Sure, we went fishing and then decided to have a few drinks. Can we make it as far north as Vibo Marina and get to Tarmina before midnight-ish? Dante narrowed his eyes. Yeah, if you want to circle the entire fucking island before we show up in Tourist Central for a few overpriced cocktails. Clamping a hand on his shoulder, I said, Think about it, bro. Where better than Tarmina to see and be seen? It's the perfect alibi. We shouldn't need an alibi, 
This is a bad idea. He glared as if daring me to disagree again. We're going to have to stop for fuel at some point. Shit. The more people who saw us, the more likely word would get back to Pietro Lazio. Make it someplace small. We can't risk anyone recognizing us or the boat. Obviously. He ran his hand over his head. Stupid question, but why aren't you taking her to Comiso and putting her on a company jet? Great minds think alike. She's afraid one of her father's spies will see them getting on the plane, or the plane taking off, or who the hell knows. Bottom line, she doesn't want to put us in more danger. Screw that. We're up to our asses and alligators as it is. Dante changed our heading. We have security in Comiso. I'll call my guys and set up an escort when we get closer. She's going to be pissed. I couldn't help but laugh. He'd given me the best of both worlds, Nico's safety and someone to blame when she found out about the change of plans. Like, I give a shit. He fidgeted around like a toddler on the verge of a meltdown. What is she doing down there? Cleaning up. The thought of Nico wet and naked downstairs made my blood rush south. I don't think I've ever seen her without makeup. I barely recognized her. Dante's frown deepened. She looked young and terrified. Nico's my age. Leave it to my baby brother to make me feel like a perv. Here I was, sporting wood over a woman who was running for her life, or more specifically, running from an arranged marriage to yet another of my brothers. Too fucking young to get hitched? Maybe, maybe not. He gave me a what the hell look. Dude, she literally ran away from her mob boss father to avoid marrying Enzo. Nodding, I glanced away. You still have a thing for her. He barked out a laugh. That's what this is all about? You're hoping you'll ride in on your noble steed, brandish your sword, and save the princess from the evil dragon? Then the two of you will, what, ride off into the sunset together? Not before Frodo gives me the magical ring, I smirked. I don't have a thing for her. She's pretty much been promised to Enzo since she turned 15. I have no desire to screw our brother's future wife. And you have your head up your ass. She obviously isn't interested in honoring that promise now, is she? No, but that doesn't mean I'm here now because I have a thing for her. He turned. You've drooled over Nico since we were kids. It's time someone told you how it is. He was pissing me off in a major way because he was right. I had followed Nico around like a puppy, but that was what made my temporary marriage plan utter genius. I could spend time with her in and out of bed and finally get the woman out of my system. How is it? She's just not that into you. I'd heard enough. Brother or not, Dante could kiss my ass if he thought I was going to stand there and let him bust my balls. Shut up and drive. Steer. You drive a car, but you steer a boat. He pulled back on the throttle. The boat lurched forward so abruptly I scrambled to find a handhold. What the hell? Just trying to get the Principesha to call me so as soon as possible. Don't call her that. Not only was the nickname demeaning, Enzo had used the Italian version of princess to address Nico since we were in grade school. The last thing I wanted was to remind her of her would-be husband. I'll lay off the pet names if you reach around and pull that giant stick out of your ass. I'm not the enemy here. While I hated to admit it, he was right. Dante had risked as much as I had for a lot less potential reward. Sorry, I'm running on Red Bull and Espresso. Dante rolled his head from one side to the other as if to relieve the tension in his neck. Speaking of that, I need a couple hours of shut-eye. Like hell, sleep on one of the couches up here. The thought of him below deck with Nico had me clenching my fists again. What the hell is wrong with me? She's a friend, a hot friend, but nothing to get jealous over. Take it easy. The last thing I want is her talking my ear off or crying on my shoulder while I'm trying to sleep. He yawned, shook his head, and rubbed his eyes. The Grasos are in one cabin and Nico's in the other. Let me make sure she's comfortable hanging out in the galley while you sleep. Why wouldn't she be? I'm not going to hit on your crush. Dante must have seen my frustration and my expression because he hitched a shoulder and gave me a half grin. Marco, relax. The windows are tinted. Keep her out of view of the windshield, and she'll be fine up here with you. Do you think you can stay awake long enough for me to talk to her, or do you need your nap and blankie now? He flipped me the finger, adjusted course, and opened up the throttle. I knew Dante meant well, but he didn't understand. Sure, he was right about my childhood crush, but he was wrong about everything else. Nico and I had talked or texted a couple of times a week since high school. I was her confidant, the person who talked her through breakups, her problems at home, her hopes and dreams. It wasn't like I was in love with her. 
We were friends, but I'd be open to adding benefits. I walked below deck and knocked on her cabin door. Nick? Yes? Her voice came out small and unsure. Dante needs to crash for a couple of hours. Come upstairs and keep me company. He can have the cabin, but I'd rather stay below deck. Resting my hand on the door jam, I debated my options. I could leave her down here alone, and from the sounds of it, crying, or I could use a little Marchione creativity to convince her to come out. Nick, sorry to lay this on you, but Dante and I are bone tired. He needs sleep, and I could really use some help upstairs. Boating while sleep deprived is a crime in the States. The lock turned, and she opened the door a sliver. Slumping my shoulders, I gave her the most pathetic expression I could muster. Please. Her dark eyes narrowed. You were here before my shower and you didn't seem tired? Caffeine crash. I yawned and brought my fist to my mouth. Dante's in even worse shape. Neither of us slept last night. Yes, fine. Nico stepped out of the room and motioned to the red blouse and pair of white capri pants. I didn't need your t-shirt after all. I struggled to hide my grin. She wore my mother's clothes. The problem was Nico stood five foot eleven, a foot taller than my mom. I would have suggested you search the closet and drawers, but I didn't think anything here would fit. She gave me a playful slap. They don't. I had to tie the shirt and roll up the pants. I took a step back and looked her over from her thick dark hair to her red toenail polish. My gaze hung up on the swath of tan skin between the bottom of the t-shirt and waistband of the pants. I'd seen this woman wearing everything from evening gowns to string bikinis, but that band of peekaboo skin was hands down the sexiest thing ever. Nico folded her arms and turned from me. We should go topside. Licking my lips, I shook my head. Can we talk first? Chapter Four Nico This was Italy. Men stared. Like the fact birds flew, it was a simple rule of nature. However, Marco Marchionni had taken staring to an entirely different level. To make matters worse, my body responded to his traveling gaze as if he'd caressed me everywhere. I crossed my arms to hide my nipples and prayed to the Virgin Mary he hadn't noticed them. We were friends, best friends. And if my father had his way, I'd be his sister-in-law by the end of the week. Looking, even without touching, would end in disaster. Have a seat, beautiful. Marco sat on the sofa like a man who owned the world, arms draped across the back and long legs spread out before him. He ate up more real estate than necessary. Despite his easy manner, I had a feeling his posture was by design. I glanced between him and the chairs on the other side of the room. I'm not going to bite. He patted the small space beside him. I sat on the sofa and regretted it. The tight confines made it impossible for either of us to move without touching the other. He shifted his entire body toward mine. Dante made an executive decision. He's taking us to Comiso. It's too dangerous. Of course, Marco changed the plans without consulting me. I had second and third thoughts about involving him in my escape. If my father got wind he'd helped me, it could lead to violence like Sicily hadn't seen since the early days of the mafia. I need to know where you want to land in the States for the flight plan, and uh, Maria and Alessio's passport info for the flight manifest. Okay, but no buts. After you drop them, you can take the jet anywhere you need to go. Or I can rent you a car. They're going to Canton, Ohio, but you've done enough. This is, you, you had no right to make this decision for me. I was so angry, I wanted to smack the goofy grin off his face. Think about it, Nick. We never would have made it to Pantelleria before your father's goons. We have security in Comiso, and you'll be safe once you're in the air. He was right, and I knew it, but I didn't like it. Marco, I need to learn to take care of myself. I didn't flee my father to have another man run my life. That's not what I'm doing here. He hung his head. I get it. 
We both grew up with other people calling the shots for us. I apologize. Thank you. I curled into the corner of the couch. And no rental cars. You shouldn't put anything in your name. Who said anything about it being in my name? Chuckling, he stood, walked to a cabinet, and tossed a passport at me. It's German? I opened the cover and laughed. Frederick Fassbender? Any relation to the actor? If anyone asks, I tell them I'm a distant cousin. Marco snatched it from me and dropped it into his shirt pocket. I have a credit card with the same alias tucked in the back. It makes you sound like a porn star. Do you use that when you pick up women? Like his brothers, Marco Marchioni had a reputation for being quite a player. Unlike his brothers, Marco lived up to said reputation. I'd given up trying to keep track of his countless one-night stands long ago. The man seemed incapable of making a commitment. Maybe a few times, but not anymore. I'm thinking it's time to grow up, stop sleeping around, settle down. Since when? Good for you. His expression grew serious. Do you have enough money to live on? What about Alessio and Maria? I filled a bag with cash from my father's safe before I left. I'm planning to give most of it to them. Honestly, I had no idea how much I'd need to start a new life. Nor did I know how long it would take to drive from Ohio to New Orleans, or how to get there, or how to fill a gas tank. The reality of my situation hit me. What have I done? Hey. Marco wrapped his arms around me. What's wrong? Talk to me. I was thinking about, about. For the first time in my life, I couldn't tell him the truth. What would he think if he knew how useless I was in the real world? Nick, you can tell me anything. You know that. He motioned to himself. This is a no judgment zone. My mother would be so ashamed of me. I blurted out the first thing that popped in my head. I'd never known my mom, but now that I thought about it, I couldn't imagine she would be proud if she could see what I'd become. He pulled me close and kissed the top of my head. I'd like to think that you wouldn't be in the situation if she was around. Then again, my mother is pushing Enzo to go through with the wedding, so who knows? The sadness in his voice was contagious. Rather than allowing either of us to wallow, I decided to lighten the mood. Holding back a smile, I jerked away from him. This is how you comfort me? Insulting my dead mother? Marco's eyes widened. No, I'm sure Vittoria was a saint. Gotcha. Laughing, I poked the ticklish spot on his side. I'd discovered it when we were in grade school and had used it to my advantage ever since. He wrapped his arm around my neck and scrubbed his knuckles across my scalp. Ow, hey, no nookies. Cracking up, Marco released me. It's noogies. That is what I said. He shook his head slowly, and that sexy grin of his returned. You said nookie, which is American for sex. Minkya, I swore under my breath. Of all the words to misuse, even my tongue is thinking about Marco's body. He nudged my shoulder. Seriously, though, what's wrong? And don't tell me you're thinking about your mother. If you're worried about driving 16 hours, take the jet to New Orleans. Or I could come with you. 16 hours? Is he kidding? My mouth went dry. It's better if I go alone. Marco sighed and pulled his phone out. After typing and scrolling silently, he turned the screen toward me. Look, the jet is scheduled to be in New Orleans in a few days. There's no sense in the pilot bringing it back to Sicily to turn around and fly back. Nor is there any reason for you not to be on it when it lands in Louisiana. I eyed the calendar. 
how do I know you didn't just type that in? You don't. He dropped the phone in his pocket next to the fake passport. Do what you want. But as long as you're on my plane, I can protect you. The thought of my father's men finding me caused my heart to race. No, I can't risk being spotted. I will drive. This is ridiculous. Frustration deepened his voice. I understand you want to be independent, but you're taking unnecessary risks. I'll be fine. I forced a smile. What is that American saying? My lack of emergency is not your plan. Laughing, Matko shook his head. What am I going to do with you? You're going to put me on a plane in Comiso and forget about me. Never going to happen, Piccolina. I couldn't forget you if I wanted to. He winked when he used my childhood nickname. This situation is temporary. In fact, I have a solution that doesn't involve you roaming the globe alone. I had the feeling I wouldn't like his so-called solution. Does it involve you coming with me? Yes and no. Marco cleared his throat. Marry me. I laughed, because what else could I possibly do? Cry? Yes, I could cry that this sweet, beautiful man asked such a thing. You want me to marry you so I won't have to marry your brother? He dipped his chin. I know you're not in love with me or anything close. It wouldn't have to be real. An overwhelming sense of disappointment tightened my throat. Rather than diving into the cause of my sudden emotions, I stuck with the facts. If you mean we wouldn't be married in a church, my father would claim it was illegitimate. We can do it in a church in front of a priest. As far as the world was concerned, we would be man and wife. But we wouldn't be. I swallowed back my unexpected emotions. This is Marco. He doesn't actually want to marry me or anyone else. Not unless we consummated the marriage. He scrubbed his jaw. We could play house until it's safe to have it annulled. Platonic house. While his plan was flawed, there was a certain logic to it. However, I doubted he fully understood the reason my father had demanded I marry Enzo. Even if Marco understood mob politics, too much could go wrong if we eloped. It's next to impossible to prove a marriage wasn't consummated. Besides, playing platonic house, as you call it, could ruin our friendship. Nothing would do that, Nico, nothing. I wanted to believe him, but I had my doubts. The second I started acting like a girlfriend, or worse, a wife, he'd regret asking me to marry him. I couldn't do that to either of us. Marco, I'm honored that you would do this for me, but I want to prove to myself and everyone else I can stand on my own. I reached for his hand, but stopped when his phone rang. Marco held the cell between his shoulder and walked to the bar. Gabe, how nice of you to call. I couldn't make out the words, but I could hear a man's voice shouting across the line. This is it? His family knows what we've done. I'll be sent back. He filled two glasses with red wine. Dante and I were going a knucking futz in the house. We went fishing. We'll be back late. More shouting. But this time, Gabe said my name. Nico's missing. Marco glanced at me. I haven't seen her. Hugging my knees to my chest, I rested my forehead on my arms and prayed. Gabe, calm down. This is Nico we're talking about. She's probably booked herself into a five-star resort and is getting a massage in a swanky spa while everyone else freaks out. Is this what they think of me? I squeezed my eyes closed to keep from crying. I'd acted like a spoiled brat over the previous few weeks, but it was part of my plan.
I'd thought if I could make Enzo miserable, he would refuse to marry me. It had worked, to a point. He wanted nothing to do with me, but I'd all but ruined my reputation in the process. It was all for nothing. Our parents were more determined than ever to tie me to Enzo. I could go along with Marco's plan. Not even my father could put aside a marriage ordained by the Catholic Church. What am I thinking? Marco would be miserable after a week, or worse, having sex with other women while pretending to be married to me. Ciao. He disconnected the call and rested his hand on my arm. You know I didn't mean any of that. Do I? Without raising my head, I said, maybe not, but your family believes I'm a lunatic. Actually, you're wrong. Gabe knows you were putting on a show to push Enzo away. Then why did you say those things? To convince him I didn't know where you were. Marco lifted my chin and stared into my eyes. Marry me, Nick. We've known each other our entire lives. I'd never hurt you. Something in the way he asked the question touched me. He seemed so earnest, as if he really wanted to share his life with me. I could think of far worse things than waking up next to my sexy friend for the rest of my days. But this wasn't real. Marco was being Marco. He was only trying to save me. I can't. He nodded once, went back to the bar, and returned with the wine. Then have a drink with me while we look over the best routes from Canton to New Orleans. I'm sorry. I wanted to explain, to tell him the real reason my father and his mother wanted the union. Not to mention, I wasn't wife material. I'd never once made a meal or washed my own clothes or been with a man. Hey, he set the glasses aside. You have nothing to apologize for. I meant what I said. Nothing is going to ruin our friendship. Not even you shooting down my awesomely romantic proposal. I laughed through the pain in my chest. If you think that was romantic, I understand why you never have a second date with a woman. I never have a second date because I haven't found anyone I liked enough to bother. Marco gave me a sad smile. We should head upstairs so Dante can get some sleep. Chapter 5, Marco Someone should write a country song about watching a jet take the woman who turned down your fake marriage proposal far away. Letting Nico go was the hardest thing I'd ever done. Like a lovesick fool, I'd stood on the tarmac until the plane disappeared into the night sky. I slid into the back seat of the waiting SUV and slammed the door. Let's get the hell out of here. Not yet. Dante ran his hand over the back of his neck. Is she going to be okay? I pulled out as much cash as I could from the ATM and gave her every euro I had on me. I didn't want to talk about Nico. In fact, I didn't want to talk about a damn thing. She's really going to take a rental car from Ohio to New Orleans? He frowned. Without security? That's her grand plan. I stared out the window. I'm surprised she knows how to drive, let alone fill the tank or use a map. He folded his arms and stared as if waiting for me to reassure him. Not for nothing, Dante, but you're the son of a bitch that hasn't stopped complaining since we left home last night. It's a little late for you to give a shit about her. I motioned for the driver to go. The sooner we got the hell out of there, the better. We're not leaving yet, Dante said to the driver before turning back to me. Just because I didn't want to get caught in the crossfire doesn't mean I don't care about Nicolina. Let's face it, she's lived a pretty sheltered life. She'll be fine. If she runs into trouble, she has a burner phone in my number. I hated the thought of her driving so many miles alone, but she'd made it clear she didn't want me along for the ride or anything else. Dante signaled for the driver to go. Get some shut-eye, you'll need it. Gabe's going to chew our asses when we get home. I'll wake you when we're close. I rested my head back and folded my arms. For once in his life, my little brother was right. Nico had grown up in a golden castle. However, she was stronger than anyone gave her credit for. I should respect her wishes. She can handle herself. But damn it all, she shouldn't be alone. 
Sooner or later, Pietro Lazio will find her. I know that look. You're either planning something or constipated. He nodded toward the terminal. If you're going, you need to hurry. The morning flight to Rome leaves in a half hour. I raked my hands through my hair. I hate it, but she seemed determined to do this on her own. So, go home and visit Enzo. Worst case scenario, you're in the States if she needs help. Best case, you happen to be in New Orleans the same time she is. Since when are you the wise brother? I chuckled and checked my pocket for my fake passport and credit card. Motioning to the driver, I said, circle back to the terminal. Dante laughed. I'll deny I said this, but you're making the right decision. What are you going to tell Gabe? That you went home to talk to Enzo? He shrugged. The jet's missing. He's going to know something's up and assume Nico's involved. While I appreciated my little brother's level of subterfuge, I didn't feel right about all of the lies. Gabe might have told me to steer clear of Nico, but he'd understand, eventually. I'll call him after I get my ticket and give him the short version of the situation. Dante gave me a quick hug and pat on the back. Have fun flying commercial, bro. My heart beat out a rhythm better suited for a Metallica song than an internal organ. I had no freaking clue how I'd find Nico in New Orleans. But figure it out. All I had to do was keep my eye on the prize. The rest would work itself out. Or, so I told myself. Ticket in hand, I made it to the gate with ten minutes to spare. Because I was a man of my word, I dialed Gabe's number. My brother Leo picked up instead. Marco, where the hell are you? Leo was ten months younger than Gabe, and normally the more rational of the two. However, the current situation was anything but normal. I didn't have time to launch into a ten-minute explanation. I needed to give him a quick update and get on the plane. Did I call the wrong number, or are you babysitting Gabe's phone? He's busy handling the mess you made. Leo did not sound amused. Pinching the bridge of my nose, I said, How bad is it? The short version? Pietro Lazio knows you and Dante were in Levanzo this morning. A muffled sound came over the line, as if he'd covered the receiver. Could you focus on one conversation? I'm in a bit of a hurry. He sighed. What were you thinking? You know we're sitting on a powder keg with the Lazios. You could have given someone a heads up before you lit the fucking match. Shit. She was in trouble. Where is she now? He sighed. Like me, Leo had a soft spot for a woman in need. Unlike me, he didn't extend his need relieving services to the bedroom. As far as I knew, he lived like a monk. Safe and on her way out of the country. I held my breath, waiting for him to launch into a lecture. Good, he lowered his voice. Where are you and Dante? He's on his way back to the compound. He? Where the hell are you? Hang on. Leo spoke to someone else in the room. Send security to the port. Dante's coming from the airport and has his own guys. My brother growled under his breath. Never mind. The gate attendant announced the final boarding call. I hate to leave you to clean up my mess, but I'm catching a flight to Rome and then to New Orleans. Someone should go make sure Shauna doesn't murder Enzo and feed his body to the gators. Is Nico heading to? You know what? Don't fucking tell me. Stay at the mansion. Don't leave without security. Things are as hot there as they are here. He drew a breath and exhaled very slowly. Just be careful. Call me when you land. Will do. By some miracle, I slept the entire flight to Rome. I consider this a sign of divine intervention rather than outright exhaustion for two reasons. One, I never slept on planes. I hated flying almost as much as I hated reptiles and insects. Two, the only empty seat was between a married couple. A married couple in the midst of an argument. I'd offered to change seats with one of them so they could sit beside each other, but they'd both refused. Instead, they hurled insults around me. It was almost enough to make me rethink proposing to Nico. Almost. It's not like Nico and I will have a real marriage. We'd have it annulled before we got to the bickering stage. Since I had no clue when it'd be safe to go to my condo, I spent my four-hour layover shopping for a roller bag, a couple changes of clothes, and a toothbrush. On the way to the gate, I had an idea. I wandered into the jewelry store like a kid walking into Santa's workshop, excited and completely overwhelmed and scared shitless. A blonde with thick glasses and an expression that looked like she just sucked a lemon frowned at me. May I help you? Engagement rings? My voice cracked. I cleared my throat and tried again. I'm looking for an engagement ring. They are over here. 
Her smile warmed enough that she no longer reminded me of my third grade teacher, Sister Agnes. I followed her to a glass case in the back of the store, where she pulled out a tray of simple rings with stones on the minuscule side of small. This is ridiculous. Who buys an engagement ring in the airport? Do you have a budget, sir? The saleswoman put the tray away. No. I made my way to the next case and studied each ring. Oh, those, those are, well, they are very expensive. Her sour expression returned. It hadn't occurred to me that I looked like a college student coming off a weekend bender, but it shouldn't have mattered. In fact, it irritated me that she'd treated me like the hooker and pretty woman. Not that I'd watched the movie of my own free will. Nico had forced me to endure it. I motioned to the other saleswoman. Excuse me, can I borrow you for a moment? The young lady gave me a once-over, but unlike her co-worker, her lips curled into a flirty smile. Yes? I pointed to a Bucciolati number with an emerald-cut center stone and ornate band with several square diamonds. I'd like to see that one. Lovely choice. She placed it in my hand. The blonde sneered. I turned the ring from side to side, smiling at the way the light caught not only the stones, but the etching along the edges of the platinum band. Long ago, Nico had showed me her mother's wedding ring. She'd gone on and on about the rectangle diamond and the way it glittered and gleamed. This is the one. Just because it's a fake marriage doesn't mean she shouldn't have the ring of her dreams. I'll take it. The young woman bit her lower lip. How would you like to pay for this, sir? Rather than using the very real card with a very fake name, I pulled out my wallet and handed her my American Express black. The blonde who'd treated me like something she found on the bottom of her shoe went pale. My new favorite salesperson flashed me a bright smile. Thank you, Mr. Macchioni. Congratulations. Whoever this is for is a very lucky woman. Now, all I have to do is convince her to go along with my plan. Chapter 6 Nicolina Crossing the Atlantic in a private jet was no big deal for me. I'd done it my entire life. However, watching Alessio and Maria's reactions to flying for the first time made the entire experience special. I loved that I could give them a new life, a better life. Come, my darling, see how the rising sun looks from the air. Alessio's grin broadened as he slung his arm around his wife and peered out the window. Maria gasped. Bellissimo. Their affection for each other warmed me, but it also left me wanting. I could only imagine what it would be like to spend decades with the same man, to live together so long that I knew the meaning of each of his smiles, to have someone understand me so deeply that explanations weren't necessary. Images of Marco filled my mind. This was the first time I'd left him knowing I might never see him again, or at least not see him for a long time. The thought made me tear up. Maria sat beside me and patted my hand. What troubles you? I was thinking about everything I left behind. I dried my eyes and forced a smile. She motioned between herself and her husband, you are looking at it all wrong. Look to the future, Nico. Think of the new life you will make for yourself. Have faith in your decisions. As always, you are right. Maria tilted her head. There are some things from your old life you are bringing with you. Your work, me, and Alessio. My modeling career is over. So you'll design clothes. It is your real passion, she grinned. Do it under a false name. Dipping my chin, I said, it's not safe for you if I stay. That may be true for us, but Marco? She shook her head. He is young and strong and without fear. Why not go to him? His family will protect you. I'd asked myself the same question a million times since I'd left him on the tarmac. I don't want another mafia family to protect me. Her eyes widened. You never say that word out loud. And the Marchionis are good. Look at all the things they do for the people of Comiso. They are not like the others. 
by others, I assumed she meant my family. I had my problems with them, and yes, they did bad things, but they were still my family. Sighing, I shook my head. It doesn't matter if the Pope canonizes every Marchioni who ever existed. I have to do this alone. I want to prove I can stand on my own two feet. To who? Your father? She made the sign of the cross. Some people will never see you for who you are. They will only see what they want you to be. Isn't that the truth? I've never been on my own. Even in Paris, I had bodyguards and assistants. Nicolina, sometimes the true sign of independence is knowing when to ask for help and having the grace to accept it when it's offered. Maria nodded toward her husband. This life isn't meant to be lived alone. You've loved Marco since you were children. You are two halves of the same soul. Two halves of the same soul? I couldn't help but grin. She'd been watching too many Italian soap operas. I adored Marco, but he wasn't the one for me. He's a good friend, but he likes the ladies too much to settle down. She rolled her eyes. That is true of every man until the right woman grabs them by the ear and tells them how it's going to be. Laughing, I asked, is that what you did with Alessio? Maria pursed her lips. Alessio would have lived with his mother until he was too old to marry if I hadn't come along. I heard that, he turned toward us. Maria is right, but she is also wrong. Sharing a life with someone doesn't make you dependent. It makes you partners. As for Marco Marchionni, He's not good enough for you. No manis. I rolled my eyes. If you had your way, I'd be locked up in a convent for the rest of my life. Maria turned her head, but not before I noticed she'd gone pale. That's not true. He gave me a bashful grin. They stopped allowing families to send their rebellious women to convents many years ago. Maria muttered a prayer under her breath. Thank goodness for small miracles. Confused by Maria's reaction, I asked, are you all right? She waved her hand. Thankfully, I didn't have long to contemplate her weird mood or their advice on my love life. The pilot announced we were making our final descent into Canton. Maria and Alessio took their seats and buckled in. Once again, they held hands, pointed out the window like a couple of teenagers, the cockpit door opened, and a man dressed in a pilot's uniform approached me. Miss Marchioni, I need a word with you in private. For a split second, I wondered who he was speaking to. Then I remembered Marco mentioning something about filing flight plans and passenger information. He must have given the pilot false information, but it would have been nice of him to tell me these things before I'd left the ground. Of course, I stood and followed the pilot into the cabin at the rear of the plane. I have word that customs agents are meeting the plane on the tarmac. His expression grew grim. Given the circumstances, it's best if you remain back here until we can get you off the aircraft unseen. Circumstances? What in the devil had Marco told him? Thank you. Are we too close to landing for me to make a call? Use the satellite phone, but please make sure you stay out of sight once we touch down. His tone sent a shiver down my spine. I will. I hurried back to the main cabin and dialed Marco. He picked up on the fourth ring. Marchioni. It's me, Miss Marchioni. The co-pilot told me customs agents are meeting the plane. The background noise made it next to impossible to hear him. Relax, babe, it's hit or miss when flying. Small airport. I gave him my cousin's name. He already had her passport. Follow his instructions. Are flight manifests easy to access? I pressed my hand to my chest as if the pressure would slow my heart. Easy, no. Depends on not taking any chances. Please, 
New Orleans, I trust flight crew. Frustrated, I spoke louder than probably necessary. What? I can barely hear you. Where are you? Airport. Flight. New Orleans. You're on your way to Louisiana? I caught myself smiling and forced a frown. No matter how much I loved the idea he'd followed me, I'd specifically told him not to. Yes, with Enzo. Mansion. Marco sounded as exasperated as I felt. Stay with security. Safe. Miss, I need you to take your seat. The flight attendant motioned to an empty chair near the back of the main cabin. I'll call after I land. After disconnecting the call, I sat and pulled the window shade down. Between the pilot's request that I hide and the bad phone connection, I felt as if I were coming out of my skin. Okay, think. We are flying into a fairly small executive airport, not far from Cleveland. How many international flights do they receive? Do they have customs agents on staff to meet planes? Or did my father get his hands on the flight plan and passenger list? He's everything all right, Maria asked. I won't be able to get off the plane with you. I worked to keep my fear out of my voice. Remember your cover story? We are visiting my sister for one month. She is ill, so we don't have a return ticket. We'd gone over their alibi several times, but I needed to be sure they would be safe. I nodded to Maria. And? You arranged for our trip last week, but we have not seen or heard from you since. Frowning, Alessio asked, when will we see you again? I'm not sure, but you have my number. Call if there is any trouble. Glancing away, I rubbed my palms on the white capri pants. I can't do this. This isn't how I want to say goodbye to them. Go to Marco. He will keep you safe. Maria spoke in an authoritative tone I hadn't heard from her since she'd caught me sneaking out when I was 15. I replayed their advice about relationships and independence as the plane touched down and taxied toward the terminal. I wanted to go to Marco, but I was terrified of putting him in more danger. Alessio sucked in a breath and pushed his body back in his chair. Giancarlo is outside. My hand flew to my throat. No, please, no. I didn't really know him, but Giancarlo, the eldest of my five brothers, had a reputation as brutal as my father's. Are you sure? It is him. He has four men with him. Maria's voice quivered. The flight attendant hurried to my side. You must hide. I had no idea how much she knew about the situation, nor did I care. My one concern was that Alessio and Maria were safe. My gaze fell on the quilted Chanel duffel I'd filled with my father's money. Mother Mary, help us. Quickly, we need another bag. My brother will know that one is mine. I have one you can use. She opened a closet, pulled out a plain black suitcase, and dumped clothing and toiletries onto the couch. Alessio moved the cash into the roller bag. Go, Nico. We will be okay. Go. I turned to the pretty red-headed attendant. Please be sure they make it to their family. I will see to it the Marchionis reward you for your trouble. Of course. Now come. She ushered me into the master suite, moved a chair to the side, and lifted a hatch in the floor. I stared down into the dark space. What is this? Her smile made her eyes twinkle. You are not the first contraband cargo the Marchionis have brought from Sicily. Hurry, please. You'll be safe here, but I must go open the cabin door. Voices carried from the front of the plane and had me scrambling into the secret compartment. I'd barely made it inside before she closed the hatch. A thud above my head told me she'd moved the chair back into place. Resting my back against the cold metal, I mentally prayed the rosary without the beads. 
Where is Nicolina? Giancarlo's unmistakable voice seemed to pull all the oxygen from my hiding place. We have not seen her since she helped us arrange our trip to visit my sister Rosa. Maria spoke a little too loud and much too fast. She is very sick. She could die any minute. Please, God, let him believe she's telling the truth. When was this? A week ago, Alessio said. What is this about? Has something happened to Nico? Giancarlo muttered something I couldn't make out before shouting, Search the plane. I held my breath as heavy footsteps echoed above me. Doors opened and closed, furniture shifted, and the person or persons knocked along the floor and walls. The men stomped directly over my head. I pressed my hands to my mouth and closed my eyes. Please, please, please go away. A man muttered something that I couldn't make out, and the knocking grew louder. Someone walked back toward the main cabin, and two sets of footsteps returned. Where is it? It sounded as if Giancarlo stood directly above me. I trembled hard enough to rattle the metal walls. Choking back a sob, I worried I'd give myself away. My brother shouted, open it. The flight attendant said, it's an access door to the electronics panel and an emergency escape hatch. Shuffling, a thud, and a woman's cry of pain echoed around me. I didn't ask what it was. I said to open it. I can't let them hurt her. But if Giancarlo finds out Maria and Alessio lied to him, if he finds me, he'll kill them all. Paralyzed with fear, I didn't dare move. Above me and to the left, another hatch opened. Chapter 7, Marco. The late afternoon sun cast a glare on the polished white marble floors and white leather sofas and crystal vases, with what else but white lilies. Crossing the room in my filthy converse felt like a sin against nature, only there was absolutely nothing natural about the antiseptic-like mansion. Home sweet home, not. I hadn't thought of my parents' place in the garden district as home since I'd left for college. Actually, it had always felt more like a museum than a place people live their lives. Hello? My voice echoed through the cavernous foyer. No answer. The paranoid side of me reared its ugly head. My folks had a small staff led by mine and my brother's former nanny. As far as I knew, Hildy hadn't taken a day off in the last thirty some odd years. Someone should be here. Hell, Enzo and Shauna should be here. Hello? Anyone home? Hildy? Enzo? Again, no one answered. Dragging my new roller bag behind me, I walked farther into the house. Two dirty glasses sat on the kitchen counter along with two plates. The signs of life gave me hope. I checked the pool and deck, empty. The den, also empty. Where the hell is everyone? My phone buzzed in my pocket. I hit answer and pressed it to my ear. Marchione. Sir, this is Sanford. We are held up in Canton, but should be cleared for takeoff soon. Sanford, a.k.a. my father's pilot, had worked for our family for as long as I could remember. He'd put up with our demanding schedules, spur-of-the-moment vacations, and less-than-legal activities for twenty years. Never in all that time had I heard him sound so unnerved. Nico, my chest tightened. What happened? Giancarlo Lazio and four of his men searched the plane. He drew a breath. We were able to hide Nicolina. She's shaken up, but safe. Thank Christ. Tell me she's not still planning to drive to Louisiana. She's asked to accompany us to New Orleans. Good. I rested my hip against the counter. Knowing Nico was in good hands took a weight off my shoulders. And the elderly couple? That's part of the holdup. Nicolina insisted we wait to take off until she gets word they made it to their destination. The mental image of Nico bossing around the flight crew made me smile. I see. Is there anything else I should know before I speak to her? No, sir. 
Sanford chuckled. She's a brave one. The flight attendant hit her in the special cargo hold. She was down there nearly two hours and didn't make a sound. Two hours? Two freaking hours? I would have lost it after five minutes if someone shoved me inside a metal box. Are you certain the lot seals are gone? Yes, but we're keeping her in the master suite until after we're off the ground as a precaution. He lowered his voice. Mr. Marchione, this is none of my business, but does your father or Gabriel know about any of this? Gabe knows, but I'm counting on your discretion not to mention it to my father. I trusted the pilot with my life. He kept more than a few of my secrets over the years, but smuggling a mafia princess into the United States was a little different than not telling my parents about my VIP membership in the Mile High Club. Of course, sir, he cleared his throat. I will personally keep her safe until we land in New Orleans. Thank you. I'd like to speak to her. I hung my head and waited for Nico to come on the line. Marco? Her voice cracked. Did Sanford tell you what happened? I felt every freaking mile of the distance between us. I never should have let her leave, call me so alone. I should have been there. Yes, how are you holding up? I was so scared, she sighed. You were right before. It is too dangerous for me to be on my own. Would you, would you mind if I? I insist you come. I will have security waiting for you at the airport. And Denzo? He will not be happy to see me. Leave my brother to me. I catch him up on the latest events. If he had a problem with her being here, he could kiss my ass. We're taking off soon. I should go. I conjured every ounce of courage I had in me to tell her everything would be all right and that I'd protect her with my life. Instead, I said, see you soon. Ciao. She disconnected the call. See you soon? That's the best you got. Shaking my head, I grabbed my bag and headed upstairs. A pair of jeans laid across Enzo's unmade bed, but my brother was nowhere to be found. Stranger still, my childhood bedroom door was closed. I reached for the knob, but stopped when I heard voices and moans coming from inside. Is that SOB having sex in my bed? I pounded on the door with the palm of my hand. I don't want to be disturbed, Enzo said. Oh, hell no. I've been traveling too long to put up with this crap. I took a page out of his playbook and threw the door open. Tough shit. Why are you sleeping in here? My brain stuttered. Sure, I'd suspected he was doing the nasty in my bed, but thinking and seeing were two different things. Whoa. Shauna let out a squeak and scrambled off my brother. Good plan, except she took the sheets with her, which left him exposed. I needed bleach for my freaking eyes. Covering my face with my arm, I said, dude, get dressed before you put someone's eye out. Leave. Enzo pointed toward the door with more than his hand. The entire situation had me cracking up. He caught me in the act more times than I could count. Now that the tables were turned, I took great pleasure in tormenting him. You don't have to be rude about it. You're the one playing hide the sausage in my bed. Go, while you still have functioning kneecaps. He strode to the door and shoved me into the hall. Big threats for someone with his cock hanging out. Laughing, I walked back downstairs. I hadn't seen food since Rome, and all the excitement made me hungry. I poked my head in the fridge and hit the jackpot. Hildy's gumbo. I figured she'd made it for Enzo. He'd always been her favorite. What better way to get under his skin than to eat his special soup after seeing his girlfriend's tits? Normally, I'd reheat it on the stove to keep the shellfish from turning to rubber, but I didn't dare take the time. Instead, I nuked it. She made that for me, you know. Enzo stood in the doorway with his arms folded. I figured, but I didn't think you'd be down in time to catch me. I wiggled my brows. Gabe didn't mention you were coming home today. He pulled a couple of steaks from the fridge. I hitched a shoulder and took a huge bite of gumbo. He has a lot on his mind. Endo gave me an odd look before getting three potatoes from the pantry and walking to the sink. What was so important in New Orleans, you'd risk leaving the compound. I needed to talk to him about Nico before she showed up on the doorstep, but he didn't seem to be in a very receptive mood. Instead, I decided to keep the focus on him, specifically his epic screw-up. You, bro. I came home to talk to you. He paused mid-scrub and pointed the potato at me. Now I know you're full of shit. Is it that hard to believe I love you enough to cross an ocean to stop you from ruining your life? I bit back a laugh. While I'd walked through fire for him, Enzo had made a career out of believing himself the black sheep of the family. Yeah, it is. How is it I'm ruining my life? 
I glanced over my shoulder to make sure we were alone. This thing with the lot seals isn't going away. Which thing? They aren't going to let up until there's a wedding. They will if Gabe agrees to business as usual. I couldn't believe his arrogance. Is he really suggesting we stay in the mob? You and I both know that isn't going to happen. He turned with a paring knife in his hand. Then someone needs to convince Nico that marrying me is a horrible idea. While I knew Nico had zero intentions of marrying the asshole, I couldn't resist the opportunity to bust his balls. We could do a press release detailing your erectile dysfunction and chronic STDs. Ha <laughs> ha. I met his gaze and dropped the clown act. Nico doesn't want this any more than you do. Enzo's eyes widened. How do you know that? We've talked about it. Smirking, he shook his head. Did she tell you she all but demanded I propose to her? Yes, she had her reasons, but it's not my place to tell you what they were. She can do it herself when she gets here. That's convenient. He turned back to the food. While I understood Nico had behaved like a stark raving lunatic, his attitude was starting to piss me off. She's a victim in this scenario, too. I appreciate you coming to tell me this, but you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Enzo had always had an air of superiority about him, but when he walked to me and clamped his wet hands on my shoulders, I wanted to throat punch him. Oh yeah, asshole? Let's see who knows what. I know you left the exterior security cameras on last night. I called the office and had them turned off when I came home, but... The color drained from his face. Who saw the footage? Pops, for one. I almost felt sorry for him. Almost. Ma had an epic meltdown, so I assume she heard about it, if not witnessed it for herself. Christ. I grabbed a chair, turned it backward, and straddled it. A habit I knew he hated. How could you forget to turn them off? The feed goes live to Marchioni Corp Security. Anyone with a password can log in and check it out. Do me a favor. Don't mention this to Shana. I should be the one to. Don't mention what to me? The woman in question glanced between us. If looks could kill, we'd be bleeding out on the kitchen. Chapter 8, Marco. After dropping the bomb about Enzo and Shauna's skin flick going live at Marchioni Corp, I went upstairs and took a shower. If my calculations were correct, Nico would arrive in about two hours. I needed to give Enzo a heads up, but there was no reasoning with him when he was upset. And let me tell you, he was upset. But that's not all. I mused over the goofy expression that overcame him when he gazed at Shauna. I never would have thought it possible, but Enzo was in love. I might have had a slight obsession with saving Nico, but I had never been so gaga over a woman. Nor did I plan to be any time soon. Dreading the upcoming conversation, I grabbed a beer from the fridge and headed out to the pool deck. Enzo didn't appear to have heard me open the sliding glass door. He just stood there, staring off into space like a freaking statue while our dinner slowly turned to coal. How are the steaks coming? I pointed to the smoke pouring out of the grill. Smells like they're burning. Son of a bitch. He threw the lid open and tossed the meat onto a plate. People burn food all the time, but Enzo wasn't your average backyard cook. He ran one of the hottest restaurants in New Orleans. My brother could make a feast out of garbage, if he had the right spices. I needed to know where he stood with Shauna before I told him about Nico. If he was in denial about his feelings, it would complicate things, and I'll have to kick him in the ass to get him moving. I'd ask where your head is, but it's obvious. He ignored me. Come on, Enzo, a blind man could see you're in love with her. I nudged his shoulder. What are you going to do about it? Enjoy it while it lasts and let her go when it ends. Is he for real, or is he talking a big game? That's cold, even for you. What about her? Have you thought about her feelings? Glaring, he opened his mouth as if to speak, but shouting erupted in the front of the house. My heart stopped beating. Nico had arrived early. Not only would Enzo throttle me for not telling him she was coming, Nico would have my balls in a jar for putting her in a situation where she'd have to defend herself. She'd been through enough in the previous 24 hours. She didn't need Enzo's shit on top of it. Oh, crap. I made a break for the house, tripped over a lounge chair, and went down hard. Pain shot from my calf to my shoulder and back again, but all I could think about was Nico and Shauna coming to blows. Get in there before one of them bleeds on Ma's white rugs. Enzo's nostrils flared. What the hell is Nico doing here? Go! I glanced down and my stomach turned. Blood covered the lower half of my right leg. I'd never been one to handle gore well, especially if said gore belonged to me. 
The shouting in the front of the house continued, but Enzo's voice added to the mix. From the sounds of it, he'd made it worse. I couldn't let him or Shauna give Nico a hard time, not when they didn't know the whole story. Ignoring the blood trailing behind me, I hobbled toward the door. Shauna rounded the corner wearing an expression that promised pain, major pain. However, when she glanced down at my calf, her face softened. My God, what did you do? Are you okay? Hildy came up behind her with a first aid kit. Unlike Shauna, the older woman wasted no time asking questions. She'd practically raised me and my brothers. This wasn't the first time one of us had sliced ourselves open while running on the deck. Sit, let me look at it. I sank into a lounge chair and propped up my wounded leg. Hildy eased the towel back, sucked a breath between her teeth, and turned to Shauna. Go inside and get a bowl of water and a couple of dish towels. She nodded and headed for the kitchen. Hildy met my gaze. Why is Nico here? If it's all the same to you, I'd rather explain when Shauna returns. That's fine, but you and I are going to have a long talk, alone. Shauna returned and set the bowl on the end of the lounger. You don't seem surprised to see Nico. I'm not. Wincing from whatever the hell Hildy was doing to my cut, I said, she's on the run from her father. I helped her escape Trapani. Both women stared slack-jawed. I ran my hands over my head and turned to Shauna. First off, you need to know that Nico has zero interest in Enzo. My mother and her father have been pushing them together for years. She huffed out a humorless laugh. You don't believe me? I arched a brow. Considering the way she was acting before Gabe's wedding, no. She was trying to alienate Enzo. Nodding toward the front of the house, I asked, think about it. Does she seem like the kind of woman who has to chase men down and force them to be with her? No, I guess not. Shauna sighed. Hildy poured what felt like pure alcohol onto the wound. I bit back a few choice words and focused on Shauna. Nico snuck out of her father's mansion with people shooting over her head. Dante and I spent eight hours in the yacht with the throttle wide open to get to her. When she got to the States, she had to hide in a cargo hold for hours while her brother had armed men search our company jet. She's in trouble, and I offered to help. If you or my brother have a problem with her being here, you can suck it up. She sank into the chair beside me. My God, no wonder she looks so different, so scared. I'll talk to Enzo and get him to lay off. Thank you. Hildy narrowed her eyes. Do your parents know any of this? I shook my head. Gabe and Leo are in the loop, but I doubt they'd say anything to them. They won't hear it from me. She pressed a bandage over my wound. You should go to the hospital for stitches. I'm not leaving Nico's side, not until things calm down. She pursed her lips. I figured as much. I'll dress it with stara strips. Thank you. Shauna tilted her head. I didn't realize you two were close. Doctoring me up, Hildy said, they were practically raised together when they were babies. After the Marchionis moved to the States, Marco and Nico spent their summers and holidays together. I took Shauna's hand. I know it's a lot to ask, but please, be nice to Nico. She's been through a lot. Of course. She stood and rubbed her hands on her thighs. I should go check on her. Enzo seemed pretty determined to send her away. Hildy waited until she'd gone before turning to me. The concern in her kind eyes broke my heart. I don't pretend to know what went on in Sicily between Nico and Enzo, but I do know your mother is planning their wedding. Ma can plan all she wants. It's not going to happen. I was tempted to show her the ring in my pocket, but I didn't want to give her the wrong impression. She gave me a dubious look. Are you sure about that? Enzo seems to be getting serious with Shauna, and Nico doesn't want the marriage either. Not even my mother can force two people to get married. It would never stand in the eyes of the church. She tilted her head. This doesn't have anything to do with the way you feel about Nico. My stomach did a backflip. What the hell is that about? Nico and I are friends, but I'd do anything for her, even if that means marrying her to save her from being stuck with Enzo for the rest of her life. Hildy gave me a patient smile. She's a lucky woman to have such a good friend. I'm the lucky one. Oddly enough, I meant it. Besides my whacked out family, Nico was the one constant in my life. You know I disagree with the way your mother involves herself in you boys' personal lives, but she ain't about to change any time soon. Hildy dipped her chin. If you keep helping Nico, you're going to have a fight on your hands, and it won't be just your mama. Your father and Pietro Lazio aren't going to sit idly by. Are you ready for that? I wrapped my arms around her frail shoulders and kissed her puffy white hair. 
I'll gladly take them all on to keep her safe. Pulling away, she wiped her eyes. I can't believe how fast you boys have grown up. It seems like yesterday you and Dante were running around in diapers, getting into trouble. Hey, now, no stories about what a handful I was. You'll ruin my reputation as the good one of the bunch. She smiled. I should go see about saving dinner. Thanks for understanding. You might be the only one who does. I settled back against the chair and closed my eyes. My leg had gone from searing pain to a dull ache. Plus, the events of the previous couple of days were catching up with me. Five minutes of shut-eye would help take the edge off. No such luck. Enzo walked outside, wide-eyed, pale-faced, and running his hands over his head like a man on the verge of a nervous breakdown. It would have been nice to have a little warning that you invited Nico to stay here. I planned to, but we started talking about the security footage. Then Shauna showed up. And after that, rather than try to bullshit him, I told the God's honest truth. I wussed out, and she showed up early. Where are the women? Enzo narrowed his eyes. Shauna took Nico upstairs to find some clean clothes. Why is she here? I told him the entire story, except for my plan and the ring in my pocket. The last place anyone will look for her is with the person she's being forced to marry. Enzo asked the same question Shauna had about Nico's behavior in Sicily. I'd answered them so many times, I spoke on autopilot. He seemed to take it all in. And you're sure the Lazios don't know she's here? They tore the plane apart and didn't find her. He nodded and frowned again. Maria and Alessio are safe. They're in Canton with Maria's sister. Nico set them up with a fat nest egg. That was good of her. Believe it or not, she has a big heart. Movement in the corner of my eye drew my attention. I turned and took in the most stunning sight I'd ever seen. Nico stood in the kitchen wearing a pair of shorts and tank top. She pulled her long, dark hair into a high ponytail that showed off the long, graceful curve of her neck. Without a speck of makeup, primping, or designer clothes, she stole my breath. Enzo sighed. If I didn't know it was her, I wouldn't recognize her. That's because you don't know her. Not like I do. Chapter 9 Nicolina I knew a little something about hostile situations. I was the youngest of six children and only girl. I'd grown up in the mafia. I'd participated in Milan Fashion Week as a model and fledgling designer. However, none of that prepared me for walking into the Marchionni mansion. The only reason I didn't leave, my one saving grace, was Marco. The way he smiled when I walked out onto the pool deck sent my heart racing. He stood and pulled me into a tight embrace. There you are. Fighting back tears, I nuzzled my face into his chest. How are you holding up? Marco released me and motioned to the chair beside him. Confused? Understatement of the century. I sat and leaned close enough to speak to him without Enzo and Shauna overhearing. They believe my family is responsible for the problems at the wedding and the arson at Shauna's apartment and Enzo's restaurant. He pressed his lips into a tight line. Right, but just because you have the same last name doesn't mean you were involved. My throat tightened. He thinks my father did these things? You agree with them? You think my father is a liar? I don't know what to think but the circumstantial evidence is pretty damning. What does that mean, circumstantial evidence? I'd learned English, French, and Portuguese in Italy. While I could hold my own with native speakers, I'd never lost my accent, and I struggled with some phrases and idioms. He answered my question in Italian. It means there is no real proof, but the circumstances seem to indicate the guilty party. What circumstances? The problems started around the same time your father demanded the engagement to my brother. Yes, but my father has repeatedly denied any involvement. I glanced toward the other couple to make sure they weren't eavesdropping. I asked him outright. He would not lie to my face. There is lying and there is bending the truth. I am not stupid. I understand the difference. I didn't say you were stupid, Nick. You're one of the smartest people I know. 
You may have never set foot in a traditional school, but those tutors your dad hired were legit. If by legit you mean demanding assholes, you are right. Most people never looked past my face or my modeling career. They assumed my only skills were walking in stilettos and smiling for the camera. Not Marco. He'd always seen the real me. He trailed his fingertips down my arm. It's been a long day. Let's agree that neither of us know who is responsible for the violence and leave it at that, okay? Okay. I didn't want to drop it. In my eyes, my father had one redeeming quality. He spoke the truth. Sure, the truth wasn't always easy to hear and it sometimes hurt people, but it was the only part of him I could look up to. Marco lowered his voice. How would you feel about staying someplace else? Just the two of us? Yes, please, take me anywhere Enzo isn't. Where would we go? Wherever we want. He flashed me his thinking dirty thoughts grin. Somewhere warm, sandy, and romantic. While I loved the idea of putting distance between myself and Enzo, leaving the mansion came with its own set of problems. We wouldn't be alone, we'd need security. Plus, we'd have to pay for a hotel, I can't use my credit cards. He hitched a shoulder. I use mine. He doesn't understand. My father already suspects you helped me escape. Everything we do will leave a paper trail. How long will it take before he convinces your mother to check your finances? There's cash in the safe upstairs. He took my hand. Where there's a will, there's a way, Nick. The question is, do you want to live in paradise with me? It's not that simple. There are things you don't understand. I couldn't decide if he was naive or reckless. Not that either option boded well for our safety. Marco sighed. Then explain them to me. I glanced over my shoulder at Shauna and Enzo. I can't, not here. He pushed himself upright and eased his injured leg off the chair. You must be starving, let's get some dinner. I ate on the plane, and my stomach is in knots. It seemed as if no matter what I did or said, I ended up disappointing him. I'm sorry. It's cool. It wasn't cool, or warm, or cold, or any other temperature. It was awful. We'd never had this sort of tension between us. I hated it. Things had changed since he'd asked me to marry him, and I needed them to get back to normal. I needed my friend, the guy who made me laugh even when everything was falling apart. Marco stood, winced, and sat back down. Would you grab us a couple of beers? I don't drink beer. It tastes like it has passed through someone already. I screwed up my face and made a gagging sound to make him laugh. There's wine in the house. You know where it is. Enzo smirked at me over his shoulder. My shoulders slumped as if they had a will of their own. Ignore him. Marco squeezed my hand. Nodding, I hurried inside. I couldn't blame Enzo and Shauna for suspecting I had something to do with their troubles. When I thought about the way I'd treated Enzo in Sicily, I cringed. I'd gone so far as to throw a vase at him to make him hate me. I did too good of a job. By the time I found the beer and poured my wine, Shauna had made Marco a plate of food and was leaning over him, smiling. He said something that made her laugh and she kissed his forehead. I wasn't jealous, not precisely. While I didn't like the idea of another woman's lips anywhere near him, I knew I had nothing to worry about. She was head over heels for Enzo. The unease in the pit of my stomach had more to do with feeling like an outsider looking in. Until our parents had started pushing for the marriage, I'd cherished my time with the Marchionis. Besides Maria and Alessio, they were the closest thing to a real family I had. I barely saw my brothers outside of the holidays, and my father never had time for me. Forcing a smile, I squared my shoulders, walked outside, and sat beside Marco. After dinner, I will get you something for the pain. 
Thanks. This will help in the meantime. He took a sip of beer and motioned to his plate. Are you sure you're not hungry? Not really, but it looks delicious. Try a bite. It's overcooked, but not bad. Marco cut a piece of the meat and offered it to me. Keeping my eyes locked on his, I leaned in and opened my mouth. He swallowed hard and licked his lips as he fed me. I closed my eyes and savored the flavor. Enzo might not have been the man for me, but he could cook. It's very good. Yeah. Marco set the plate in his lap, but not before I noticed the growing bulge in the front of his jeans. I couldn't help but smile. I had little practical experience with sex, but I wasn't that ignorant. He hadn't reacted that way to me since we'd been teenagers. I rather liked the idea I had an effect on him now that we were adults. Maybe a little flirting will get us back to normal. He cleared his throat. Did uh, Shauna get you set up in a bedroom? Enzo said I should take Gabe's old room. I hated the way my voice came out, squeaky and unsure, but that's exactly how I felt. Marco and I had never slept under the same roof without parents or bodyguards or overprotective big brothers lurking about. Shauna's in my room. A slow grin spread across his face. It would be much easier to protect you if we shared a bed. Oh, could I do that? Share a bed with him without any funny business? Could he? Every reason I'd come up with to turn down his proposal flashed through my head. Then again, everything had changed when I'd walked into the mansion like a beggar. I was here with him despite the risks, despite his involvement with the mafia, despite knowing he'd break my heart. What difference would sleeping next to him make? He nudged my shoulder. Relax, I'm kidding. What just happened? Kidding? I thought you were flirting with me when you let me feed you and moaned like that. I was upping the ante. His grin faded around the edges as he turned his head and finished his beer. I knew him well enough to recognize the lie. However, I couldn't tell if he'd changed his mind because he thought I was about to reject him or if he chickened out. Maybe both. Rather than smiling and nodding, I imagined what he would say if the tables were turned. Leaning close enough for my lips to brush his earlobe, I whispered, that's too bad. I was thinking this was the first time we didn't have anyone to cock block us. Mother of God, he pulled back and stared with his mouth hanging open. You said cock. I rolled my eyes. I may not know them very well, but I do have five brothers. I can have a dirty tongue when I want to. Dirty mouth. And I'd love to hear more about this dirty mouth of yours. I put my index finger to my lips and widened my eyes. I only use it in very specific circumstances. He groaned. You're killing me, Nick. Killing me. Stop being so dramatic. Blue balls aren't fatal. There's a simple cure that involves your hand and some lotion. Flashing him my best evil grin, I stood, ran my hands over my hips, and walked away. Wait. He struggled to follow me. I glanced over my shoulder and winked. Good night, Marco. Chapter 10, Nicolina. My Parisian friends often talked about their sex lives. Though I'd rarely went to the nightclubs with them, I'd learned a lot about the dating game. Or so I thought. Never once in all their conversations had anyone mentioned the downside of teasing a man. What do they call the female equivalent to blue balls? I rolled to my back and stared at the ceiling. I shouldn't have whispered in his ear. Sure. I loved the way he looked at me with heavy eyes, 
and knowing I'd had a physical reaction on him made me feel powerful. However, getting that close to him, smelling him, feeling the warmth of his skin on my lips, left me wanting so much more. To make matters worse, the sounds of Enzo's and Shauna's lovemaking echoed down the hall. The couple had been going at it for what seemed like hours. Nick, Marco knocked lightly on my door. My stomach fluttered at the sound of his voice. Come in. He poked his head inside. Did I wake you? No. I let out a humiliating laugh, far too high-pitched to be attractive. Then again, why should I care if I sounded like a hyena? This is Marco. He's seen me shoot milk out my nose. Because I'm in love with him. The thought made me break out in a cold sweat. On some level, I'd always known I loved Marco, but I'd never allowed myself to act on it. Given our current situation, now wasn't the time to start. I had to put a stop to my feelings. We were friends, and I desperately needed our relationship to get back to normal. Anything else would end in disaster. He stepped into the room and closed the door behind him. I couldn't sleep with all the racket going on at the end of the hall. Me neither. Honestly, how much longer can they continue? Hours and hours. Chuckling, he plopped down beside me. Want to watch a movie? He came into my room in the middle of the night to watch TV. Sure. Or we could go for a swim. Hildy warned me to keep my cut dry for 24 hours, but I'll go downstairs with you if you want to take a dip. I'd forgotten about his injury. He'd limped around most of the evening. I couldn't ask him to go up and down the stairs again. A movie sounds good. I don't have a swimsuit. He grinned his thinking about sex grin and opened his mouth as if to speak, but snapped it shut. That's odd. I struggled to come up with an explanation for his holding back. My brothers talked about two kinds of women, the fuckable ones and marryable ones. Which was I to him? Which do I want to be? Both? Yes, both sounds nice. I caught myself smiling and forced a frown. What am I thinking? Neither, I am neither to him. He cleared his throat. What'll it be? Action? Horror? Rom-com? I waved my hand. You choose. What's wrong? He leaned forward, putting his face in front of mine. I couldn't explain something I didn't fully understand. Rather than trying and ending up sounding like an idiot, I sighed. I'm tired. Your brother and Shauna have finally finished. We should go to sleep. Marco pressed his lips together and gave me a quick nod before grabbing a pillow, punching it twice, and making himself comfortable in my bed. What are you doing? Before he could answer, a door slammed downstairs. The unexpected sound sent a shiver down my spine. Marco bolted for the window and looked outside. Enzo and Shauna are leaving. This late? Something must have happened. The memory of hiding in the secret cargo hold replayed through my mind. Call them. Make sure everything is all right. He turned toward me. I don't know what he saw in my expression, but he crossed the room and wrapped me in his arms. This embrace had nothing to do with sex. It was gentle and safe and warm and dangerous. It's okay, Nick. I'm not going to let anything happen to you. The thin veneer of pride holding back my emotions snapped. Clinging to him, I struggled to get my words out. You can't promise me that. No one can. Marco tightened his grip on me. Maybe not, but I can promise you I'll do everything in my power to protect you. Who will protect you? I pulled back and met his gaze. He kissed my brow. I can take care of myself. He can't be that naive. Or maybe he is. 
maybe we both are. Since he'd pulled me onto his yacht, I'd become distracted by his handsome smile. I had more important things to worry about than whatever was going on between us. We both did. Do you realize how much trouble your family is in? What are you talking about? He might have asked the question, but the look in his eyes told me he knew the answer. Gabe, announcing his breaking ties with the mafia made you look weak. You know what happens to the weak in our world. Why do you think my father is so determined I marry Enzo? Are you honestly suggesting Pietro Lazio is trying to save my family? Marco gave me a yeah, right look. Yes, and not all of his reasons are self-serving. He's always been fond of your mother. Marco made a sour face. Ugh, if you're about to tell me they have a history or I'm secretly your half-brother, I will vomit. I don't know if they have a history, but you look too much like your father to be anyone else's son. I laughed, despite the seriousness of the conversation. This, this is how it's supposed to be between us. How familiar are you with the current balance of power between the five families? He hitched a shoulder. My involvement with Sicilian politics is limited. Why don't you fill me in? There are two camps. Your family and the Ricci's are on one side. The Abruzzo's and the Salvo's are on the other. A pang of guilt stole my breath. Telling him this was more of a betrayal to my family than running away. And the Lazio's? Before I say another word, you have to swear you won't repeat any of this. I'd never had to ask him to keep my secrets. It was an unspoken rule between us, but this was different. This was business. Business that could get people killed. I swear. He pretended to pull a zipper across his lips. My father is the tiebreaker, which means the votes go the way he wants. I couldn't meet his gaze. There are other up and coming families who will step into the void the Marchionis leave behind, but there is no way to know how the new capos will affect the balance. Nodding, Marco seemed to take it all in. How is it you know all of this? I didn't think you were involved. Men like our fathers don't see women as a threat. They treat us like ornaments. I gave him a weak smile. People don't think twice about having a conversation in front of a vase or sculpture. I hate to say it, but you're right. His frown deepened. Why the marriage? Where does it fit into this? It keeps at least one Marchioni in the Fratellanza. Enzo has always made it clear he wants to step into your father's position when Papa Joe retires. And that's putting it mildly. I lowered my voice. The deal my father brokered with your mother is simple. If there is a marriage and Enzo is sitting in your father's chair, the rest of you can leave without bloodshed. He believes once Enzo is his son-in-law, he will be able to control him. Shit. He ran his hands over his head. Marco stood and paced the room. If your father isn't ordering the attacks against my family, do you have any idea who is? It's hard to say. It could be one of the lesser families staking a claim, the Abruzzos or the Salvos. At this point, I'm willing to admit my father could be involved. Explaining the situation to Marco gave me a new perspective. While I had no desire to marry Enzo, it would solve a lot of problems for people I cared about. Am I being selfish? Going through with it could save Marco and his brother's lives. And what about Shauna and Enzo? Will he throw away a chance at love to gain power? He stopped walking and turned. Does it have to be Enzo? Wouldn't it work just as well if you married me? I don't know, but there are a few problems with that scenario. Our parents have chosen Enzo for the role they are not going to change their minds. He hitched a shoulder. We don't give them a choice. I shook my head. 
you don't want your father's position. Even if you did and everyone agreed, I don't want to be a mafia wife. There has to be a way out of this, Nick. A way that doesn't involve my best friend marrying my asshole brother. I'd always loved calling him my best friend. But to hear the words out of his mouth while debating the merits of marrying me cut deep. I thought running away would solve my problems, but it only made them worse. Never a dull moment, is there? Marco kissed my cheek. Thank you for explaining this to me. Do you think Gabe knows any of this? It's hard to say, but you can't tell him. He'll know it came from me, and so will my father when Gabe confronts him. Nick, relax. I promised I wouldn't repeat what you said, and I meant it. He stretched out behind me and tugged my back to his chest. Let's get some sleep. Easy for you to say. Okay. Nuzzling into the pillow, I did my best to ignore his arm around me and his hand dangerously close to my breast. After several minutes, Marco's breathing evened out and the tension drained from his body. I envied his ability to drift off to sleep despite our world spinning out of control. Try as I might, I couldn't turn my brain off. While he hadn't asked outright, I suspected he wanted to talk to Gabe about the situation with my father. Part of me agreed, but the part that had been brainwashed about duty and loyalty and keeping secrets was terrified of the repercussions. At some point while debating what, if anything, to tell Gabe and listening to Marco breathe, I finally nodded off. What seemed like minutes later, car doors slammed downstairs followed by shouting. From the sound of it, Enzo and Shauna were having quite the argument. Marco startled, jumped out of bed, and peeked out the window. I stared, trying to understand how he could go from practically comatose to wide awake so quickly. Is someone here? He smoothed his sleep-rumpled hair. Enzo and Shauna are back. We should find out what's going on. And I should have conversations with Gabe and Enzo. Go ahead, I'll be right down. He tilted his head, sighed, and left the room. I waited until the door closed and bolted for the bathroom. Splashing cold water on my face helped to calm my nerves, but nothing short of a miracle would take away the ache in the center of my chest. Can I betray my family? What will my father do when he finds out? Will he hurt me? Marco? Why did I come here? I've put everyone in more danger. I stared at my reflection as if it would answer the questions. I let Maria and Alessio fill my head with nonsense about love, that's why. As if I knew anything about it. My father wanted to sell me off like a broodmare. Worse, Marco's offer was as much of a business arrangement as my engagement to Enzo. I'd foolishly thought running from my father would give me control of my life, but I'd been wrong, so wrong. Leaving hadn't solved my problems. It had made them worse. Mother Mary, if you're there, I feel so lost. I don't know what to do. Please, give me a sign. I walked downstairs and followed the sound of Marco's voice to an office. Tugging at the hem of the t-shirt I'd borrowed, I said, Mind if I come in? Sure. Shauna smiled at me, but shot Enzo a dirty look. Marco motioned to the computer monitor. Who is that, and why does she look familiar? She was at Gabe and Maggie's engagement party. I was hoping one of you would recognize her. Shauna motioned me closer. There were a few people I could say I hated, but the woman on the screen topped my list. That's my cousin, Sofia Bruzzo. Marco's mouth fell open. You're related? My mother was Tommaso Abruzzo's sister. I clamped my mouth shut before I said too much. I'd tell Marco the full story, but I didn't feel compelled to share it with the others. I was surprised to see her at the party. I wasn't aware the Marchionis and Abruzzos were on friendly terms. We aren't, Marco and Enzo said in unison. 
Shauna frowned. Do you know what business Sofia Abruzzo would have with the mayor of New Orleans? No, why? The thought of running into Sofia in New Orleans made my pulse race. We absolutely hated each other. The woman was a slutty psychopath, a violent, slutty psychopath. Shauna typed something into the computer. Another media player window popped up. We watched the video footage of Sophia and an older man exchanging envelopes and engaging in a kiss. Marco made a sour face. That dude is twice her age. Enzo pinched the bridge of his nose. That dude runs the city and has his fingers in the pie of any organized crime that happens in the parish. Shauna glared. Whatever she's doing here, it isn't good. I'd prayed for a sign before I came downstairs, and I may have received one. The Abruzzos paying off an elected official in New Orleans could only mean one thing. They were looking to step in when the Marchionis stepped out. Considering they already ran most of the east coast of the United States, taking over the port city would make them more powerful than the other families combined. Can you get Gabe on the phone? I need to speak to him. He's a busy man, Nico, Enzo glared, but I didn't take it personally. He and Shauna were arguing. I was an easy target. I understand that, but it involves the Abruzzos. I met Enzo's gaze and lifted my chin. With Sofia in town, do you still believe my father is responsible for the attacks on your family? Enzo ignored me. I pushed into his line of vision. They're here for a reason, Enzo. Instead of brooding, you should be asking yourself what that reason is and who is supporting them. Marco cursed under his breath and turned to me. Let's go make that call. Chapter 11, Marco. If I lived to see my hundredth birthday, I would never figure out women. Nico had all but made me take a blood oath not to tell anyone about her father's stranglehold on the Frate Lanza and his plans to force Enzo to take Gabe's place as capo after he and Nico were married. Three hours later, she told Gabe herself. Avoiding my gaze, Nico sat back, folded her hands, and said, I'm not sure what, if any of this Enzo knows. Not much, or he would have said something to me by now, Gabe said. He had that right. Enzo would outright ask Gabe to step aside and let him take my father's position. If Enzo had any idea Pietro Lazio would back his proposal, he would have used it as leverage. Nico frowned at the speakerphone. Are you going to tell him? No, he's not. I had no idea what she was playing at, but I didn't like the idea of either of them sweetening the marriage deal. While I didn't want to believe Enzo would kick Shauna to the curb for a seat at the mafia big boys table, I couldn't be sure. Gabe sighed. Nico, I'm not your father. I'm not forcing anyone to make a decision based on fear. I want all of us out of this shit. But if Enzo chooses to stay in, that's on him. It won't be because of some fucked up sense of obligation to keep the rest of us safe. She rubbed her fingers over her lips. I will go along with whatever Enzo wants. The hell you will? Has she lost her mind? After everything you went through to break free, you go back? Nico winced as if I'd struck her. I'm not like you. I didn't grow up in America. Sicily is my home. If the Abruzzos rule the five families, she shook her head. Innocent people will suffer. So you're going to what? Offer yourself up as sacrifice? Gabe's voice rose. Marco, chill the hell out. Let's talk to Enzo before we crucify anyone. There's more you need to know. Shauna has video footage of Sofia Abruzzo paying off Mayor Clark, Nico said. They are likely making a play to take over your New Orleans operations. We can't let that happen. No, we can't. His voice turned to steel. Shauna came into the office alone. Hi, Gabe. Sorry I'm late to the party. Have Marco and Nico caught you up in the situation with the Abruzzos? Thanks for joining us, Shauna. He sighed. I'm not thrilled that Enzo shared as much as he did about the family business with you, but what's done is done. Considering Maggie knows just about everything, that's rather hypocritical of you. Enzo marched in and sat in my father's chair. Seeing him behind the desk made my heart sink. He's already acting like he's in charge. He's going to agree to the marriage, 
Not because he cares about Nico, because he wants to run the show. I told Maggie the truth about us the night I proposed. Gabe sounded defensive. I glanced between Enzo and Shauna. I hadn't stopped to consider how difficult it would be to tell a woman about the family business. Yet another reason I found Nico appealing. She understood the situation in ways outsiders couldn't. Hell, she understood it better than I did. Enzo said, You shared our secrets with her because you loved her and planned to spend the rest of your life with her. Funny, I did much the same. Nico's mouth fell open and she turned to me. For the first time since we'd argued upstairs, I thought I knew what she was thinking. Enzo had admitted he was in love with Shauna, which could possibly put an end to Pietro Lazio's demands. However, the object of his affections did not seem impressed. Shauna rolled her eyes and shook her head. I had no idea what had happened between the two of them while they were out, but it obviously wasn't good. They'd seemed so happy together before they'd left the house. Hell, they couldn't keep their hands off each other. So much so, I was sure they'd worn ruts in the bedroom floor. What the hell happened? Gabe said, right. Now can we discuss the Abruzzos? By all means. Enzo stared at Shauna, but she turned away. I knew the Abruzzos were going to be a problem, but I didn't see this coming. Gabe paused, likely still processing the information. My guess is they want to take our place in New Orleans. That he'd used Nico's words made me nervous. Gabe was feeding Enzo the information we discussed to see if he'd bite, to see if he wanted our father's position and everything that went along with it. Gabe said, Enzo, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. With the mayor in their pocket, the local authorities will turn a blind eye. I'm more concerned with the fact our homes and businesses are here. I can't imagine the Abruzzos will want us to remain in the city. I agree. They aren't known to share. Nico sighed, and I couldn't help but wonder about her relationship or lack thereof with her mother's side of the family. Do you honestly believe they will run you out of town? Shauna glanced between us. Once they have a solid foothold, yeah, I do. Gabe's voice hardened. Like it or not, this business with the mayor is Pop's bad karma coming back to bite us in the ass. I rested my elbows on my thighs and clasped my hands. Before we get too far down the sins of the father road, how can we stop this? Nico sighed. If Enzo and I get married, the other families will support the union. The Abruzzos are strong, but they can't stand against everyone. The fuck is she thinking? Shauna dipped her chin. My goal is for us to go legit, not force people into a marriage they don't want, Gabe said. Your mother has been working with Pietro Lazio. She plans to put Enzo in your place as head of the family once he and Nico are married. Shauna's words hit me like a high-caliber bullet to the brain. She's in love with him, but she freaking handed Enzo to Nico on a silver platter? What the hell happened between them tonight? Not only that, but she let the damn cat out of the bag. It's over, son of a bitch. I've lost Nico before I even had her. I rubbed my breastbone to ease the ache. Somewhere along the line, my friendship with Nico had morphed into something more. Something that scared the living shit out of me. Something I wasn't ready to let go. Nico nodded. She's right. Gabe's voice rose. Enzo? I plan to tell you during this call. Ma thought if I took over, I could cut the rest of you loose without any bloodshed. Gabe cleared his throat. Is this what you want? To take over? Does it matter? Enzo swallowed hard and pressed his lips into a tight line. Holy shit, he looks like he's going to cry. He doesn't want it. My mind blanked and I broke out in a cold sweat. For as long as I could remember, Enzo had made noise about wanting to be the next Marchione Capo. He'd spent his entire life trying to prove himself to my father, only to be pushed aside in favor of first Joe Jr. and then Gabe. Never in a million years had I thought he'd give up the chance to lord over the rest of us. Gabe exhaled a deep breath. I'm willing to work with you for now and step aside once things are settled. What will it be? Do you want this or not? Enzo hesitated and my heart slammed against my chest. My entire life hung on his answer. No, not my entire life. I have feelings for Nico, but that doesn't mean I'm in love with her. Sure, it'd hurt like a bitch to see her marry my brother, but I'd get over it. Wouldn't I? Who am I kidding? Having Nico for a sister-in-law would freaking kill me. Nico filled the silence. 
Before you answer that, know that my father will side with the Abruzzos if there is no wedding. I shot her a pleading look. She didn't want the marriage. She'd done everything in her power to get out of it. Why was she pushing him for it now? I figured as much. But that doesn't change my mind about sentencing the two of you to a life of unhappiness, Gabe said. Enzo, do you want to take over? No. I blew out of breath. Thank Christ, Shauna stood. You said you did. At one point, I thought so, but I've changed my mind. Enzo gave her a what the fuck look, and so did I. She ignored him and leaned closer to the speakerphone. Gabe, give him some time to think it over. It's been a rough night. What the hell is wrong with these women? Are they in cahoots to make us crazy? I don't need time. I know what I want. Enzo nodded to Nico. You don't want to be married to me, do you? No. She glanced at me and sighed. But I'm willing to go through with it to prevent anyone I care about from getting hurt. I couldn't sit still another second. I paced the floor but kept an eye on Nico. Something else was going on behind those beautiful brown eyes of hers, and I intended to find out what. She's right. Think about what this could mean for your family and the people in Comiso. Shauna's voice rose. Enzo glared. I said no, Gabe said. Why don't the two of you work this out and call me back? No, staring at Shauna, Enzo said, I don't want it. Gabe sighed. Great. Now that's settled. How do we bring the Abruzzos and Mayor Carter down? The conversation continued around me, but I heard every third word or so. Enzo had turned down the position and the marriage, but I wasn't sure where that left me and Nico. Nothing had changed on my side, but she seemed downright disappointed. Oh, you idiot. She isn't disappointed. She never wanted to marry the blockhead. She's scared. The weird thing was, she'd seemed okay by the pool. Hell. She'd seen more than okay. The woman had shocked the shit out of me with her dirty tongue. I cracked a grin. Her and her mixed up idioms. I walked behind Nico and rested my hand on her shoulder. She sighed and laced her fingers with mine. The tiny gesture gave me hope, but more than that, it gave me the courage to do what I should have done a long time ago. I leaned close and whispered, I don't want you to marry Enzo. She turned and stared. Let's see where this thing between us goes. Her mouth moved wordlessly before she glanced back to Enzo and Shauna. The couple might have been at war, but they both watched us with the same curious expression. A rustling noise filled the phone line, followed by Gabe's muffled voice. I'm going to need to wrap this up soon. The doctor is here to examine Pops. How is he? I asked. The same as before. He has good days and bad days. Enzo asked. Is Pops well enough to answer a few questions? Gabe said, if not now, he will be tomorrow. Why? You're aware he's made many sizable contributions to Carter's election campaign. Enzo nodded to me. And even larger donations to Carter's offshore accounts. I grinned. Without the mayor, the Abruzzos will have a hell of a time taking over New Orleans, no matter who's backing them in Sicily. Gabe laughed the first real laugh I'd heard from him since the wedding reception. And the mayor can't take us down without drowning with us. We'll need proof, Enzo said. I rubbed my hands together. Give me a few hours in the Marchione Corp server, and I'll have your proof. But what do we do about the Abruzzos? If they're serious about pushing us out, they'll look for another way in when Carter falls. Gabe cleared his throat. I wasn't going to tell you two until I had more definitive information, but the informant who came forward about Joe's murder claims the Abruzzo family ordered the hit. My knees threatened to go out from beneath me. My eldest brother and his wife had been murdered in a staged car crash a couple of years before. Not a day went by that I didn't think about him or wish I could pick up the phone and ask for advice. The police had ruled their deaths an accident, but my father had always believed it was a hit. It seemed he was right. The question is, how do- Chapter 12 Nicolina. I'd attended many funerals in my 26 years on the planet. The first had been my grandmother's, though it was so long ago that I wasn't sure which of my memories were real and which I'd conjured up in my imagination after listening to stories. However, this was not the case for Joe and Rebecca Marchionni's funeral. 
The horrible sadness of that day had haunted me for over two years. Joe Jr., the oldest of the Marchioni boys, had been my first crush. Though he was 10 years older than me, I'd fallen hard for the enigmatic teen at the ripe old age of six. I'd followed him around like a hungry kitten for an entire summer. When his family had returned to the United States, I begged my father to order Joe to marry me. Two years later, Marco had told me Joe was to wed an Irish girl named Rebecca, and that they were going to have a baby. I hated her, until the day I met her. Unlike the other girls the older Marchioni boys had dated, she was always kind to me. The first time I'd walked into St. Louis Cathedral was their wedding. The last time was their funeral. Memories of that day flooded me. Two caskets covered with white roses, three orphaned children too stunned to understand what they'd lost, five mafia bosses with tears in their eyes, Mafia bosses, including my uncle, Tommaso Abruzzo. Hey. Marco met me outside on the pool deck and slid his arms around my waist. Turning to face him, I whispered, Are you all right? He pressed his brow to mine and closed his eyes. No. But I will be, once we find a way to make Abruzzo pay. Marco. The tone of his voice sent a chill down my spine. Justice, or revenge, worked considerably different in the mafia than in normal circles. While the Cosa Nostra believed in an eye for an eye, they preferred to know and approve of said eye gouging ahead of time. Plus, their trials didn't operate like a court of law in the United States. Evidence often came down to hearsay, and verdicts depended on who owed who favors. His shoulders shook. I miss him every fucking day. And Rebecca, she was innocent. The Abruzzos orphaned three children. For what? Because Joe wanted out. Like Gabe does now. I pulled back and met his eyes. Did Joe tell you that? No. He told Dante, and my father confirmed it. And now that Gabe is pushing to leave, the Abruzzos are coming after your family again. I wanted to call and warn my father, but I didn't dare risk giving away my hiding place. Not to mention, he might already know Joe had wanted out, and if that was the case, he'd likely known about the hit. Regardless of the circumstances, the Abruzzos will answer for this. Promise me you won't do anything foolish. I had to talk some sense into him. The last thing anyone needed was Marco getting in over his head. Promise me you will. He pulled away and moved as if to kneel, but winced. Hang on, this isn't going the way I imagined it. My heart beat hard enough to crack my ribs. I pressed my hand to my chest but nothing could stop the riot going on inside me. He's proposing? Marco? Don't say anything until you hear me out. His ears turned bright red as he scooted a chair close and half knelt, half sat. I pushed aside my feelings for him and focused on the reality of the situation. In other words, I told myself, this wasn't real. He was doing this to save me. I'd seen it a million times before. He had a terminal case of hero complex. Marco was every girl's dream, which was probably why he'd had so many women over the years. And he's always sworn he'd never settle down. The air left my lungs and I struggled to replace it. The news about Joe Jr. was difficult for me to hear, but Marco had taken it much harder. You've had a shock. This isn't the time for- This thing with the Abruzzos got me thinking. We don't have all the time in the world to wait for the perfect moment, Nick. He tensed his jaw. Let me say what I need to, please. Is this about revenge? I had to put a stop to this before he crossed a line we couldn't uncross. I dropped my knees in front of him. Marco, don't do this. He furrowed his brow. Why? 
Because doing the right thing for the wrong reasons is wrong. I can't think of a better reason to marry someone than wanting to spend time with my best friend. So what if that happens to stop you from marrying an asshole and stops a mob war in the process? He wiggled his brows. Come on, what do you say? Marry me. I would have leaped into his arms and covered his face with kisses if he'd said he loved me. But he didn't. Spending time with my best friend wasn't the same thing. Our marriage would have an expiration date. This was a business arrangement, a way to stop my father from forcing me into a life I didn't want. A chilling thought banged around in my head and fell out of my mouth. If the Abruzzos fall and the Marchionis leave, which families will rise to take their places? Marco stared. I don't know. Who will my father want to make alliances with next? Who will he sell me to? Names and faces spun through my mind like images on a slot machine. Several less powerful families had made it known they wanted a seat at the table. Which one would my father choose? Which man would he demand I marry next? A total stranger? Someone two or three times my age? No one, if you're already married to me. Yes. The word fell out of my mouth before I could stop it. He was right. There were far worse reasons to commit your life to someone than spending time with your best friend. Marco's face lit up like St. Peter's Square on Christmas Eve. Yeah? Yes. He patted his pants pockets, likely looking for his phone. Wait, before you tell anyone, we need to work out the rules. His hands stilled. Rules? Yes, rules, because I need to protect my heart. We can go through with a fake marriage because you promised me nothing would ruin our friendship. But we should have terms. That way we're clear on the expectations. Fake marriage, right. He glanced away. Lay them on me. We need a definite time limit. I tapped my lips. How long can I play platonic house with him and somehow survive when it ends? Six months. You're doing this to keep your father from forcing you to marry someone else. Shouldn't we plan to end the marriage when the threat is gone? That could take years. I couldn't do it. I couldn't bottle up my feelings for him. But if I didn't, I wouldn't want to walk away. His eyes widened. Nine months. The tone of his voice told me the mere mention of spending years with me horrified him. I couldn't bring myself to meet his gaze. Marco cleared his throat. What else? You mentioned not consummating the union is a failsafe, but it isn't. We can petition the church based on the fact I'm still a virgin, but... Marco whipped his head back to me. You're a virgin? Biting my lip, I nodded. How is that even possible? You should ask how it's possible I could have had sex. I grinned at his wide-eyed expression. I've been surrounded by bodyguards my entire life. He moved his hands as if trying to grasp an invisible object. But you've dated guys. Yes, under the illusion of privacy, but my father's men were never far away. His reaction made my cheeks burn. You're behaving like I have a terminal disease. Marco tossed his head back in laughter. No, not terminal. There's a simple cure. I smacked his arm and stood. As I was saying, the entire notion of proving virginity through a physical exam is a myth. There is no actual medical test to verify a woman has never had intercourse. His grin broadened. We could do the deed and still have the marriage dissolved? Doing deeds complicates things. Now stop thinking about sex and focus. I shook my head. We would need to prove the marriage was entered into under duress or false pretenses. Easy. We can sign a document outlining the reasons we're doing it. Any doubt I had about his intentions vanished. 
I'd sign whatever he put in front of me, but I wouldn't read it. There were some things I didn't want to know, like his true feelings for me. Sure. Marco took my hand. Let's go. Where? I swear on my mother's grave, if he says he's taking me to bed, I'm going to stab him. He all but dragged me through the kitchen. Unless you have your birth certificate with you, I need to call a guy and have one made. Then I'm going to the courthouse. Louisiana has a waiting period before we can tie the knot. I stopped walking. You're going alone? Only one of us needs to be present to get the license. How do you know so much about the laws? I'm an attorney. And I might have looked it up. His ears turned red again. Marco Marchioni was embarrassed. If I didn't know better, I would have sworn he was excited about our upcoming wedding. The funny thing was, I had butterflies. Fake or not, I was about to marry the man I loved. We should finish the rules first, he groaned. My rule is we have no freaking rules. Laughing, I looped my arm with his. Fine. Let's go call a guy about a thing and head to the courthouse like Bonnie and Claude. Clyde, it's Bonnie and Clyde. And we should come up with another outlaw couple, one that didn't die young. I tapped my lips. Velma and Louis? Thelma and Louise died at the end of the movie. He gave me side eye. I've never seen it. I'll add that to the list of things you've never done, but are going to do as soon as we're married. Marco turned, swept me off my feet, and carried me toward the stairs. Hey, put me down. I pretended to struggle, but I enjoyed goofing around with him. Even if temporarily being in his arms would permanently break my heart. What else is on this list? You'll have to wait until we're married to find out. He used his bedroom voice, the one that told me he was thinking about sex again. What was that you said about waiting for the perfect moment? Nuzzling into his neck, I whispered, why put off until tomorrow when you can do me right now? Marco chuckled, one day I'm going to sit you down and teach you every American idiom I know. I smiled against his warm skin. I messed that one up on purpose. Chapter 13, Marco. The little velvet box in my pocket mocked me. I proposed and she'd said yes. The ring should have been sparkling on her finger, but she'd started talking about rules and I'd chickened out. Technically, I was an engaged man, but as Nico reminded me, the marriage was a business deal. I'd arranged security for my trip to the courthouse, picked up Nico's counterfeit birth certificate, had our contract drawn up, and gotten the marriage license in less than three hours. However, tracking down Father Brian, my family's go-to priest, and convincing him to conduct the ceremony on the sly without the prerequisite counseling and other bullshit took for freaking ever. Add in a few hours of research at Marchione Corp to dig up dirt on Mayor Carter, and I was ready to crash. I dragged my tired ass up the stairs and ran into Enzo, carrying a bin of tiny rocks. What the hell is that? He smirked. It's a litter box. You found her cat? If we were correct about the Abruzzos, they'd burned Shauna's apartment down and killed her cat. Or so we thought. Yes, Enzo lowered his voice. We took down two of the Abruzzos' guys and caught a traitor. She's downstairs. Why did you bring her here? When I had been small, my father had brought a man to the mansion. I didn't remember much except the guy's screams and finding Hildy cleaning up gore from the laundry room floor. And people wonder why I have phobias and can't stand the sight of blood. I'll explain on the way, follow me. He walked toward his room. One of my employees was either working for the mayor or the Abruzzos. I intend to find out which and what exactly she was doing for them. I swallowed hard. And then what? Then I either have her arrested or scare into hiding. Thank Christ, I thought you were going to, I can't hurt a woman, no matter what she's done. Does that make me soft? I clamped a hand on his shoulder. No, bro, it makes you a decent human being. Where is she? 
and the laundry room with security. I took the makeshift litter box from him. Go downstairs. I'll help Shana with the cat. Thanks. He scrubbed his hands over his head and walked downstairs. Shauna met me in the hall. Dark circles shadowed her eyes and her skin looked paler than usual, but what worried me was the way her hands trembled when she took the plastic bin. Where's Enzo? He went to deal with our guest. I frowned. What the hell happened? She leaned against the door frame. A woman called. She claimed to have gotten my number off one of the missing cat flyers in the quarter. You should sit. You look like you're going to pass out. I placed my hand on her upper arm and guided her into the bedroom. The whole thing seemed fishy, so we arranged a meeting. Shauna sank onto the bed next to the fattest cat I'd ever seen. The orange and white hairball hissed at me and darted away. Turns out she was one of Enzo's longtime waitresses. Nodding, I said. What's this business about you two taking people down? We had a little help from some friends at the New Orleans PD. They took Abruzzo's men in for questioning. She sucked in a breath and stood. I should get downstairs. I want to be there when Enzo questions Tara. My brain misfired. Tara Cole? Yes, do you know her? I knew Tara, all right. We'd had a one-nighter a couple of years back. She was one of the rare women I'd become friends with after her role in the sheets. Yeah, we hang out sometimes. Shauna sighed. You and Nico don't need to be involved in this. Stay upstairs. I'll let you know what Enzo and I find out. Thanks. I followed her to the door, but went in the opposite direction when we reached the hall. Tara freaking Cole. What have you gotten yourself into? My folks had warned me and my brothers about getting too close to outsiders. So much so, we'd mostly kept to ourselves in school. That had ended when we discovered girls, but I, for one, was always wary of trusting anyone with our family secrets. I racked my brain for anything I might have said to Tara that she could have told the Abruzzos. While I didn't think I slipped up, I couldn't be entirely sure. Why the hell did I stay in contact with her? Because I'd trusted her. She was Enzo's employee. She was a mom for crying out loud. I opened the bedroom door and stopped in my tracks. Nico had stretched out in the center of the bed, wearing a pair of itty-bitty pajama shorts and a tank top. She laid on her stomach, reading a book with her knees bent and feet in the air. Cute wasn't a word I normally use to describe Nico Lazio, but in that moment, she was the cutest thing I'd ever seen. She glanced up from the page and flashed me her cover girl smile. Marco, did you get it? I nodded, unable to form a simple word. Nico sat upright and tilted her head. You were gone so long I was worried. Call me selfish or foolish or any number of other issues, but I didn't want to tell her about the woman downstairs or Abruzzo's men or that I'd bribed a priest to fake marry us. I'd miss the way her eyes lit when she smiled and meant it. I couldn't bring myself to ruin her mood. Everything's great. I should have called. I didn't mean to worry you. Kicking my shoes off as I went, I made my way to the bed and plopped down with my head next to her legs. She ran her fingers through my hair. Are you all right? As long as you keep doing that, I'm golden. Meeting her gaze, I said, this time tomorrow, we will be married. Her fingers stopped moving. You spoke to a priest? Yep. He's meeting us in a small parish church outside the city tomorrow night at 10. I wrapped my fingers around her wrist and moved her hand back and forth over my scalp. She tugged my hair, laughed, and resumed the caresses. Do we need to bring anything? Everything that had happened after she'd said yes had gone by in a blur of nerves and frustration. I'd focused solely on the legalities and logistics and hadn't given any thought to the ceremony itself. You'll need a dress and flowers and a cake. I'd stood beside Gabe when he'd married the love of his life, Maggie, not three weeks ago. But I came up blank with what else went into a wedding. I don't need any of those things, Marco. She stretched out beside me. Turning my head in her direction, I said, Maybe I do. Maybe I want to see you walking toward me in a white dress. Where the hell had that come from? There isn't time for that. Brides order their gowns months in advance. She rolled to her side and rested her hand on my chest. But there is one thing I would like. Lying there with her, staring into each other's eyes, felt like the most natural thing in the world. I could get used to this. For a while, anyway. Name it. Nico whispered. I would rather our first kiss not be in a church in front of a priest. Did you forget? We've kissed before. We were in fifth grade. You had a boyfriend. You were worried he would try to kiss you, and you didn't know how. She leaned closer. I didn't have a boyfriend. 
You tricked me into kissing you? Inching toward her face, I couldn't help a grin. I didn't want you to say no. I could never say no to you, Picolina. I brushed my lips across hers once, twice, three times before delving deeper. She tasted like warm blueberry syrup and promises whispered under the blankets. She tasted like my past and my future. I'm so screwed. Scooting closer, Nico opened her mouth wider and kissed me back. Between her soft moans and tentative hands moving over my back and shoulders, I was a goner. Much to my surprise, Nico met me on every turn. My entire world narrowed to a heartbeat of time between our lips meeting and parting. When I pulled away, she sighed the sort of sigh that men lived for. The kind that told us we'd done something very right. With everything around us going wrong, that small breath was like a life preserver in a raging ocean. Marco? Shauna knocked on the door. Can I come in? Tara, she, it's worse than we thought. Shit. One sec. Sitting up, Nico trailed her hand down my arm as if she wasn't ready to stop touching me. A sentiment I shared wholeheartedly. I stood, straightened my shirt, and adjusted my cock before opening the door. Shauna stood with her hands in her pockets and her shoulders slumped. Her eyes and cheeks were red as if she'd been crying. Tara's been working for the Abruzzos for quite some time. She's stonewalling Enzo until she knows her kids are safe. Drew and Sammy? I'd met her children a couple of times. The oldest was in preschool and the youngest hadn't started walking. I didn't want to think of something happening to them. She gave me an odd look. I didn't catch their names. Where are they? With her ex-husband. Shauna visibly shook herself and squared her shoulders. The Abruzzos know the address. Enzo needs you to get a security team over there to take them someplace safe. I'll bring them here. Is that wise? Nico said from behind me. Fuck, I was going to have some serious explaining to do. With everything going on, our security team is spread thin. It'll take a day or so to find a place for Tara and the kids to hide and arrange security for them. Nico frowned, but nodded. I glanced back at Shauna. I'll take care of it. Thanks. By the way, I owe you both an apology. Before the call with Gabe, she drew a deep breath. I thought I was doing the right thing by pushing Enzo away, but I didn't think about how that would affect the two of you. Nico offered a sad smile. There's no need to apologize. I thought the same thing. I mean, Enzo and my marriage would solve some problems. And cause a shitload more. I shook my head. No way in hell would I allow either of them to martyr themselves. So you and Enzo are solid? As solid as we can be, given the situation. She grinned before turning and walking down the hall. Nico waited until I closed the door before asking, What is going on? Who is this Terra person? Enzo and Shauna had an incident with the Abruzzos tonight. She stared open mouthed Why didn't you tell me? I was planning to, but when I saw you in those tiny pajama shorts. I shook my head and forced myself to focus on something other than my dick. One of Enzo's employees has been working for the Abruzzos. He brought her here, but he's not going to hurt her. Okay. She furrowed her brow. Does he know what he is going to do with her? Scare her and get her talking? After that, I'm not sure. If he'd rather not get involved. No, I'll help any way I can. Nico hesitated, glanced down, and finally back to me. You know this woman and her children? She's a friend of mine. I kissed her cheek. Just a friend? Yep. To cover the quasi-lie, I motioned to the door. I should get downstairs. I'll come with you. Give me a minute to change. She walked to the dresser and picked up the shorts and t-shirt she'd worn earlier in the day. You're going to need more clothes. Yes, but in the excitement at the airport, I didn't keep any of the money I stole from my father for myself. And I haven't been able to get to my secret stash here. She closed the bathroom door behind her. Babe, just write down your sizes and make a list of the items you want. I'll have Hildy order whatever you need. I laughed, despite my mood. And don't forget to include a white dress. Chapter 14, Nicolina. Memories of waiting in other armored SUVs with other armed guards flooded me. This wasn't the first time I watched someone I loved put themselves in danger, but I told myself this was different. Marco had gone inside the house to save two children, not to extract mafia justice on someone who'd wronged him. 
Still, I couldn't shake the sense of deja vu when he strode up the walk and pounded on the door like one of my father's enforcers. Are you all right, ma'am? The guard in the front seat stared at me in the rearview mirror. No, I'm definitely not all right. Forcing a smile, I said, I'm fine. Please call me Nico. Stuart. He turned his attention back to the small track house on the outskirts of New Orleans. Marco emerged, carrying a baby in one arm and a small child in the other. Unlike some men who tensed up and moved like robots when handling kids, he walked with his usual easy grace. However, there was no mistaking the hard set of his jaw. A second guard stood on the front porch, discreetly holding a gun to a shirtless man's side, while the third jogged ahead and opened the back door to the SUV. Take him. Marco handed me the baby, a chubby little guy with snot oozing from his nose. Wincing, I settled the soggy toddler on my lap. I'd never spend time around young children. I was the youngest of my family, and none of my brothers had married, let alone had kids. The little guy stared at me with the biggest blue eyes I'd ever seen, and I knew two things for certain. One, I wouldn't let Sofia Abruzzo or anyone else hurt this child. And two, I wanted one of my own. Daddy! The boy couldn't have been older than four, but he struggled to break free from Marco's grasp. It's all right, son, I'll get you back. The guy on the front porch was either desperate or stupid. Ignoring the gun pressed to his side, he shouted, you can't take my kids, I know who you are. I'll call the police. Marco struggled to get the older child into the back seat, but the boy moved quicker than a spider monkey. He extended his skinny arms and grabbed the door frame one second and kicked the next. What the hell is Marco thinking? The Abruzzos won't think twice about putting a bullet in that man's head. We can't leave their father behind. You know what will happen to him. Scowling, Marco motioned to the guard on the porch. Bring him. The white showed all the way around the man's pupils. Where are you taking us? Marco shot me a see what you did, look, and called over his shoulder. We don't have time for this. Get in, I'll explain later. Oh, for goodness sakes. I pulled the baby closer to my chest and climbed out of the SUV. Please, sir, you and your sons are in danger. We're trying to help you, but you need to come with us now. The man looked me over as if I were an all-you-can-eat buffet. I can protect my own. Get back in the vehicle, Nicolina. The ice in Marco's voice surprised me. I'd never heard him use such a hard tone. Not yet. I turned back to the father and motioned to the armed security team. Don't be an idiot. There will be twice as many men here any minute. Get in the SUV or you won't live long enough to call the authorities. He swallowed hard, strode to the SUV and slid in beside his older son. I climbed back in and rubbed the now screaming baby's back. It's okay, Sammy, we're going to see your mommy. Marco settled beside me and made goofy faces at the baby. Sammy took one look at him and nuzzled into my shoulder. I had a difficult time making sense of Marco's behavior. He'd barged into the house like he planned to shoot anyone who got in his way, and now he cooed to a toddler? Stuart put the vehicle in drive and sped away with the other guards following us in a second SUV. Time to buckle up, Drew. The father helped the boy fasten his seatbelt. One of you needs to tell me what the H-E-L-L is going on. Marco opened his mouth to speak, but I rested my hand on his arm. The last thing we needed was for the two of them to get into another shouting match. I turned and looked the man in the eye. I'm Nicolina. Once again, he checked me out. Pete, Pete Cole. Your ex-wife is mixed up with some very, I glanced at the kid and chose my words carefully. Interesting people. They won't be happy if she stops doing business with them. He ran his hand over his mouth and chin. I told her not to get mixed up with the Marchionis when she took that damned job. What does she do? 
She starts sleeping with pretty boy there. That's enough. Marco ground his teeth. Tara was Marco's lover? Is that why he's so worried about her children? I'd asked him outright how he knew the waitress, and he'd lied to me. I don't know what Pete saw in my expression, but he shook his head. Do you know what you're getting into with the Marchionis? Or it is their M-A-F-I-A. Most people in Sicily spoke of the Cosa Nostra in whispers. And yes, some treated us with disdain. But I'd never heard someone spell it out as if it were a curse word. I had no idea how to respond. Marco said, keep talking and I'll show you how real those rumors are. Pete went pale, turned his head, and stared out the window. We spent the remainder of the trip in silence. Even the baby seemed afraid to utter a peep after the way Marco had threatened his father. Stuart parked in the driveway of the carriage house adjacent to the mansion and checked his cell phone. You're needed inside, Mr. Marchioni. We'll take them inside and get them settled. Without as much as a glance my way, Marco exited the SUV. After you. Pete motioned for me to go. His voice had softened, but the hatred in his eyes seemed to grow with each passing second. Go ahead. I had questions, but I wasn't ready to face Marco. It wasn't any of my business who he'd slept with. That he'd lied hurt more than the truth ever could have. Pete and Drew climbed out and stood staring at the manicured grounds and house. Nico? Marco held his hand out to me. Rather than showing weakness in front of strangers, I took it, but I let go the second my feet were on the ground. I'll help get Pete and the kids settled. Enzo needs us inside. I forced a smile and settled Sammy on my hip. I'll be in in a few minutes. He gave me an odd look and strode inside. Stuart nodded to a side door of the carriage house. This way. We followed him into what looked like a war room. Computer monitors covered two long built-in desks, different angles of the interior and exterior of the main house, as well as the grounds, flashed on the screens. Two men, dressed in the requisite black cargo pants and t-shirts, glanced at us as we passed. Pete swallowed hard and gripped Drew's hand tighter. Upstairs was nothing like the first floor. Cozy couches and a television took up one side of the space, and what I assumed were bedrooms occupied the back half. A small kitchen area separated the two. Stuart clasped his hands behind his back. Make yourselves at home. There's food in the fridge. Use the intercom to call down if you need anything for the little ones. Pete glanced around. Is there a phone? Your friends didn't give me time to grab my cell. No, sir. You won't be making any outgoing calls tonight. He clenched his jaw. I stepped between the men. Stuart, please get some paper and a pen for Mr. Cole. He's going to need supplies for the baby and kid-friendly food for Drew. The little boy grinned when I said his name. And some toys? Drew nodded. Yes, ma'am. Stuart walked to the kitchenette. Pete narrowed his eyes. Why are you helping us? Because I know what it feels like to leave your home with nothing but the clothes on your back. With Stuart keeping a watchful eye, Pete and I spent a half hour making a list of the items he would need to get through a day or two with the kids. By the time we'd finished, I was exhausted and in need of a stiff drink. Thanks for this. Pete offered me a genuine smile. You're welcome but I couldn't leave you here with nothing. I'm pretty sure the little one needed a diaper change hours ago. I winced at the growing wet spot on my thighs. He frowned. You seem like a good woman. What are you doing with a bozo like Marchioni? He's not what you think he is. A mobster, he barked out a laugh. Stuart cleared his throat. Pete glanced over his shoulder at the other man, then leaned close and lowered his voice. I don't like him because he's been fucking my ex-wife for a couple of years now. But let me ask you a question. Years? My heart lurched. 
Okay. Why did he bust into my home with armed men? Why not knock and speak to me like a human being? I hated to admit it, but he had a point. I knew Tara was into some questionable shit. I would have listened to reason. He didn't have to scare my kids. He sat back and folded his arms. Because we didn't have time to explain. Because your lives were in danger. Because that's the way it's done. Chapter 15, Nicolina. The emotional whiplash of the previous hours wore on me as I made my way toward the office. It bugged me that Marco hadn't told me what had happened with Tara or the truth about his relationship. But if he had, we wouldn't have shared that amazing kiss. A kiss that I couldn't bring myself to regret, though I knew I should. Marco had behaved far too much like a mafioso for my tastes, even if he'd done it to save children. The last thing I wanted to do was sit in on another conference call with the Marchioni boys, but I hoped I could piece together enough information to see the bigger picture. The Abruzzos were in New Orleans to take over. That much was clear. What I didn't know was who, if anyone, in Sicily knew and supported their plans, the brothers might not know it yet, but they needed me. I knew the players, the rules, and how to cheat better than they did. Which is why Marco needs to keep me informed. I walked into the room, nodded to Enzo and Shauna, and took a seat as far from the speakerphone as possible. Papa Joe's gravelly voice drew my attention. This waitress... Will she make a statement about her involvement with Joe's accident? I spoke to her. She's agreed to tell the police in exchange for you helping her start over. Shauna glanced between Enzo and Marco and frowned. Enzo took her hand. He means, will she testify in Sicily to the heads of the other families? Oh, shit. Maybe? Shauna blushed. I felt bad for her. I couldn't imagine being thrown into the middle of a mafia war because I'd fallen in love with the wrong man. And despite her attempts to push him off on me earlier, I had no doubt she was in love with Enzo. Shauna had a lot to learn and a short time to do it. Gabe said, tell her she's going to speak to the Italian authorities and in return she's getting a week vacation in the beautiful, sunny Palermo. Enzo frowned at the phone. We'll get the poison and the waitress on a plane as soon as the meeting is scheduled. Poison? What poison? Joe died in a car wreck. Papa Joe said, Good. Once the families know the Abruzzos tried to have our entire family eliminated, they will have no choice but to retaliate. Marco must have seen my confused expression because he moved to my side and whispered, they ordered the waitress to poison the soup at Gabe and Maggie's engagement party. I'd attended the event and remembered Enzo saying something about someone pouring acetone in the minestrone. I whispered, fingernail polish remover smells horrible. That's more of a warning than an assassination attempt. Tara didn't go through with it. She panicked and poured acetone in the pot instead. He sighed. What they gave her could have killed or injured every one of the party. The gravity of what he'd said hit me. I was there, and so were Joe's children. This cannot stand. All eyes turned to me. Even the phone line went quiet. Oh no, no, no. Marco swore under his breath. If there's nothing else, I smell Hildy's sausage and mushroom quiche. I'm going to catch a couple hours of sleep, Enzo spoke louder than necessary. Papa Joe cleared his throat. Nicolina, is that you, dear? Yes, I'm here. My words came out shakier than I would have liked. I didn't realize you were in New Orleans. 
there are quite a few people looking for you. I'd messed up, big time. Rather than cower, I squared my shoulders and spoke in a calm, clear voice. Your sons were lovely enough to allow me the use of the company jet and a temporary place to stay. I hated to threaten a terminally ill man, even if the threat was veiled, but I'd made my point. If Papa Joe blabbed to my father, the Marchionis would face blowback. I'm glad to hear you're safe. His sickly sweet tone hardened. Make yourself at home. You'll be one of the family soon. Thank you, but I won't be staying long. I prayed he bought the lie. If it was a lie, Marco and I would need to rethink our plans now that more people knew my location. Nonsense. Nothing has changed. Your father and I expect a wedding this weekend. You and Enzo can return to Sicily together. Shana muttered under her breath and turned away. Trying to figure out my next move, I glanced between Enzo, Shana, and Marco. I had nothing, no cards left to play. Marco and I could continue with our plans, but we'd need to run as far from New Orleans as possible. Marco pointed to his left ring finger before motioning between himself and Enzo. I knew the answer before I asked the question, but I'd try anything to find a way out of this mess. Gabe, did my father specifically name Enzo as the Marchioni I was to marry? Yeah, he did. Gabe sighed. I see. Think, Nico, think. Marco shoved his hands in his pockets and stared at the floor. His crestfallen expression broke my heart, but it also made me question his feelings for me. Does he want more than a fake marriage? My stomach fluttered, but I put the thought out of my mind. We had things to discuss before I walked down the aisle, real commitment or not. I will have a talk with him. I stood and moved closer to the phone. His demands are impossible. I am married to someone else. Enzo glared at Marco, but he grinned his goofiest grin and shrugged. That certainly complicates things, Papa Joe chuckled. I'll leave it to you to share the joyous news with your father. Thank you. I wanted to run from the room, but my feet refused to move. Enzo said, good night, pops. Marco pressed the disconnect button before his father could reply. You two are married? Enzo cracked a smile. Not yet, but we will be. Marco looped his arm through mine and escorted me out of the room. I didn't know if I wanted to laugh or cry. I shouldn't have said that. Laughing, Marco grabbed my face in both hands, pressed his brow to mine. That was freaking brilliant. Don't bother telling your father. I'm sure my mother is already burning up the phone lines. Brilliant. I felt as if I would faint, and he acted like I'd just cured cancer. Don't you see? The Abruzzos are going down. Your father wants to keep the balance in his favor, right? Yes. I knew where he was going with this, but didn't have the heart to tell him our situation had become infinitely more complicated. With them gone, he let us out to keep the upper hand with the remaining two families and control which new ones come to the table. Bada bing, bada boom, the marriage thing goes away. Marriage thing? Mine and Enzo's, or does he mean ours? I pulled away. You must be relieved. He looked at me as if I'd asked him to join the priesthood. Relieved? You think I'm going to back out on you now? I shrugged. No way, not after what I went through to get the license. His smile wilted, unless you're having second thoughts. No, if anything, this news makes me more desperate for a way out. Once again, he stared at me as if I were insane. You know the legend of the Hydra? You cut one head off and two grow back. Other families will rise to fill the voids. 
The question is, which ones and how awful will they be? Yes, but Hercules was able to defeat it with a little help from his cousin, or in my case, my brothers. Marco slung his arm around my shoulder. Have faith in me. I do, but we need to talk. You lied to me about Terra. I did, and I'm sorry. It won't happen again. Why did it happen in the first place? He ran his hand over the back of his neck. Here's the thing. You and I, we've known each other a long time. I've told you things I would never tell a girlfriend. Like how many women you've slept with. I could understand his predicament. I'd felt much the same about sharing my lack of experience. Exactly like that. He turned my face toward his. It was stupid, but I didn't want you to feel awkward or jealous. Do you plan to have sex with her again? It was only one time, but no, I don't. Once, I frowned up at him, but Pete said, Pete's a jealous asshole. Nodding, I said, and you swear no more lies? Yes. Then nothing has changed between us. I'd done the very thing I made him swear he'd never do. I'd lied, partly by omission and partly outright. The way he'd behaved at Pete's house scared me more than I cared to admit. No matter how I felt about Marco, I wanted as far away from the mafia as I could get. Great, then we have a wedding to plan. For the second time in as many days, Marco swept me into his arms and carried me upstairs. Chapter 16, Marco. Not to brag, but I'd bounce more than my fair share of women on mattresses. Some of them laughed, and some gave come-hither smiles. Hell, most of them pulled me down with them. Nico did none of those things. She frowned and sat upright. I'm talking ramrod straight spine, knees to her chest, arms wrapped around her legs upright. I couldn't imagine a more closed off posture. Unless, of course, she'd tucked her head. What's wrong? Stupid question, but I was at a loss. Nico sighed, shifted her weight, and sat cross-legged with her arms folded. What happened on the call before I came into the room? Not much. We came up with plans to sink Mayor Carter and the Abruzzos. I sat in front of her. We should really talk about the wedding. She glanced away. I told you, I don't need all of the fuss. This is a marriage of convenience, a temporary business deal. Her words hit me in the solar plexus. Where is this coming from? Rubbing the center of my chest, I asked, if you're still upset about Tara, I have no right to be jealous of her or any of your other lovers. She'd said the right thing, but the venom in her voice said the exact opposite. Then what's wrong? I motioned to the bed we were sitting on. She dipped her chin. I'd known her far too long to play these sorts of games. She obviously had something on her mind, and I wasn't going to utter another word until she shared it with me. Nico glanced at me, sighed, and turned her attention to her nails. Fingers splayed, she frowned and picked at her cuticles. Come on, babe, give me something to go on here. I arched her brow. She repeated the process with her other hand. By the way she wrinkled her forehead and rolled her lips in, I assumed she was rehearsing what she wanted to say to me. I waited not so patiently. Narrowing her eyes, she said, okay, fine. I'm still upset you lied to me about Tara. Nice try, but that's not all. What's on that beautiful mind of yours? I nodded, but otherwise remained impassive. I don't want to be a mafia wife, her voice cracked. What the hell? That's great, because I don't want to be a mafia husband. She gave me an impatient look. Scratching the side of my head, I ran through the events of the previous couple of hours. Are you upset I wasn't going to bring Pete Cole here? She groaned, and I knew I was in trouble. I'm freaking lost here, Nick. I nudged her side. Use your words and tell me what I did wrong. It isn't what you did wrong, not entirely. Yes, you should never have considered leaving him behind, but that's not the problem. She switched back and forth between English and Italian as she laid into me. You walked in there ball swinging and guns out like an enforcer. There were children in that house, children you scared. You might not want to be mafiosi, but it is in your blood. It's who you are. 
I forced my brows down from my hairline. I didn't have time to sit down and discuss the situation over tea. I had no way of knowing when the Abruzzos would show up. And the man, Pete, you would have left him there to die if not for me? She jabbed her index finger in my direction. Okay, she has me there. I ran my hands over my head. You're right. I should have insisted he come, but Pete and Tara don't get along. She froze in place, stared and lowered her voice to a growl. You wouldn't have anything to do with that, would you? What? No, they were divorced before I met her. At the risk of earning myself a slap across the face, I took her hand. Nico tensed, but didn't pull away. Listen to me. I held her gaze until she nodded. I can understand why you feel the way you do. I handled things badly, but I wanted to get in and get out. You were in the car. I was worried the Abruzzos would show up and you'd get caught in the crossfire. Her expression softened. At work, I'm used to issuing orders and getting things done. It has nothing to do with wanting to stay in the mafia or taking after my father. I brushed her hair back from her face. Nico leaned into my touch. Tell me how you and your family intend to handle the situation with the Abruzzos. I planned to kiss her, but she pulled away before I had the chance. My father is sending me proof of illegal campaign contributions, bribes and payoffs he's made to Mayor Carter. Maggie, Gabe's wife, was a reporter. She's going to write up a press release with my father's statement. I'm going to leak this statement and proof to the media. Her eyes widened. That will ruin your family too. Maybe, maybe not. Pop seems to think a scandal will increase the Marchione mystique and drive more business to our bars, hotels, and restaurants. I'd gone along with the plan during the call, but now that I explained it out loud, I saw the million ways it could go wrong. You're planning to make money off your family's reputation as mobsters. She pressed her lips into a tight line. Exactly. Something like that. The other families won't approve. It goes against the number one rule of the Cosa Nostra. Don't share our secrets. You're going to break the Omerta. Breaking the goddamn vow of secrecy was punishable by death. We were so focused on stopping Mayor Clark from helping the Abruzzos, we hadn't thought about the repercussions on the other side of the ocean. A smile ghosted across Nico's face. Although, if it's Sponza's last-ditch effort to save your businesses from a hostile takeover, it could work. Yeah? It's risky, to say the least, but I doubt the Abruzzos are working alone. They must have the support of at least one other family in Sicily. If Gabe plays this right, he could expose your enemies. Her voice cracked with her final words. You think your father is involved? It's a possibility. I sucked in a breath. You heard the part about flying Terra to Palermo to testify against the Abruzzos? Yes, but without proof. And those working on getting the poison Sofia Abruzzo gave Terra. She claimed she buried it in her yard. I hitched a shoulder. While it's still one's word against another's, it's going to be hard to explain where a waitress got her hands on enough botulinum toxins to poison 300 people. Nico furrowed her brow. I nudged her side. You were good with Sammy. Thanks, but I don't have a lot of experience with kids. She might have played it down, but between the way she'd comforted the baby and the twinkle in her eyes, I could all but hear her biological clock ticking. Hang around Gabe and Maggie a while. They have a litter. I laughed to hide my sudden case of nerves. She tilted her head. Do you want that? A house full of children? A warning siren rang in the back of my mind. With any other woman, that question would have sent me running for the door, but this was Nick. She had me contemplating all sorts of things I'd sworn I'd never do. Sure, one day. My phone dinged with an incoming email. I glanced at the screen inside. It's the information from my father. I need to take care of this. It won't take long. I'll order some clothes and a white dress while you're working. She leaned forward and brushed her lips across mine. I'm supposed to work after she did that? Nico swayed toward me again and I took it as an invitation. How could I not? She was the kind of woman who made men break the rules. If she'd lived in another time, kings would have waged war to possess her. She had a body made for sin and a heart made for white dresses and flowers and forevers. A soft moan escaped her mouth and she moved her hands over my chest, arms, and shoulders randomly, as if she couldn't figure out where to touch me. 
without breaking the kiss. I grasped her hips and pulled her forward until she took the hint and settled in my lap with her long, tan legs circling me. I wound her dark hair around my hand and tugged her head back to expose the length of her neck. While kissing a line from her full lips to her collarbone, two things occurred to me. One, I could do this for the next six months, nine months, or nine freaking years, and it would never get old. Two, no one or nothing is going to stop me from giving her the sort of life she wants. Nico pressed closer and let out another soft moan. Slowly, almost tentatively, she ground herself against me. I saw stars. It didn't matter that we were both fully clothed, or that the angle of my cock meant she was getting off on the folds of my jeans instead of my body. It was the hottest non-sex sex I'd ever had, until my phone rang. Nico stopped moving. Ignore it. I drew her nipple into my mouth, t-shirt, bra, and all. What if it's Enzo? She pulled back. Babe, the last thing I want to hear you say right now is my brother's name. Tugging her hair, I pulled her head to the side and nuzzled into her neck. The damn call went to voicemail, but whoever it was, hit redial. Nico set her hands on my chest and pushed me back. It must be important. Grumbling, I took the phone from my back pocket. Marchione, I would like to speak to my daughter. I recognized the baritone voice instantly. Pietro Lazio. Chapter 17 Nicolina I couldn't move. After screwing up and speaking during the call with Mr. Marchionni, I assumed my father would learn my location. Oddly, I hadn't expected him to call. Papa was more of a send someone to kidnap me in the middle of the night kind of guy. The color had drained from Marco's face, but he somehow managed to keep his voice steady. Nico is busy. How can I help you? I couldn't make out my father's exact words, but Marco's frown deepened. Yes, she's married. He met my gaze. My heart thundered and fireflies danced in my peripheral vision. I shook my head and held up my hands. Please stop talking. Hang up. Please just hang up. Marco winked. He freaking winked and grinned and patted my thigh. I'm not at liberty to say who she married. My father's voice echoed through the room. You little shit. Put my daughter on the phone now or I will peel the flesh from your bones one ribbon at a time. I reached for the phone, but Marco blocked my efforts. He stood and walked toward the door. As I said before, she's busy. I'd be glad to give her a message. If my father was working with the Abruzzos, he had men at his disposal in New Orleans. Men who could easily reach the mansion. I had to do something to de-escalate the situation before Marco verbally dug his own grave, if he hadn't already. I drew a deep breath and shouted, Marco, do you know where I put my passport? I can't find it. Narrowing his eyes, he tightened his grip on the phone. Yes, sweetheart, you packed it in your carry-on bag. My stomach twisted. Sweetheart, does he have a death wish? We hadn't discussed it, but I assumed we were on the same page about not sharing the name of my husband or soon-to-be husband. You will put my daughter on the phone, now. My father made every word seem like a threat. I held out my hand. Let me speak to him. One moment. Frowning, Marco handed the phone to me. Pronto, papa? My voice quivered. Nicolina. He drew my name out on a sigh. Nicolina. His tone surprised me. I'd expected him to shout threats, but he sounded so unlike himself, almost defeated. Hi, Papa. I pressed my hand to my chest. I can't talk long. I am catching a flight. Nico, you will come home and bring your husband, yes? Come back to Sicily with my husband? I turned to Marco and bugged my eyes. 
He made a circle with his thumb and index finger and moved his other index finger in and out of it while mouthing, Honeymoon. My God, he's enjoying this. I can't. We are leaving for our honeymoon. Grinning like a kid on Christmas morning, Marco did the hula, complete with arm movements and some heavy-duty hip action. The contrast between speaking to my father and my fiancé's shenanigans made my brain malfunction. In Alaska, we are going to Alaska. You do not know what you have done. Dad sighed and mumbled something incoherent about secrets and lies and repercussions. There will be blood on your hands. Marchioni blood. I took a step back and gripped the dresser to stay upright. Something was wrong. More wrong than me running away from home to avoid an arranged marriage. You're scaring me. What secrets? Marco moved my side and draped his arm around my shoulders. You should be scared. We should all be. Why didn't you tell me it was Marco you wanted? We could have avoided so much drama. Come home, Nico. Bring him. The three of us must talk. We can fix this, but we must talk. My breath caught in my throat. I wanted so badly to believe him, to believe he would leave me and Marco alone, but I knew better. What's done is done, Papa. I have to go. You will return to Trapani, he shouted. You will regret it if you don't. Ciao, Papa. I disconnected the call. Holding me close, Marco walked me to the bed and sat beside me. Don't let him get to you. He was trying to scare you into following orders. I hope so. But he was, he was so unlike himself. Resting my head on his chest, I said, he mentioned something about secrets and repercussions. Marco wiped away a tear with a pat of his thumb. He was manipulating you. I'd witnessed my father's manipulation techniques many times over the years, but he'd always come at the person from a position of strength. The entire conversation unnerved me, but then again, that was what he wanted, wasn't it? One thing I knew for certain, my father didn't stand for disobedience. Since I'd made it clear I had no intentions of returning to Sicily, he'd send someone to bring me back against my will. Marco, we should leave here as soon as possible. He nodded. I was thinking the same thing. Give me an hour to send the press release and Pop's dirty financials to the media. Then we can decide where to go. I forced a smile. I have to find a white dress and send Hildy out to buy a trousseau. A what? He arched a brow. Is that French for grass skirt? It's clothes for our honeymoon. Snuggling closer to him, I whispered, or in my case, just clothes. He captured my chin between his thumb and index finger, turned my face to his, and met my gaze. Temporary marriage or not, we will have a honeymoon. Will you dance the hula for me on this fake honeymoon? I'd come to hate the words temporary and fake. When we weren't trying to be anything other than ourselves, it would have been so easy to forget about our arrangement and pretend the marriage was real. However, every time I let my guard down, Marco reminded me where I stood with him. Maybe he's doing it to protect me. Maybe he's managing my expectations so I won't get hurt. If that were the case, he'd overlooked a fatal flaw in his plan. I was in love with him before he ever asked me to fake marry him. Every day and twice on Sundays. Go talk to Hildy before I kiss you again and we lose all track of time. He stood and walked to the desk in the corner of the bedroom. I would have loved nothing more than to spend an hour or so wrapped in his arms, but he was right. We had things to do and a ticking clock hanging over our heads. Should I have her pick up anything for you? I'm good. He spoke without turning his head or taking a break from typing. I need your signature on our contract. Contract. The room tilted. 
I'd call it a prenup, but that doesn't sound right either. He stood and handed me a document. It's the statement outlining the reasons we're getting married under duress. The trembling started in my fingers and wound its way through my entire body. Rather than allowing him to see me crumble, I snatched the paper from his hands and left the room. I walked through the seemingly empty house under a cloud of despair. But if I were honest, the document was only part of the problem. Since I'd arrived at the mansion, I couldn't shake a growing sense of unease. I'd spent the first 26 years of my life on a schedule. People told me where to be, when to be there, how to dress. Sometimes my father would go as far as telling me what to say to his business associates. Without the structure, I felt as if I was floating through the days rudderless. I'd run away to avoid the marriage, but also to get control of my life. So far, that hadn't happened, and I had no idea how to change it. I ducked into Papa Joe's office, scribbled my name on the so-called contract, and stuffed it into an envelope. Rather than taking it back to Marco and having to face him, I shoved it into my back pocket on the way to the kitchen. Hildy glanced up from the stove and smiled, but her expression dimmed when she saw me standing in the doorway. Can I get you anything? I glanced at the pile of zucchini, squash, and other vegetables on the counter. Marco said you could help me buy some clothes, but if you're busy, she set the large knife on the counter. Don't be silly. I'm just tinkering around in here to have something to do. Are you sure? Enzo's a Michelin star chef. He can find his way around the kitchen. Hildy dried her hands. I don't suppose it's a good idea for you to leave the house. So I'll need a list of what you need, the sizes, and any specific designers you prefer. Actually, I'd prefer simple clothes from a department store. Pants and shorts with pockets would be great, and some t-shirts. I laughed never thinking in a million years I'd send someone to the mall to purchase my clothes. Hildy gave me a knowing smile. I take it you'll be staying here for the foreseeable future. I hated to tell yet more lies, but I wasn't sure how much she would relay to Evelyn, Marco's mother. Instead, I went with a vague reply. We haven't decided, but summer clothes should work. Jot down your sizes and any color preferences. I'll take care of the rest. She handed me a pen and paper and motioned to the kitchen table. It's wonderful to see you and Marco have stayed friends all of these years. I recognized a fishing expedition when I saw one, but I had no idea how to respond. Marco and I had led our parents to believe we were already married. Had Evelyn told Hildy? What if I tell her the truth and they compare notes? He's an amazing man. I focused on making a list of items I needed from the store. She chuckled. He's a rascal, and we both know it. But he sure is sweet on you. We're just friends, sat on the tip of my tongue, but I swallowed it down. The feeling is mutual. Hildy rested her hand on top of mine, effectively stopping my list writing and forcing me to meet her gaze. Nicolina, it might seem like he's a duck in water, letting everything roll off his back, but that's not the case. A duck? What is she saying? I'm not sure I understand. She leaned closer and lowered her voice. Marco puts on a show to convince the world he's invincible, he uses humor to hide his feelings. And when humor doesn't work, he uses his sex appeal or bulldozes his way through his problems. Like what he did with Pete Cole. I couldn't help but smile. She wasn't trying to get information out of me. She was worried about one of her boys. It's none of my business. But do you love him? Hildy's world seemed to hang on my response. She was to Marco what Maria was to me, the women who'd raised us, even though we weren't theirs, but loved them just the same. Yes, so much, sometimes I feel like I'll drown in it. 
It felt good to say the words aloud. But I'm not sure he feels the same way about me. The elderly woman squeezed my hand. You have nothing to worry about. He feels the same way about you. He's just not ready to admit it. The envelope in my back pocket told me otherwise. I don't know about that. He reminds me we are friends every chance he gets. Is he reminding you or trying to convince himself? She laughed softly. I believe he's loved you since he was too young to know what love was. Every time he came home from Sicily, he'd talk about nothing but you for months on end. I wanted to believe her, but at the same time, his actions told a different story. That was a long time ago. She bit back a grin. Not that long, only a couple of days. An ember of hope warmed me from the inside out. He talked to you about me since he came home. I mean, of course, he had to tell you why I was here unannounced, but he did. She narrowed her eyes, but her smile never faded. Don't go and ask me what he said. I can't tell you the details. I threw my arms around her and hugged her tight like I had Maria and Alessio. Hildi, could you find a white dress for me? Something simple but romantic. Her cloudy eyes twinkled with mischief. Ah, so the rumors aren't quite true. I hesitated, hoping I hadn't made a mistake in trusting her. As if she read my mind, she smiled. My darling girl, take a breath. I may work for Evelyn, but that doesn't include spying for her. My priority is and always will be my boy's happiness. Mine too, well, one of them anyway. I sighed. We're not married yet, but we will be very soon. Hildy stood. Come with me. I have something you might like. Chapter 18, Marco. What should have taken an hour tops ended up eating most of the day. I'd followed my father's instructions to the letter, which included sending Maggie's press release and the financial records to back it up to over a hundred media outlets. Once that momentous task was finished, I'd arranged for Tara, Pete, and the kids to stay at my family's vacation home in Gulfport. By the time I'd organized transportation, security, housekeeping, food deliveries, and ordered enough toys to fill a box truck, I was exhausted. What's taking Nico so long? I glanced at the clock and frowned. Not only had I skipped lunch, I'd missed the local evening news. I hit the power button on the TV remote to search for national coverage. The screen came to life, and my knees gave out. Sinking onto the edge of the bed, I stared at the picture of my father I had sent out with the press releases. The news feed crawling across the bottom of the screen consisted of quotes from the statement, and the banner below my father's face read, Dying Man Exposes Decades of Corruption in New Orleans. Holy shit. Still holding the remote in my hand, I jogged down the hall and pounded on Enzo's door. Enzo? Shauna? You guys decent? No, they shouted. Having no desire to see my brother in all his naked glory a second time, I yelled, You might want to turn on the television. Movement inside the room told me they'd heard me. A moment or two later, Enzo opened the door wearing a pair of jeans and a scowl. What's going on? I folded my arms and rocked back on my heels. I sent the story about Pops and Mayor Carter to every media outlet on the list. Oh, shit. He sat on the bed beside Shauna and turned on the television. It's going exactly as planned. Better, actually, since the news broke, people are coming out of the woodwork to accuse Carter of everything from blackmail and extortion to murder. The screen flashed with a red and white breaking news logo. A petite blonde reporter pressed her finger to her ear and raised her microphone. I'm reporting from outside a private residence in Lakewood. We're waiting for Mayor Jefferson Carter to be taken into custody. The camera zoomed out to show New Orleans' finest dragging Carter out of his house and shoving him into the back of a police cruiser. Oh my God. Shauna glanced between Enzo and me with wide eyes. We did it. Enzo frowned. What are they saying about Pops? Not much. I leaned against the wall as Enzo flipped between channels. It seemed like the coverage focused on Carter. Only a few reporters mentioned our father, and of those who did, none as much as hinted at our rumored affiliation with the mob. Shauna whistled. 
Maggie must have done an incredible job spinning the story. I thought they'd eat Papa Joe alive, but the media is acting like he's a hero. Let's hope it stays that way. That's because he's either golfed, played poker, or vacation with most of the media conglomerate owners. Shauna frowned. Is there anything the Marchionis don't have their fingers in? There's a dirty joke in there somewhere. I pushed off the wall and plopped into a chair near the window. Thank you for your restraint, Enzo turned to Shauna. To answer your question, if it can benefit Pops, he's involved. I'll let you two lovebirds get back to whatever it is you were doing. I pushed to my feet. Enzo stood and grabbed my shoulder hard enough to prove a point, but I had no idea what. Not so fast. Did Tara and her kids get settled? I spun out of his grasp. Yeah, she called when they arrived. She seemed happy with the place. I thought they went to Jack's old fishing cabin. It's a dump and not great for young kids. Shauna had made arrangements with Jack, her best friend for Tara and the boys, to stay at his place in the bayou. I didn't know him well, but we'd cross paths at Chamber of Commerce functions in the quarter. He'd always seemed like a decent guy. I shook my head. Pops didn't want to take a chance on her getting lost between now and her flight to Palermo. He had her put up in our vacation villa in Gulfport. It's four bedrooms, ocean front, and behind a wall. Plus, I ordered around the clock security for her family. She'll be safe there. That sounds a heck of a lot better than Jack's place. Shauna shook her head. I shoved my hands in my pockets. About that, do you think he'd mind if someone else used the cabin? I don't think so, but I should ask. She tilted her head. Why? Nico and I need to get out of town for a while. Enzo rounded on me. What the hell is going on with you and Nico? After the day I'd had, I didn't have the energy to sugarcoat the situation. I don't know. He folded his arms. What do you mean you don't know? Are you married or not? We have a license. I hitched a shoulder and played dumb, rather than filling him in on the rest of our plans. He ran both hands over his head. Why? Why do you think? What the hell is up with the 20 questions? Was I standing there asking him about his intentions with Shauna? Oh, right. I did that already, and he said he'd have fun until he kicked her to the curb. Interestingly enough, she'd almost been the one to do the curb kicking while on the phone with Gabe. Don't marry her for us. Enzo and I will figure something out that doesn't involve you marrying her. Shauna crossed the room and stood in front of me. I'm not doing anything for anyone except myself and Nico. I don't know what she saw in my expression, but it made her smile. You want to marry her? He doesn't. Enzo glared as if daring me to contradict him. Nice try, bro, but it isn't going to work. I can speak for myself. I'm not doing anything against my will. Shauna must have done something behind my back because Enzo's eyes widened. Rubbing the back of his neck, he said, If this is what you want, I'm happy for you. But I don't have to tell you her father may not feel the same. And you think Ma is going to throw you to a party? I glanced at Shauna. No offense. None taken, she grinned. Enzo squared his shoulders. Our relationship won't be a problem with Ma or anyone else. If it is, I'm prepared to walk away from the business and the family. What the hell? When did that happen? How did that happen? Is that even a possibility? Shauna gasped. You can't mean that. What about your restaurant? Your family is... I'm a Michelin star chef. I can work anywhere. As for my family, my brothers love you. He shrugged. Pops didn't say anything negative about you on the phone this morning. I believe you impressed him. She gave us a dubious look. Um, he demanded you marry Nico. And that's not a problem anymore. I took a bow. Thanks. Shauna didn't seem convinced. Would your father have insulted me with everyone on the call? Laughing, I nodded. Hell yes, he would have. As for my mother, she has enough to worry about besides meddling into our personal lives. Gabe isn't happy with her working with Pietro Lazio to shove a marriage up mine and Nico's asses. Still reeling from Enzo's declaration, he'd leave not only the business, but the family. I cleared my throat. Speaking of Gabe... I don't think he's going to be thrilled with you walking away. He's the one who suggested it. Bullshit. I didn't believe him for a second. He was showing off in front of his woman. When did he do that? Before I left Sicily. Enzo glanced at Shauna. So we could be together. She dipped her chin, but not quick enough to hide her blush. I'm stunned. But I guess I shouldn't be. Gabe's a stand-up kind of guy, and the two of you are good together. I turned to Shauna. About that cabin, why isn't it suitable for kids? It's deep in the bayou in Terrebonne Parish. She frowned a motion with her hands like an Italian. 
She's been spending way too much time with Enzo. Not only does she have the hand gestures down pat, she's talking in circles. And? And it's only accessible by boat. The place sits up on stilts, which is probably a good thing, considering all of the gators and snakes down there. Snakes? Why does it always have to be freaking snakes? But they can't get inside, right? I haven't been there in years, but I don't remember anything other than spiders coming inside. The gators and snakes won't mess with you if you don't mess with them. Shauna flashed me an evil smile that had me taking a step back. She had no way of knowing I hated most reptiles and all spiders. Unless, of course, Enzo had told her. I see. I glared at my brother for good measure. Surely she's exaggerating because he blabbed some stupid stories from our childhood. I doubt anyone will find you. It sounds very secluded. Enzo grinned. That'll work. God help me, I hope they're just busting my balls. Shauna reached for her phone on the nightstand. I'll call Jack. I'm sure he won't have a problem with you and Nico staying there. Great. Let me know what he says. I walked out of the room and didn't stop until I reached the pool deck. I promised Nico a honeymoon. How's she going to react to a snake-infested cabin in the middle of a freaking swamp? I pulled myself from my pocket and called the family priest. He answered in the second ring. Hello, this is Father Brian. Hi, Father, this is Marco Marchione. That thing we discussed, are we still on? You're referring to your wedding? I pinched the bridge of my nose. Yes, we've had a bit of a situation. He sighed loud enough I could all but feel his breath on my cheek. I'll be at the chapel at ten this evening. I hesitated. Not because I was doubting my decision, but because of the way it would all go down. Marchione's married once. We did it big and splashy, surrounded by friends and family. I couldn't give Nico more than a quick ceremony and a ring. Thank God I have a proper ring. The whole temporary fake marriage thing was starting to bug me. Divorce wasn't an option in my family, and as far as I knew, no one had ever gotten an annulment or disillusion or whatever the fuck the church wanted to call it. But that wasn't the problem. The more time I spent with Nico, the more I dreaded letting her go. It's not like I'm in love with her or anything. I enjoy her company, uh, that's it. But that wasn't it. I was lying to myself, and I knew it. Marco? He asked. Are you there? Yeah, Father, I'm here. We'll see you then. Chapter 19, Marco A month ago, if anyone would have told me I'd be standing at an altar waiting for my bride to make her grand appearance, I would have suggested they check themselves into the psych ward. But here I am. The empty church seemed cardboard plain compared to other Marchione weddings. Then again, my mother had gone all out for Gabe's and Joe's big days. However, she wasn't here, nor were my brothers, aunts, uncles, cousins, or any other family members, except Hildy. My former nanny was the next best thing to having my mom present. She'd kiss more boo-boos, held more hands, and cheered on more sidelines than my mom ever had. Now that I thought about it, Hildy's attendance was better than having Ma involved in a hell of a lot less drama. I just wish she was standing beside me instead of helping Nico get dressed. The thought stole the air from my lungs. I might have been okay with my mother's absence, but I missed my brothers. All of them, even Enzo's smug ass. I'd always assumed Dante would be the one to throw my bachelor party, razz me mercilessly about my ball and chain, and get teary-eyed when the big moment came. Father Brian glanced at his watch. Perhaps I should go check on the bride? I'll go. I'd left Nico and Hildy in the small changing room a half hour prior. The women had insisted it was bad luck for me to see the bride in her dress before the ceremony. While I doubted Nico would make a break for the exit, I couldn't shake the feeling something was wrong. Is she having second thoughts? The priest's eyes lit. Ah, I believe we're ready to begin. I followed his gaze to the back of the sanctuary and smiled as Hildy hurried to take a seat in the first pew. Nico stepped into view, and the oxygen left the room. My God, she's beautiful. The white satin dress reminded me of something from the 1950s, only without the poodle and with some serious sex appeal. The fitted bodice had just enough of a V-shaped neckline to hint at her cleavage without revealing too much for church. Likewise, the flared skirt hit at the knee and showcased her gorgeous tanned calves without showing too much. I couldn't take my eyes off her. With her hair swept up in a French twist and only a hint of makeup, she looked like an angel. Too damn good for me, that's for sure. 
Nico met my gaze and dipped her chin. The flowers I'd picked from my mother's garden trembled along with her hands as she walked toward me. I swallowed hard and ran my finger between my neck and collar. The room suddenly felt too warm, too confining, too everything. Holy shit, we're really doing this. I want it. I want her for real, not platonic house, not on a deadline. I want kids and a mortgage and forever. Father Brian set his hand on my shoulder. Are you all right, my son? Great, never better. Give us a sec, will you, Padre? I turned and jogged down the aisle to meet Nico. She glanced from me to the priest and back. What's wrong? Nothing, absolutely nothing. I took her hands in mine. Can we talk for a minute? Yes, of course, but... Her dark eyes brimmed with tears. If you've changed your mind, I... Come with me. I pulled her to the back of the chapel, well out of earshot of the priest and Hildy. Searching her face, I whispered, You'll have another wedding one day. A big one with mountains of flowers and music and guests. Hundreds of people looking for free booze and food and a chance to see the most beautiful bride that ever walked down an aisle. Nico blinked so many times and so quickly, I thought I'd given her a seizure. I wrapped my hands around her upper arms. Are you okay? I think so. She glanced around as if she'd just realized where we were. But Marco, I don't need any of those things. You're enough. Me? She can't mean that the way I want her to mean it. Chuckling to hide my disappointment, I pulled her close. Are you sure you're okay? Did you hit your head when you were getting dressed? Nico sighed and eased away from me. If you're having second thoughts, we don't have to go through with it. My second thoughts have nothing to do with marrying you. That's not it, Nick. I want to do this. But I was standing up there thinking about how much I wanted Dante and the rest of my brothers by my side. I thought maybe you were feeling the same way about the wedding. Father Brian cleared his throat. Shall we begin? Like I said, you are enough. The rest is just for show. Nico's expression softened as she looped her arm in mine and turned toward the priest. Yes, father, we're ready. My brain stumbled over her words like a drunk walking on cobblestone. I couldn't decide what she'd meant. I was enough for her because this wasn't real, or the simple ceremony was enough because she'd walk out of the church as my wife. My distraction proved to be a blessing when Father Brian launched into the prayers and liturgy and homily. The usually boring part of the ceremony flew by. Everything was going well until Father Brian asked, Marco and Nicolina, have you come here to enter into marriage without coercion, freely and wholeheartedly? Nico tensed and glanced at me. I nodded. We both sighed and said, I have. The priest arched a brow. Marco, do you take Nicolina for your lawful wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, until death do you part? I do. I turned to her and tried to convey that I'd meant it. Not for six months or a year. I would love her until I took my last breath. Maybe longer. Father Brian asked her the same question. Nico held my gaze. I do. We continued to stare at each other, and it seemed to me we had an entire conversation in the time it took the priest to bless the rings and douse them with holy water. Nico gasped when I slipped the diamond ring under her finger. How? When? Grinning, I whispered. In the airport in Rome. Do you like it? I love it. It's just like my mother's. She glanced up and met my gaze. You remembered? I remember everything about you, Nick. I squeezed her hands. Does it fit? She nodded. Father Brian cleared his throat. Nico's cheeks burned bright as she fumbled with my plain gold band. It finally slid into place on her third try. Father Brian launched into the intercessions, followed by the Lord's Prayer and the blessings. But I barely heard a word he said over the blood rushing behind my eardrums. You may now go in peace. Father Brian made the sign of the cross. Wait a cotton pickin' second. I arched a brow. Did you forget the best part? Laughing, Nico elbowed me in the side. Flustered, my bribed priest quickly added, You may now kiss. Moving slowly to burn the moment into my memory, I cupped Nico's face. This close, I could see the hints of amber in her dark brown eyes and the faint scar on the bridge of her nose. 
The scents of vanilla and flowers, and something unique to her about drove me crazy. But I took my time. Nico inched closer, and the wisps of hair framing her face tickled the back of my hand. Unable to resist the quiver of her chin or the nervous lick of her lips, I pressed my mouth to hers. If I had any doubt about my feelings for her before, they vanished when she sighed that happy sigh of hers. I poured years of longing into the kiss. Every unheld hand, every uncaressed cheek, every unwhispered I love you. When we broke the kiss, she tilted her head as if confused. Hildy clapped and sniffled and clapped again. Congratulations, may I take your picture? Father Brian excused himself, likely to avoid any blowback from my folks. Not that his presence in the photos would matter. His name was on our marriage certificate. The entire affair would become part of city records in 30 days, give or take. I pulled Nico to my side and smiled for the cell phone. Hildy snapped several pics before hugging us both. I'm honored you invited me. You two make a lovely couple. Nico nuzzled closer. Thank you. I nodded toward the back of the chapel. You should probably get out of the dress before we go. My bride gave me a quick smile and hurried to the changing room. Hildy said, there's a change of clothes for you in the dressing room. Your bags are in the back of the SUV. I sent enough food to get you through the first few days. Bottled water, wine, and a little something special. Thank you. Once again, a feeling of disappointment settled over me. It seemed wrong to be going into hiding instead of to a reception to dance the night away with my bride. You know where you're going? Those roads down in Terrebonne can be tricky at high tide. I have a map and GPS to get us to the marina. I pulled the frail woman into an embrace. I don't know if we'll have cell reception at the cabin, but I'll call to let you know we made it to the boat. She cocked her head. That seemed awfully real up there. It was for me, but I can't speak for Nico. You can't speak for her, but you should speak to her. Hildy patted my cheek. And don't be sad about your brothers not being here. I have a feeling you two will do this again one day. I hope you're right. I cleared the emotions from my throat and wiped my eyes. You should get home, it's late. You know how Enzo worries. Mm-hmm. She nodded toward the changing room. You might want to go help your wife out with that zipper. It stuck on my wedding day, and that was 60 some odd years ago. My eyes widened. You loan Nico your wedding dress? Who else is gonna wear it? She squeezed my arm. Besides, the look on your face when you saw her in it made me glad I kept it all this time. I followed Hildy to the back of the church and gave her one last hug before I knocked on the door. Nick, need some help? Yes, please. The exasperation in her voice made me laugh. However, my laughter faded when I opened the door to find Nika with a dress unzipped to her waist. There was nothing sexier than a woman in the process of taking off her clothes. Or in Nico's case, attempting to. I shut the door behind me and closed the distance between us. Pressing my chest to her bare back, I slid my arms around her and placed a line of kisses from her earlobe to the cap of her shoulder. Marco, we are in a church. Thunder will strike us. Lightning, lightning will strike us, I chuckled. My point exactly. Her body language told me she wasn't worried about lightning or thunder, at least not the heavenly kind. She rolled her head to the side and reached behind herself to cut my ass. My dick hardened instantly. It's a good thing we're married. I brushed my lips over the shell of her ear. A knock at the door spoiled the moment. I gritted my teeth and closed my eyes. Yes, Mr. Marchioni, we've called ahead to the marina. We need to leave in the next five minutes or we're going to miss your guide, Stuart said. We'll be out in two. I wasn't overly thrilled about hiding out in the bayou to begin with, but getting there in the middle of the night put the fear of God in me much more than getting naked with Nico in a holy place. I damned sure didn't want to spend our wedding night lost in the swamp. Chapter 20 Nicolina Are you sure it's safe? I eyed what our guide called a John boat, to me, it looked like someone had cut a huge tin can in half and duct taped a motor to it. Marco ran his hands over his head. He hadn't stopped fidgeting since we'd arrived at the marina. Nope, but we're following Cyril to the cabin. If it sings, he'll save us. Swatting a mosquito the size of a small dog, I lowered my voice. Is it big enough? 
I've never been down here, but I've heard the alligators are huge. The color drained from Marco's face. It wouldn't be here if it wasn't gator proof. I disagreed. While ours was in fairly decent shape, many of the vessels in the marina consisted of miscellaneous pieces and parts of metal welded together like a patchwork quilt. Cyril, who looked like he'd been old when dirt was young, spat chewing tobacco juice on the dock. You'll be fine, Cher, and gators ain't gonna bother you. Just keep all your parts in the boat. Thanks. I glanced to my new husband for moral support, but he'd turned the same shade of green as the murky water. Are you okay? Marco set the last of our supplies in the boat. I'm fine, just anxious to get to the cabin. The guide glanced between us. Jack Landry said you two were in some sort of trouble. My stomach sank. Not only did Shauna's friend know about our situation, he'd told Cyril. The old man hadn't stopped chattering since we'd arrived. How long would our secret hiding place stay secret? We were married tonight. Marco held up his left hand to show his wedding band. Her father doesn't approve. He flashed us a toothless grin. Congrats. It's doubtful anyone will look for us down here, but if they do, I trust you to tell them you haven't seen us. Seen who? What's your name again? He winked. Marco nodded and handed Cyril a fat envelope. Jack said you offered to bring us supplies from time to time. This is enough to cover the cost and a little extra for your trouble. I sure do thank you, sir. He tucked the cash into his pocket. What say we get going? Marco climbed into the boat and offered me his hand. Step down easy and move to the front to counter the weight of our stuff. The boat rocked like a fun house floor, but I managed to reach the bench seat without falling overboard. Y'all follow a little way behind me. If we get separated, look for the blinking red light. Cyril fired up his boat and pulled away from the dock. I glanced over my shoulder as Marco pulled the cord on our motor. The sight of his muscles straining beneath his t-shirt made my mouth water. My mind drifted back to our kiss at the altar and the speech he'd given me before the ceremony. Everything about him was a contradiction. He'd said I'd have another wedding one day, but had put a ring on my finger that was almost identical to the one my father had given my mother. He'd had me sign proof the marriage was a sham, but stared at me through the entire ceremony like he meant his vows. And that kiss. Thinking about it made my hands tremble. Maybe Hildy was right. Maybe he does love me, but isn't ready to admit it. Keep an eye on Cyril's boat, Marco called over the roar of the motor. I stared at the blinking red light, but between the tornado of thoughts in my head and the eerie beauty of the swamp, I had a hard time focusing. I found myself mesmerized by the silhouettes of trees along the banks and at times overhead. A million stars twinkled in the sky, far more than I'd seen in Trapani. Even over the motor, the hum of insects filled the air. Which way did he turn? Marco let up on the throttle and glanced around the utter darkness. Scanning the area in front of us, I said, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? His voice came out sharp and higher pitched than normal. We've been married less than two hours and he's yelling at me? He has to be close, keep going. Something large splashed nearby. Marco shot to his feet, which made the boat rock from side to side. What the hell was that? Holding on for dear life, I shouted, sit down before you fall in. A whistle split the silence, followed by Cyril's unmistakable voice. Y'all run out of gas? Thank Christ. He took a seat. At this rate, he'd exhaust himself with fright before we ever reached the cabin. I had to do something to distract him, or what I'd hoped would be an eventful wedding night would end with a bottle of wine and sleep, or worse, an argument. Marco turned and yanked the cord to start the motor. It's now or never. I stamped down my inhibitions and pretended I was one of my Parisian friends. 
The way your biceps bulge when you do that is turning me on. He looked over his shoulder and grinned. Yeah? I turned sideways on the bench, arched my back as if posing for the camera, and ran my hand down the front of my body. It's hot. The first thing I want to do when we get to the cabin is get out of these clothes. Marco swallowed hard. Christ, Nick, do you know what you're doing to me? I pressed my index finger to my lower lip, dipped my chin, and gave him my best wide-eyed, innocent stare. Am I making it hard for you to focus? He swore under his breath, opened the throttle, and sped after Cyril. We reached the cabin five minutes later. Unfortunately, the flirty heat between us faded when we saw the place. I wasn't entirely sure what I'd expected when Marco told me we were going to stay at Shauna's friend's fishing cabin. Having never been to the bayou, I imagined a real-life version of the animated Disney movie with a Creole girl, a frog, and a firefly. I wasn't that far off. The bayou itself looked exactly as I thought it would, but the cabin was unlike anything I'd ever seen. The little house sat above the water, perched precariously on wooden legs. Instead of a garage, there was a small carport-like structure, complete with a cloth canopy, to park the boat. Swallowing hard, I said, this is nice. I promise you paradise, he deadpanned. Marco and I unloaded the supplies onto the floating dock. We glanced at each other and up at the house. Neither of us spoke. It was as if Cyril had dropped us off on some alien planet instead of a couple hours south of New Orleans. We should go inside. I reached for the bags, but Marco stopped me. Let's check it out first. There's no one around to mess with our things. We should at least take the food up. I motioned to the trees. There could be bears or raccoons. Marco arched an eyebrow, but scanned the dark landscape as if searching for monsters. Shit. Just the food. Smiling, I loaded my arms with cloth grocery bags and walked up the stairs. Once again, I tried to distract him. My weapon of choice this time? My sexy catwalk hips way. Marco sucked in a breath behind me. I felt quite proud of myself until I walked through a spider web, missed a step, and tottered backward. He caught me before I sent us both tumbling to the dock below, but judging by the splashes, a couple of the bags didn't fare as well. The eggs, crap, and the bread. What else did I drop? Still half in his arms, I peered over the railing. Please tell me the wine survived. Don't worry about it. I'll have Cyril replace whatever we lost. He tightened his jaw. Wiping my face with my upper arm, I said, let's get inside. I'm covered in spider webs. Marco made a sound in the back of his throat. Spiders? It's okay. I've cleared the way for you. I would have face palmed if my hands weren't full. I'd completely forgotten about his fear of insects, reptiles, and frogs. It was no wonder he'd never gotten over it. His brothers had tormented him mercilessly by putting creatures in his bed and clothing. I reached the top of the stairs, opened the unlocked door, and fumbled around for a light switch. How is it? Marco's voice came out strained. Better than the outside. Thankfully, the inside of the place was clean. No signs of eight-legged roommates or any other unwanted guests. A cozy living room with a well-worn couch and easy chair took up one side of the room and a small dining table the other. I walked into the kitchen and set the remaining groceries on the counter. The appliances were old but clean. I couldn't help but grin at the ugly brown with black trim cabinets. They looked like they belonged in the 1970s. Curious, I checked inside each cabinet and found neat stacks of dishes and cookware that I had absolutely no idea how to use. Smiling, I turned to Marco. This isn't so bad. He hitched a shoulder and dropped his groceries on the table. As long as the gators don't eat us and the critters stay outside, it'll do. Our eyes met and my pulse raced. This is it. We're here. Alone. No one to interrupt us. Marco closed the distance between us in one step. He reached up as if to cup my face like he'd done at the church, but instead 
pulled a pin from my hair and another and another until my hair came tumbling down. You were beautiful tonight. He tugged me close with one strong hand and slanted his mouth over mine. I melted against him. It felt like I'd waited my entire life for this moment. His kiss and the way he held my body so possessively made me feel wanted and loved and safe, like nothing could hurt me. Without breaking the kiss, Marco took a step forward, pressing me against the wall. I wrapped my arms around his neck and ground my hips against his hard length. His hands were everywhere, my face, my arms, my breasts. I thought I'd explode before we got around to taking off our clothes, and then he pulled away. Avoiding my gaze, he said, I have to get the rest of our things, and we should talk before we do that again. Talk? Is he kidding? I stood dumbstruck as he walked outside. The doubts I thought I'd put to rest prickled at the edge of my subconscious, but rather than feeling sorry for myself, I decided to put the groceries away. Marco returned and set our luggage by the couch. He opened his mouth as if to speak, but snapped it shut and walked to the kitchen. Did you find the wine? I put it in the cabinet. What's going on with him? Did you want to have that talk? Let's settle in first. I didn't want to settle in. I wanted to get whatever it was he needed to say out in the open. Swallowing my growing anxiety, I wandered through the cabin, opening doors and turning on exterior lights. Why is there a rope ladder in the bathroom? It's the law. The cabin has to have two ways to get out. The ladder is in case there's a fire or emergency and the stairs are impassable. He kicked his shoes off. Kill the outside lights. They'll attract bugs, and bugs attract spiders. Weird and weirder. Can't have spiders, now can we? I checked the final two doors and found closets stuffed with hunting and fishing equipment. Where's the bed? Nick, we really should have that talk before we worry about what comes next. A slow grin spread across his face that sent a rush of heat through my body. Evidently, whatever was on his mind wasn't all bad, but we had a problem, a big one. I'm serious, there's no bed. There has to be a bed. He checked every door, even though I'd done the same thing moments before. There's no bed. I rolled my eyes. You don't say. We turned and stared at the couch as if it were a snake, coiled and ready to strike. Marco frowned. Toto, I don't think we're at the Ritz anymore. Chapter 21, Marco. I'd heard the term lovesick many times, but I'd always assumed it was a teenage thing like bad attitudes and peer pressure. I'd certainly never associated it with actual physical symptoms, yet there I was, vaguely nauseous and breaking out in a cold sweat. Why? Because I needed to tell my wife I loved her. Nico tossed an armful of pillows onto the fold-out couch and tilted her head. Is it as uncomfortable as it looks? I sat on the thin, lumpy mattress and bounced a couple of times for good measure. Absolutely. I wonder if Cyril could fit a memory foam mattress in his boat. Laughing, she walked into the kitchen with a sway of her hips that had my dick sitting up and taking notice. Down, boy. I planned to have a serious conversation with her. To do so, I needed my blood to stay in my brain. Nico bent over to add more items to the growing list, and I about swallowed my tongue. She'd changed into those cute pajama shorts that made her long legs appear even longer and tanner and more toned. Nick, grab the wine. I kicked off my shoes and settled against the back of the couch, or tried to. The second my ass hit the upper edge of the mattress, the folding mechanism triggered, and the center of the bed came off the floor, which made the foot fold up. The higher the center bar rose, the lower I sank until my knees were beside my ears. Mother of God! She gasped, went quiet, and finally erupted in a series of giggles. It's not funny! Laughing, I attempted to force my legs down, but the more I wiggled, the more I sank. A little help here? Still cracking up, she tugged at the sofa, but it was no use. My body acted like a doorstop and prevented the natural movement of the springs. It isn't working. Put your back into it. 
That's something I never thought I'd say to a woman in bed. I'm done for. This is karma biting me in the ass for years of man whoring. Nico grunted and the springs gave enough for me to plant my feet and push down with my legs. As soon as my ass lifted from the ground, I scrambled to the center of the mattress. Still laughing, Nico collapsed beside me and wrapped her arms around her middle. You should do it again when I have my camera. Hell no. I threw my arm over my face. I was worried about the gators eating me when the real threat was the couch. Are you injured? She scooted closer and rested her head on my shoulder. Draping my arm around her, I kissed the top of her head. Only my pride. Mother of God. She mimicked my voice and erupted in another fit of giggles. Laugh it up, Chuckles. I rolled over and tucked her beneath me. Her eyes widened and her lips parted with a surprised gasp. The feel of her body under mine made me break out in another cold sweat. As much as I wanted to lean forward and kiss her until we were a naked tangle of arms and legs, I couldn't. I couldn't cross the line without laying my cards on the table. She raised her head as if to kiss me, but I pulled away. The confusion and hurt in her eyes ripped me in two. I eased off her and helped her to sit upright. Did I do something wrong? Her voice quivered. No, you've done everything right. I tucked her hair behind her ear. It's about the contract. Her face fell. I want to tear it up. I held my breath, waiting for her response. When she did nothing but stare, I added, I don't want a time limit. Nico furrowed her brow. I don't understand. Christ, why can't I just spit it out? I don't want a fake marriage. She pressed her hands together as if she were praying and brought them to her chin. But we're already married. Get a grip or you're going to screw this up. Yes, and I'd like to keep it that way. I swallowed to loosen the lump in my throat. Forever, if you'll have me. Nico's beautiful brown eyes widened. I dipped my chin. I love you. She covered her mouth and nodded several times. I love you too. Yeah? Yes. She launched herself at me. I caught her waist and held her close, but not close enough. Never close enough. Anything less than skin to skin seemed downright chaste. Just to be clear, no annulment or dissolution. We're doing the until death do us part routine, right? She groaned, took my face in her hands, and gave me a quick peck. Right. I pressed my lips to hers again, lightly at first, then more urgently. From there, our instincts took over. My body on top of hers, her tongue in my mouth, mine and hers, our hips moving in opposing unison against each other. We don't have to. We can take it slow. Slow, fast, hard, soft, whatever she needed, I'd gladly give her. I want to. As soon as she'd said the words, we started kissing again. I buried my hands in her hair, and she dug her fingers into my shoulders. Each sensation was new, but easy somehow. There was none of the usual first-time, new partner awkwardness. We knew each other, maybe not in a carnal sense, but just as intimately. Chapter 22. Nicolina. On my first morning as Marco's wife, I woke to the smell of coffee and an empty left side of the bed. Outside the cabin, it sounded like every bird in the entire state of Louisiana had come to the bayou for choir practice. I sat upright and pulled the blankets to my bare chest. Marco? When he didn't answer, I wrapped myself in the covers and wandered into the kitchen in search of caffeine. A note hung from the refrigerator. Nico, I took the boat into town for those essentials. Be back before dinner. Love, M. P.S. I made coffee. P.S.S. Don't you dare get dressed. Grinning, I rolled my eyes and filled the cup he'd left on the counter. I took a shower, got dressed, despite Marco's wishes, and folded up the sleeper sofa. I sat and watched the birds flit around for five minutes before boredom set in. While rummaging through the food Hildy had sent, I found a large freezer bag with four brick-shaped objects covered in aluminum foil and a note card. Lasagna. Heat covered for one hour in 400 degree oven, uncover and cook 10 additional minutes or until cheese is browned. I think I can handle that. The thought of making Marco dinner made me smile. Sure, I was cheating a bit by using Hildy's frozen leftovers, but at least we wouldn't starve. 
Rather than staring at the walls until Marco returned, I tucked my cell phone in my pocket, grabbed my sketch pad, and walked downstairs to the dock. I hadn't drawn in months, let alone worked on any new designs. I let my mind wander as I roughed out a sketch of the water lilies floating near the shore. The memories of the previous evening brought a smile to my face. Marco promising me another wedding one day, him kissing me in the church, him telling me he loved me, and the fun we had exploring each other's bodies until the early morning. I couldn't remember a time in my adult life I'd ever felt so content, so free. I spent the morning daydreaming and sketching ideas for a line of clothing. Unlike the couture dresses I normally designed, these pieces were practical. For starters, they weren't dresses. The pants and shorts had pockets and easy to wear lines. Around noon, I felt the need to stretch my legs and traded the pencil and paper for a walking stick. On the backside of the cabin, I discovered a path that led through a grassy area. I put my earbuds on and ran through my playlist until I found Ed Sheeran. His sweet, gooey music fit my mood perfectly. Singing as I walked, I followed the hard-packed trail. Now and then, I stopped to take pictures of large white and gray birds, wildflowers, and a random turtle. The beauty of the swamp surprised me. It seemed something new and unexpected waited for me around every corner, including a patch of bright purple irises. I'd squatted down to snap a few photos to sketch later, when movement in the corner of my eye caught my attention. An alligator, as long as our John boat and as wide as a cow, sat not 10 meters from me. The enormous reptile dropped lower to the ground as if preparing to run a 50-yard dash, or in this case, a 10-meter race to lunch. I froze. While we didn't have gators in Trapani, I'd encountered snakes and other wildlife while hiking. I knew better than to make any sudden movements, despite every cell in my body telling me to get out of there. The gator hissed loud enough for me to hear it over the dulcet tones of my favorite singer. I did what any woman cornered in the middle of the swamp by a man-eating beast would do. I screamed. The gator swished its tail, and I knew I needed a better plan than to stand there wailing like a banshee. A quick glance around told me I was screwed. The nearby trees were tall and sturdy, but none had branches low enough to reach from the ground. Heart pounding, I took a step back. The gator remained in place, but its slit pupiled eyes remained fixed on me. Holding the walking stick in front of me, I slowly put one foot behind me, shifted my weight, and slid the other back in a slow but steady retreat. The reptile charged forward several meters. I screamed again and clenched the stick tighter. It stopped moving and stared, as if to see what I'd do. My breaths came in short bursts. If I didn't get control of myself, I'd hyperventilate and pass out, making myself an easy target, or easier target. I backed up again. The animal swished its powerful tail and rushed forward with its mouth open. Too scared to scream, I ran. A gunshot rang out behind me, followed by a man's shouts, two more shots, and a dog barking. I didn't slow or stop or risk a glance over my shoulder. I ran, as if my life depended on it, because it did. Cher, stop, it's Cyril, the old man called out. Slipping behind a tree, I shouted, Gator! It's dead, Cher. Everything's all right now. He approached me with his arms out as if afraid he'd spook me. The gesture would have worked better had he not held a rifle in his right hand. What you doing out here anyway? A large, reddish-brown, droopy-eyed hound dog sniffed my legs. I waved my hand at it, but it seemed unfazed. The dog plopped down beside me and rested his head in my lap. I went for a walk. I couldn't stop trembling in my legs enough to stand, let alone get back to the cabin. Marco had given Cyril money. From the looks of the envelope, a lot of money. But who was he? Could we trust him? Why are you so close to my cabin with a gun? 
Anyone with half a brain carries a gun in these here parts. You never know what you're gonna come across. He softened his tone. I'm not gonna hurt you, Cher. I live on the other side of the grass. I heard singing and came out to listen. Singing? Right, I was singing. You didn't mention you lived close. And you didn't mention you had a voice like an angel. He laughed. I'm setting the gun down. I peeked around the tree in time to see him place the gun on the ground and back away with his hands in the air. Feeling like an idiot, I pushed to my feet and stepped from behind the tree. Thank you. The hound stood and followed me. Cyril flashed me the same toothless grin as he had the night before. What for? Saving me from the gator, for starters. I brushed the leaves and grass from the back of my pants. I don't suppose you have an extra gun I could borrow. His caterpillar-like brows rose. You know how to shoot? My brothers taught me. He looked me over as if weighing the truth in my words and nodded toward the rifle. You care to prove it? Nodding, I walked to the gun, picked it up, and checked the cartridges. What do you want me to shoot? He ran his hand over his scraggly beard. I'll send Saint into the brush to rustle up some birds. Bring one down and I'll get you what you need. The dog lifted his head at the mention of his name. Cyril whistled and swung his arm in the direction of a thick crop of bushes. Saint, yeah. The dog moved faster than I would have thought possible for such a droopy creature. I lifted the rifle, aimed at the sky, and waited. A burst of caws and flapping wings filled the air, but I kept my eye trained on the area above the brush. I exhaled a breath and pulled the trigger. Once, twice, three times. My ears revolted and my hearing dimmed, but a couple of birds fell from the sky. Ooh-wee, Cher! Laughing, Cyril bent at the waist and put his hands on his thighs. You weren't blowing smoke. I don't know that I could drop two in one go. Lowering the rifle, I smiled. Thanks. I was worried I was out of practice. He pulled a bandana from his pocket and wiped the back of his neck. Name your poison, Cher. Do you have anything smaller with more rounds? I winked. Chapter 23, Marco. Why is it errands take six times longer when you have something to do after they're done? Any other day, I would have been in and out of the drugstore in five minutes tops. But you know what they say about plans. The best ones get later, something like that. It had taken two hours to reach the marina after I'd taken a wrong turn that put me on the scenic route to the freaking gulf. By the time I got my bearings, I'd invented new and creative uses of the English language. Needless to say, I added a compass to my list. The visit to the superstore felt more like a sociology project than a shopping trip. This far south, it was more of a community center to catch up with neighbors than a mere grocery and everything else under the sun store. I'd never seen such a diverse cross-section of the population, nor did I care to again. On the way back to the marina, Leo called. Hey, bro. I figured by now my family, if not the entire island of Sicily, knew about my marriage. Calling to congratulate me? Where are you right now? Ah, it's going to be one of those calls. I'm driving, what's up? Do me a favor and pull off the road. Using the SUV under the shoulder, I couldn't decide if he sounded more stressed, angry, or upset. My mind immediately went to our father's failing health. How's Pops? He's better today, sitting outside with Gabe and Maggie's bunch. I'd never get used to people referring to Joe and Rebecca's kids as Gabe and Maggie's. It seemed disrespectful somehow, even if they were raising him. Good to hear. I'm parked. Leo drew a deep breath. Is it true? You married Nico? It's true. I was able to find the marriage license online, but not the certificate signed by the priest. The lift in the last word made the statement sound like a question. He's holding the paperwork until the 30-day deadline to keep it quiet. Good, then there's time. Leo's voice deepened. Get the certificate back and burn it. What? No. What the hell is wrong with him? This isn't a game. We're in love. I'm sorry to hear that, but you two went about this the wrong way. Pietro Lazio is making noise that you disrespected him and his family by not asking his permission to marry his daughter. So I'll send him a card or something, but I'm not going to pretend we aren't married. 
I couldn't do that to either of us. I love her. Grow the fuck up, he shouted. You don't think I love Dahlia? You don't think it kills me to pretend I don't want her every second of every day? To watch her struggle to raise our- Oh, the truth finally comes out. Leo and Dahlia had danced the Just Friends dance for as long as I could remember, but they'd always insisted there was nothing more between them. Raise your what? Nothing. My throat went dry. Dahlia had a little boy, but I couldn't remember her ever mentioning the kid's father. Holy shit. Is Gunner yours? Leo growled. No, he's hers. You want to know why? Not really. I want you to answer the damn question. Why? Because being a Marchioni means we don't get to make decisions like the rest of the world. We have to think three steps ahead of our enemies. We can't afford to be sentimental or follow our goddamned hearts. He took a breath. When he spoke again, he lowered his voice. This marriage has put you, Nico, and everyone you love in danger. You need to end it before there's bloodshed. Gripping the phone hard enough to crack the case, I said, Lazio had no problem selling her into marriage with Enzo. Leo scoffed. Because he thought he'd get something out of it. And so did the rest of you. I ground my teeth. Is this really about me pissing off Lazio, or is it about me messing up Gabe's plans to get us out of the mob? He barked out a humorless laugh. Gabe was against Enzo marrying Nico from the beginning, remember? And he's not going to tell you like it is. Marrying Maggie has made him sentimental. True, but there had to be a way to make this work. I'll talk to my father-in-law, lick his boots, whatever I need to do to make this right. There is no making it right. If you love her half as much as you say you do, you'll destroy the marriage certificate and walk away. I disconnected the call and rested my forehead on the steering wheel. While his delivery sucked, Leo was right. Marrying Nico had been reckless, but I couldn't stand the thought of her being forced to marry someone else. Selfishly, I wanted her for myself. But more than that, I wanted her to have the freedom to build the life she wanted on her terms. The trip back to the marina went by in a blur. As I navigated the boat through the unmarked waterways, I couldn't get Leo's words out of my head. More so, I couldn't stop thinking about the sacrifices he'd made to protect Dahlia and his kid. Could I do that? Now that I realized how much I loved Nico, could I pretend we were just friends? Could I watch her raise our future children alone? And for what? To keep the peace between the families? This is different. Dahlia's the governor's daughter, for Christ's sake. Nico was a mob princess. She knows how things work better than I do. Lazio might be willing to sell her hand in exchange for power, but he'd never physically hurt her. Would he? Still lost in a personal thought bubble, I secured the John boat to the dock and grabbed the shopping bags. I couldn't decide what, if anything, I should tell Nico about Leo's call. My head told me to lay it all out for her. My heart said the news would hurt her, and my dick reminded me of the box of condoms I'd purchased. He didn't get a vote. I turned for the stairs and spotted a snake. A cold shot of adrenaline coursed through me. Not two feet from me sat a water moccasin sunning itself on the dock. Son of a bitch! Common sense told me to slowly move away, but I had a problem. Backing up meant stepping down into the boat, blind, because there was no way in hell I was going to take my eyes off the snake. You're back. Nico started down the stairs toward me. Staring down the three-foot-long death machine, I said, Stop. Don't come closer. Snake, stay still. She went back inside the cabin. It wasn't like she could do much to help, but damn it, I hadn't expected her to leave me to die alone. A gunshot tore through the bayou, and pain bloomed in my leg. For one terrifying second, I thought Lazio's men had found us, and I'd been hit. Then it dawned on me. Not only had we been found, but it bit me. Another shot tore through the air as I dove for the boat. Oh my God. Nico hurried down the stairs, stepped over the groceries and supplies, littering the dock, and climbed into the boat. Stay down. Someone's shooting at us. I pressed my hand to the source of the pain and swooned when my fingers came away slick with blood. She eased me back. Marco, it's okay, I fired the gun. You? My leg throbbed in time with my heart. Hospital, you have to drive. As if confused, she glanced from me to the dock and back. I need to see your leg. Spots danced before my eyes. It's the neurotoxins hitting my bloodstream. Babe, there's no time. 
I need you to start the engine and get me to the marina. Nico huffed and did something to my calf that sent a shock of pain from my toes to my groin. Ow, cut it out. My heart raced, not a good thing considering the faster it beat, the faster the venom would spread. Call 911. Tell them to send an air ambulance to the marina. Marco, look. She waved a bloody piece of wood in front of my face. What the hell is that? The world's largest splinter. A grin tugged at the corners of her mouth. I'm pretty sure it's a piece of the dock. It must have come off when I shot the snake. You shot the snake? Rubbing a tender spot on the back of my head, I said, maybe I have a concussion. Nothing's making sense. Where did you get a gun? Cyril lent me a forty-five caliber pistol after he saved me from an alligator, and I shot some birds. You shot birds too? Nico took my face in her hands and met my gaze. My love, you had a very large splinter near the other cut on your leg. No one's shooting at us, and the snake is dead. The pieces fell into place, but the picture they created put my man card in serious jeopardy. Right, gotcha. I'm starved, probably low blood sugar making me confused. She gave me side eye as she climbed from the boat. I made dinner. Yeah? I stood and forced myself not to limp as I joined her on the dock. Nico took one of the plastic bags, wrapped it around her hand like a makeshift glove, and reached for the snake. I grabbed her shoulder. Don't touch it. It could still bite you. Marco, it's in pieces. It can't hurt me. My stomach clenched every time I glanced at the damn thing. Haven't you ever seen someone kill a chicken? The body moves after you cut its head off. Nico rolled her eyes and proceeded to shove the snake parts into the water. Honestly, sometimes I can't tell when you're serious and when you're joking. Who's joking? More than a little embarrassed, I snatched a couple of bags from the dock. Let's start over. How was your day, dear? Eventful, she smirked. We should clean your boo-boo. It's a war wound, thank you very much. I followed her upstairs. Wait, what was that about a gator? I came very close to being eaten today. Nico seated me at the dining room table, took a first aid kit from the cabinet, and proceeded to nurse me back to health. I listened in horror as she described her near-death experience with a freaking alligator. Somehow, hearing her story made my reaction to the snake seem that much more ridiculous. Especially once Nico convinced me it hadn't been a water moccasin, but a harmless black snake. I should just hand her my balls for safekeeping. Miserable at the thought of her putting herself in danger, I propped my chin in my hand. I'm glad Cyril was there, but you shouldn't be wandering around out here by yourself. I was bored and needed to get some fresh air. Besides the gator, I had a great day. I sketched some of the scenery and started working on a few new designs. Practical clothes, fashion forward, but items women can wear in the real world. Nico set a glass of wine in front of me. I'd love to see them. Being home, having a normal conversation with my wife made the stress of the day fade into background noise. Whatever you're cooking smells great, her cheeks flushed. I'm not really cooking. I'm warming up Hildy's lasagna. I pulled her into my lap and kissed the shell of her ear. It's the thought that counts. Oh, she jumped up and hurried to the fridge. We have dessert. Wiggling my brows, I said, the only dessert I want is you. Nico brought a pink pastry box to the table and opened the lid. Inside was a small white cake with intricate swirls of frosting, marzipan flowers, and two gold rings. It's our wedding cake. That must have been what Hildy meant when she said she'd added something special. Not everyone is against our marriage. The thought had me blinking back tears. Thankfully, Nico didn't seem to notice. She took the cake back into the kitchen and pulled our dinner out of the oven. It needs to bake for ten more minutes uncovered. I moved to her side. Need some help? No, I can handle it. Using a fork and a pot holder, she removed the aluminum foil. A slew of murmured curse words fell from her lips. I glanced over her shoulder and winced. Is that... Melted plastic wrap. Chapter 24, Nicolina. Our first dinner as a married couple consisted of grilled cheese sandwiches, cake, and wine. But Marco didn't seem to mind. He'd polished off his food in less than five minutes and was working on his third glass of Merlot. However, he was clearly distracted, and I had the feeling it had nothing to do with our run-ins with Mother Nature. I held the last bite of wedding cake to his mouth. 
Do you want to talk about it? I had a chat with Leo today. He's not exactly supportive of our marriage. Staring into my eyes, Marco closed his lips around the fork. I'm still in a mild state of shock myself. I'm sure it's worse for our families. They'll come around, he finished his wine. But right now, there are a hundred things I'd rather be doing with you besides talking. I can think of a few myself. I stood to clear the dishes, but he took my hand and pulled me to the fold-out couch. Shouldn't we clean up? Later. He drew me into his arms and kissed a path from my lips to my neck. I missed you today. I missed you too. I draped my arms over his shoulders. Tell me about these hundred things you want to do to me. I'd rather show you. He eased me back onto the lumpy mattress and traced a line down the center of my body. Goosebumps rose on my arms, but heat pooled in my core. The clashing sensations left me breathless, a condition that became much worse when Marco tugged his shirt over his head. I reached for him, letting my fingertips play over the ridges and dips of his abs. He was beautiful. Michelangelo's David come to life. Are you sure you're up for it? You're injured? I couldn't help but tease him. The way he'd reacted to the snake made me giggle every time I thought about it. Frowning, he lifted his pant leg to inspect his wound. I think I'll live. Good, because I have a serious condition, and I believe you said you had the cure? I did. He stared a second or two, then laughed. Oh, right, your virginity. Mm-hmm. I crooked my finger at him. Less talk, more action. Marco slipped out of his jeans and stretched out beside me. Nervous? A little. I pulled my t-shirt off and wiggled out of my shorts before rolling to my side to face him. But I trust you. This time, when he kissed me, he wasted no time teasing. It felt different than the night before. More like a claiming than an exchange. I opened for him, taking everything he had to give and returning it in kind. Tangling my fingers in his dark curls, I pressed closer until there was no space between us. Marco slid his thigh between mine, sending a jolt of pleasure through my body. We stayed in that position, kissing, groping, grinding until I thought I'd go insane before he gave me what I wanted. Rather than waiting for him to make the next move, I eased back and pressed my palm against his hard length. Marco nipped my lower lip and pushed his hips forward. Is there something you want? You? He cupped my face and brushed his thumb over my lower lip. Marrying you was the best thing I've ever done. Me too, I whispered, tugging at his boxer briefs. Take these off. Yes, dear. Marco removed them and my panties before I could blink. Where did you put those condoms? We haven't been married long enough for you to start asking me where everything is. Uh-uh, none of that. I've waited my entire life to be inside you. I intend to make it last. He strode to the kitchen and returned with the entire box of condoms. I watched as he ripped open a packet and rolled the thin material over his length. The rubber didn't look comfortable at all. In fact, it reminded me of my non-nus compression socks. I'll go on the pill as soon as I can find a doctor. I'm all for that. He crawled back into bed and pulled me toward him. Lay like you were before. Really? I did as he asked, but wasn't entirely sure how the face-to-face -face position would work. Marco lifted my thigh and guided my knee over his hip. Once he had me in position, he slipped his hand between my legs. I thought, my words died on my tongue when he pushed his fingers inside me. Between the pressure from the base of his palm and the slight stretching in my core, he had me writhing in the space between two heartbeats. Marco continued until I went boneless in his arms before easing me to my back. Hovering over me, he said, tell me if you need me to stop. I nodded but sucked in a breath when I felt his length pressing against me. Relax. 
easy for you to say. Meet me in the middle, he whispered against my cheek. I rolled my hips up as he pushed forward, slowly joining our bodies. Marco cupped the back of my neck and rested his brow against mine. You feel incredible. Exhaling a breath, I forced myself to relax instead of resisting the slow, steady pressure. Once he'd seated himself fully inside me, he blew out a slow breath and eased back, only to repeat the process. Are you okay? Better than okay. I brushed my lips against his and raised my hips to meet him midway. The resulting pleasure had me gasping. Much better than okay. I lost myself in him. The weight of his body, the warmth of his skin, the spicy scent of his cologne overwhelmed my senses. This was nothing like the hookups my friends had talked about. What Marco and I shared went so much deeper. I'd never felt closer to another person. He quickened the pace and kissed me like a blind man using his lips to read the contours of my face. I can't hold back much longer. Don't. Marco pressed his cheek to mine and moved quicker, harder, deeper. He met my gaze, gave one final thrust, and moaned my name. There were moments in life when words only got in the way. There was absolutely nothing we could have said that would convey more than the way he smiled and brushed his thumb over my lower lip. Marco rolled to his back and pulled me against his side. We stayed curled up beneath the blankets, listening to the crickets singing and our hearts beating until the last of the sunlight faded. Want to watch a movie? I found some old DVDs in the cabinet. I lifted my head and placed a series of kisses along his collarbone. Or we could do that again. We'll do it again, and often, but you might be sore tonight. He rolled his head to the side and grinned. Don't suppose there's a copy of Thelma and Louise? That's rather specific. I don't think so, why? We checked one item off the list of things you've never done. I figured we'd check off another. He spoke in a sexy, gravelly voice that had me clenching my thighs. How do you remember every tiny detail of our conversations? It might have something to do with the fact I've been mesmerized by you since we were kids. Keep sugar talking me, and it won't matter how sore I am. He grinned. Sweet talking. Same thing. I reached for my shirt, but he snatched it away. You don't need that. Is that so? Warmth spread through my chest. I loved him. This, us. I wished we could stay in the cabin forever. But sooner or later, the outside would demand our attention. Throwing my shirt toward the kitchen, he said, New rule, no clothes allowed after dark. I like that rule. I stood and stretched my arms over my head. But I'm picking the movie. Marco pressed his palms together and closed his eyes. Holy Father, if you're listening, please let there be a yoga DVD. You're incorrigible. I tossed a pillow at him. Incorrigible, horny for my wife, in love, same difference. He propped himself up on one elbow. You sure you don't want to have more sex? I'll be okay as long as you're gentle. Marco's cell rang before he could answer. Second new rule, I turn my phone off when the sun sets. He fished around for his jeans. I like that one too. Marco brought the phone to his ear. Marchioni. I held my breath while waiting for his reaction. Alessio. No, you aren't interrupting anything. He laughed and spoke in Italian. We're on our honeymoon, what could you possibly be interrupting? Marco! I lunged for the phone, but he held me off. I'm kidding, but yes, Nico and I were married. He went quiet. Yes, sir, I understand. Rest assured, I love her too much to ever hurt her. Oh boy, I almost felt bad for him having to endure one of Alessio's lectures. Blushing from his cheeks to the tip of his ears, he handed me the phone. Pronto, Alessio? 
My heart lurched. With everything going on, I hadn't realized how much I'd missed them. Are you well? Any troubles? How is Maria? He chuckled. We are perfect. Are you happy, Nico? So happy. Marco and I both are. Then I am happy for you. He grumbled to someone in the room. Maria wants to speak to you. Please. I couldn't stop smiling. At the time, it hadn't bothered me that Hildy was the only one to attend our wedding, but speaking to them made me wish they'd been there. Maria's voice boomed over the line. You are married. Yes, nonina. In a church? You didn't do as the Americans do and go to a judge. Laughing, I said, a priest gave us the sacrament in a church. And we were not there, she groaned. Her tone made my chest hurt. Marco promised me we would have another wedding, a big one with flowers and food and music. You and Alessia will come to that one. Maria sighed. That will do. Are you happy? Have you, do you need the motherly talk? I resisted the urge to roll my eyes for fear she'd know I'd done it. Marco is a good teacher. We're figuring things out as we go. Is he good to you? I hesitated. Are we still speaking of sex? Does it matter? The answer is the same in and out of bed. He is very good to me. How do you like Canton? Eh, she sounded as if she'd shrugged. The markets are too big and no one speaks to their neighbors, but it is nice to see Rosa. Marco and I will come visit you as soon as it's safe. She lowered her voice. Does your father know of your marriage? Yes, and he, I debated how much to tell her. The last thing Maria and Alessio needed was to worry about me, but she might be able to shed some light on his strange behavior. He seemed more concerned than angry. Then he mentioned secrets. She sighed and muttered a prayer to the Virgin Mary under her breath. Maria knows. Please, if you know something, Nico, some things are better left buried in the past. My father said there would be repercussions and bloodshed, does this have anything to do with these secrets? I assumed he meant repercussions about the balance of power within the mafia, but now I wasn't so sure. These are not things to speak of over the phone. Please, you have to tell me what you know. Your father is a stubborn man. He made some horrible mistakes over the years, she sighed. What kind of mistakes? What does the past have to do with my marriage? Using her mom voice, she said, we will talk when you and Marco come to visit. For now, have peace. Your parents' secrets are theirs. They have nothing to do with you. Don't allow your father to ruin your happiness. For the first time in my life, I didn't believe her. We will come as soon as it's safe. Do you have pictures of the wedding? A couple, I'll text them to you. I swallowed past the lump in my throat. I have to go. Ciao, Maria. Ciao, Nico. Marco took the phone from my hand, set it on the nightstand, and drew me into his arms. What did she say? Nothing useful. Only that we would talk face to face. When do you want to go to Canton? He met my gaze. When we know my father has called off his dogs and accepts our marriage. Resting my head on his chest, I prayed that day would come soon. Nick, not for nothing, but my mother couldn't stand Joe and Gabe's wives while they were dating. His lips curled into his thinking about sex smile. What does that have to do with us? I can't believe I'm going to say this. His expression grew serious. The one thing that no parent can resist is a grandchild. It's a good thing he was holding me, Otherwise, I would have fainted. You want a baby? Now? He hitched a shoulder. Ma changed her tune about Rebecca and Maggie when she found out they were pregnant. Your father may do the same. You want to impregnate me to appease my father? 
I pulled away and pressed my hand to my stomach as if to keep him away from my womb. We'd gone into this thinking the marriage was temporary. We'd skipped premarital counseling with a priest, which was where couples discussed things like finances and living arrangements and children. Marco frowned. Forget it, it was a stupid idea. I nodded slowly, still trying to make sense of what was happening. We've only been married 24 hours. It's way too soon to start thinking about having kids. He ran his hand over his head. We should wait, at least a year. Spend some time traveling, buy a house. First he says now, then he says a year. I sank to the edge of the bed. I don't want to bring a child into this world to force our parents to accept our marriage. But I do want to have a family with you. Yeah? His eyes widened. Are you sure? Babies are always leaking from one end or the other, and they're noisy. I'm scared what happened to my mom will happen to me. And I know absolutely nothing about raising kids, but yes, I'm sure. He knelt in front of me. Medicine has come a long way in 26 years. But if you're worried, we can see a specialist to make sure everything, he motioned to my midsection, is working properly. Thanks, but I saw a specialist in Paris. He said all of my pieces and parts are healthy, but I worry. I mean, I've asked what happened to her medically, but no one seems to know. We could get a second opinion. Marco rested his hands on my thighs. As for you knowing nothing about raising kids, we have Hildy, Maria, and Maggie to answer our questions. I couldn't help but smile. I'm sure I want to have your children. So sure, I think we should start trying tonight. Tonight? He nuzzled into my chest. I like the sound of that. It might take a few months before we get it right. True. Practice does make perfect. I slid my arms around his neck. Marco flashed me his thinking about sex smile. Or in our case, practice makes babies. I just wish we would have had this conversation before I braved a cotton mouth to get condoms. I gave him a patient smile. Chapter 25, Marco. Most people say the keys to a healthy marriage are communication, maintaining a balance between personal and couple interests, and forgiveness. While I agreed 100%, I'd add sex, both the quality and quantity, somewhere near the top of the list. Marital bliss in the bayou consisted of all of the above and then some. I glanced up from the sales contract for yet another Marchione-owned business and grinned. Not because I found anything particularly amusing in selling off bits and pieces of my family's holding. Quite the contrary. I freaking hated it. What put the shit-eating grin on my face? My bride, sitting in the center of a tsunami of fabric while wearing absolutely freaking lutely nothing. Nico had used the messy bun on the top of her head as a pencil holder and currently held three straight pins between her lips. She had a smudge on her right cheek and a determined look on her face. Hands down, she was the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. And I was the lucky SOB who had married her. She took the pins from her mouth, attached two pieces of fabric together, and smiled. Why are you looking at me like that? Like what? I set my laptop on the end table, dropped to the floor, and crawled toward her. Like this. She flashed me a goofy grin as she cleared a path in the pieces of sheet she cut up for the pattern. You should be focusing on work. I'd rather focus on you. Still on all fours, I nuzzled into her neck, and my phone rang. She placed her hands on my shoulders and eased me back. Saved by the bell. Holy smokes, you got an idiom right. Laughing, I went for her chest. Very funny, wise man. Once again, she pushed me away. You should answer that. Wise man. Without taking my eyes off her, I reached behind me for the cell. Marchione. Marco, it's Terracol. Is this a bad time? My body screamed, yes, but I said, nope, what's up? Are you still in Palermo? Nico tilted her head and arched her brow. Tara sucked in a breath. Yes, I am. I just got back from the meeting with the, with the, you know. I couldn't decide if she was confused or reluctant or some combination of the two. That had to be nerve wracking, Tara. How did it go? My wife frowned at the mention of the other woman's name. 
Honestly, I have no idea. I told them what I knew and answered their questions, but they just sat there staring at me stone-faced. She sighed. Gabe said I did well, but you know Gabe. He's too nice to hurt anyone's feelings. Gabe, nice? Since when? I'm sure you did great. She sighed again, louder than before. That's not why I'm calling. There's something I need to tell you. Her tone made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. Okay. Remember when we were together? Her voice thinned. Uh-huh. My brain skidded to a halt. While it had never happened to me personally, I imagined every I'm pregnant or I have an STD conversation started with some variation of remember when we had sex. This is an awful thing to say over the phone. I had no idea how much of the conversation Nico could hear, but judging by her expression, she'd heard more than I would have liked. I stood and put some distance between myself and her scissors and straight pins. Tara groaned on the other end of the call. I'm not good at this. Just spit it out. Fine. Gabe told me you were married to Nicolina Lazio. That's right. I glanced at my frowning wife. You told me about Nico a few times, but you never used her last name. I didn't put two and two together until today. I'm not following you. In fact, I wasn't sure I wanted to know whatever it was she was trying to tell me. Nico and I are married, happily married. Her voice rose. That's great, but her name stood out to me because I overheard Sofia Abruzzo telling her people they get paid when Lazio's payments arrived. I sank into a chair and rested my elbows on the dining room table. I see. Did you mention this to Gabe? No, I wanted to talk to you first, you know, since you're involved with the Lazio. Is it the same person Sophia was talking about? Could she be playing you? Tara had always loved a conspiracy theory. Normally I'd humor her, but I was fresh out of patience. I appreciate your concern, but it's not the same person. Are you sure? I mean, we talked, what, a month ago? You didn't mention you were even dating anyone, and now you're married? Because it's none of your fucking business. I drew in a breath and forced myself to calm down. Let it go. Nico's eyes widened. I knew that she was upset, but any doubt vanished when she slid into a bathrobe and white-knuckled the cloth belt. Tara gasped. It is my business. I care about you. Care? You care so much about me that you spied on my family for years? My brother is dead because of you. You're lucky to be alive. I'm sorry. She squeaked out the words. I didn't know they were going to hurt Joe and Rebecca. Nico moved behind me and rested her hands on my shoulders. That's just it. You don't know what you don't know, and it's going to get you or other people killed. Stay out of my business. Tara started to say something, but I disconnected the call. Nico slid her arms around me and whispered into my ear. Breathe in and out, slowly. I hung my head. How much of that did you hear? Not much. She rested her cheek on my shoulder blade. Tara overheard Sophia telling her men they'd get paid once your father's money arrived. I turned to face her. She could have it wrong. Or she could be right. Nico caressed my cheek. Why would your father hire Sophia Abruzzo to do his dirty work? I didn't know either of them, but something about the situation didn't seem right. A better question is, why would Sophia Abruzzo work for my father? Nico plopped into the chair across from me. Remember when you asked me how I knew so much about the business? Yes. My stomach soured. I had a feeling I wasn't going to like where this conversation would lead. Like me, Sofia and her sister Francesca grew up in the mafia. So did my brothers and I, but that doesn't mean... No, you don't understand. Nico shook her head. You moved to the States when you were still young. Plus, it's different with boys. You grew up with the understanding that Joe would take your father's place. He was groomed to have a seat at the table, to join the Fratalanza. Girls are taught how to smile and look pretty. She had a point, but I didn't like it. Go on. Sophia has always been bossy. She used to boast that she'd take over for her father one day. Nico hitched a shoulder. Then, Tommaso named his son his heir, and Sophia went from bossy to power hungry and violent. I can understand why. Tommy Jr. is an idiot. She grinned. You're right, but a stupid boy beats out a brilliant girl every time in our world. Once again, I found myself wincing at mob politics. 
You think your father promised Sophia some sort of position in his organization? Yes, but I don't think he'll go through with it. At most, he'll force one of my brothers to marry the psycho. I couldn't help but laugh. You really don't like her, do you? From what Maria tells me, Sophia was close to my mother. She was 10 when I was born. Nico dipped her chin and lowered her voice. She blames me for her death. That's ridiculous. I can understand how a kid might feel that way, but Sophia Abruzzo was in her 30s. Maybe so, but last time we spoke, she threatened to kill me and piss on my grave. Ouch. Okay, no family reunions with the Abruzzos. Definitely not. She laughed softly. Call Gabe. He needs to know you found a possible connection between the Abruzzos and my father. I'll put him on speaker. I'd like your input on anything that has to do with the business. I scrolled through my contacts. You don't have to do that to make me feel better. I've accepted being born into a mafia family without a penis. I, for one, am very, very glad you were born with an innie instead of an Audi. But that's not why I'm doing this. I squeezed her hand. You're wicked smart and know the players and the politics better than I do. Nico sat a little straighter. I love you. I love you too. I dialed Gabe's number. Marco, I was just about to call you. Gabe's words came out in a huff. It's been a hell of a day. Tell me about it. I winked at my wife. Nico's here with me. We need to catch you up to speed on a few things before I ask how the meeting went. Good. That'll give me time to knock back this scotch. Gabe laughed, but it lacked his usual humor. Nico and I spent the first five minutes explaining the conversation with Tara, Sofia Abruzzo's psyche, and the grim realities of being born female in a mafia family. Gabe cleared his throat. First of all, you're right about Miss Abruzzo. She's definitely angling for power, but after today, she'll have a hard time getting it. What happened? Nico glanced from the phone to me and frowned. Long story short, she was ordered to return to Palermo. Enzo's waitress caused quite a stir after she spoke to the Capos. The news gave me hope at least one of the family standing against us would be muzzled. They believed Tara's testimony about the poison? Yes, but the weird thing was, Tommaso seemed shocked by the entire thing, he chuckled. Which makes sense if Pietro was the one calling the shots. Nico's voice wavered. Even if Tara testifies, Sophia and my father will deny it. We'll need tangible proof. I scratched my jaw. I'll have our guys in IT double down on hacking into Lazio's network. I know some of his passwords. I may be able to help. She glanced away. Thanks, Nico, Gabe sighed. This can't be easy for you. I'll be fine, but Tara and her kids are in even more danger. You'll continue their protection? Absolutely. Who knows what else she might remember? The tinkling of ice cubes against glass filled the line. If we're done here, I stood and stretched. Cool your jets, he chuckled. Is it me or are the companies we put on the market selling faster than normal? They are. I'd meant to send him an email expressing my concerns about that very subject, but my wife's boobs had distracted me. Even the property in freaking North Dakota went at full price. You're looking into it? Gabe asked. Two steps ahead of you, bro. I lied through my teeth. I'll have something to you as soon as possible. Thanks. Enjoy the honeymoon. His voice softened. And Nico, welcome to the family. Chapter 26 Nicolina I woke to the glorious aroma of bacon and coffee and Marco, specifically his lingering scent on the pillow. I chose my favorite of the three smells and nuzzled deeper under the covers. Good morning, sunshine. My husband kissed my forehead, the same as he'd done every day for the previous two months. Hungry? Peeking out from beneath the thin cotton blanket, I whispered, for you? We went three rounds last night and you had five orgasms. Now who is incorrigible? He chuckled. That was yesterday. I sat upright, let the covers fall to my lap, and frowned. Why are you wearing a suit? It had been ages since I'd seen him in anything except jeans or board shorts and a t-shirt. He looked good in the dark fitted trousers, blue dress shirt and tie. Then again, with a body like his, he looked good in anything and nothing at all. 
I have to go into New Orleans this morning. Gabe pulled the plug on four more companies, which means I have four mountains of paperwork to wade through. He nodded to the table. Breakfast is ready. Marco had made enough food to feed a small army, far too much for the two of us. Plates of bacon, sausage, scrambled eggs, hash browns, and toast crowded the small surface. The breakfast looked delicious, but my stomach wanted no part of it. Instead, I zeroed in on the vase of hand-picked irises. What's all this? Can't I spoil my wife? He winked. Nice dry wise guy. Yes, but there are three places set. Who's joining us? I invited Hildy to hang with you today. I thought you could use some company besides Cyril and that smelly dog. He glanced at the clock. You might want to hurry. She should be here any second. And you're just now waking me up? I was going to, but I couldn't do it. You were so cute and snuggled up. He curled his hands beneath his chin and batted his lashes to mimic me. I glanced around in a near panic. The place is a mess. Make the bed. I'm on it. Go get dressed. The bubbly purr of a boat motor sent me running for the bathroom. I plowed through my morning routine of teeth brushing and face washing in record time. Voices echoing from the front of the cabin made me smile. He was right. I had missed contact with the outside world. Not to mention, I had questions about everything from how to cut an onion without crying to how to get the mud stains out of Marco's jeans. I threw on a pair of mostly clean shorts and t-shirt and hurried back to the kitchen. There she is. Hildy hugged me tight enough to crush my ribs. It's so good to see you. You too. I glanced at the sofa and cringed. He'd put the bed away, but he hadn't bothered to tuck the sheet or blanket in. Bits of fabric stuck out of the edges. Sorry about the mess. Marco just told me we were having company. Smirking, he set two cups of coffee on the table. She didn't come to see the cabin. She came to see us. I bit back a groan, took my seat, and snagged a piece of toast from the stack. Are Enzo and Shauna still at the mansion? They moved out about a week after your wedding. They're staying at Enzo's. Hildy scooped a bit of everything Marco had cooked onto her plate. Marco's mouth fell open. Thankfully, it was empty. They're living in sin? I bet Ma is having a fit. She dipped her chin to hide her smile. Evelyn isn't happy with much these days, but she'll get over it. In time. Speaking of time, I have to run. Marco piled eggs and meat between two pieces of toast, wrapped it in a paper towel, and kissed me and Hildy on our cheeks. I'll be home before dinner. Text me if you want me to pick anything up while I'm out. Marco. I motioned to the chunks of egg falling out of his sandwich. This is a disaster going to happen. Waiting to happen. He grinned. Yes, yes. I hurried into the kitchen, wrapped his breakfast in foil, and filled a travel mug with coffee. He shoved the food into his briefcase, took the cup, and kissed me on the mouth hard enough to leave me swooning. You're a goddess, but I'm late. Go. I swatted his ass for good measure. Marco grinned. Thanks for keeping her out of trouble today, Hildy. She arched a brow. Looks to me like she's the one keeping you on the straight and narrow. Chuckling, he finally left the cabin. I settled into my chair, took a bite of my ice-cold eggs, and forced them down. You're good for him. I don't think I've ever seen him so happy. She met my gaze. Truly happy, not just pretending to be. Thank you. It meant a lot coming from someone who'd known him his entire life, there isn't much to do out here, but I would love it if you'd teach me some cooking basics. Marco hasn't let me near the kitchen since the lasagna incident. She furrowed her brows. I didn't realize there was plastic wrap beneath the foil. Hildy grinned. That's to keep it from getting freezer burn. Freezer burn? Is that another odd American idiom? When air comes in contact with the food in the freezer, it can make it taste bad. She tilted her head. I don't suppose you had too much experience in the kitchen growing up. None, I sighed. I'm the youngest in my family, 
By the time I was born, my brothers had made such nuisances of themselves, the staff threatened to quit if my father didn't forbid children from entering the kitchen. Hildy threw her head back and laughed. I should have done the same with the Marchioni boys. Instead, I put them to work when they got underfoot. Needless to say, they learned right quick to stay out of my way. You did them a favor by teaching them how to take care of themselves. Before I came here, I'd never washed a dish. She stared for so long that my cheeks heated. Don't be embarrassed. You can't help the way you were raised. All you can do is learn now and make sure you do right by your own kids. Marco and I had spent the previous eight weeks christening every surface of the cabin. If the changes to my body were any indication, practice did make perfect. However, I hadn't shared my suspicions with him yet. How was it raising six boys? I stood and cleared away our dishes. Laughing, she joined me at the sink. A circus, but I wouldn't change a minute of it. Marco and I both want a big family. She gave me a knowing look. I'd say you're young and there's plenty of time for that, but I suspect I'd be too late. Rather than fib, I smiled and got to work. With Hildy washing and me rinsing, we had the kitchen gleaming in no time. What do you two do out here to pass the time? She seemed to realize what she'd asked and grinned. Besides what all newlyweds do. We have a routine. Work in the mornings. He has legal matters to attend to, and I'm designing a new clothing line. In the afternoons, we sit out on the dock and soak up the sun. Pretty much, that summed up our lives together. Every now and then, Marco would go to New Orleans for a meeting or to pick up hard-to-find supplies. Those days, I visited with Cyril. I'd show him my newest watercolor paintings, and he'd share the latest Bayou gossip. Otherwise, Marco and I lived in a bubble of ignorant bliss and sex. Lots of sex. Sometimes we go fishing, and I hike with the neighbor. I walked into the living room and motioned for her to take a seat on the lumpy sofa. She seemed surprised. You have neighbors? One. He lives about a half a mile away. Laughing, I said, Marco had a run-in with a snake shortly after we came here. He refuses to go hiking with me. Grinning, Hildy shook her head. I was shocked when he said he was coming out to the bayou. He's been afraid of snakes and spiders since he was a little boy. I know, I laughed. I remember one time we were playing in the olive grove and Marco's ringtone filled the air. Oh, geez. He forgot his phone. Honestly, I don't know how he survived before we were married. Hildy laughed. Shaking my head, I checked the number on the screen and noted the New Orleans area code. Hello? The line was quiet for so long, I thought the person on the other end had hung up. I glanced at the cell to make sure the call hadn't dropped. Hello? Nicolina, this is Evelyn Marchioni. Is my son available? Until recently, I'd considered Evelyn a surrogate aunt. When I was a child, she'd graciously welcomed me into her home and treated me like one of her own, distant but present. The tone of her voice told me her feelings had changed. Marco isn't here. He's at the office today. You can try him there, Evelyn. I glanced at Hildy to make sure she'd heard me say the woman's name. Somehow, I didn't think Evelyn Marchioni would be thrilled to learn her employee was visiting her outlaw son and daughter-in-law. We've become Bonnie and Clyde, hiding from our parents like a couple of criminals. Hopefully, we won't go down in a storm of bullets. Please tell Marco I'm coming to New Orleans at the end of the week for Enzo's birthday. His girlfriend is throwing a surprise party, of all things. I would very much like to see the two of you there. I'll tell him. It was strange speaking to her again. So much so, I let my curiosity get the better of me. How is Papa Joe? He's dying, Nicolina. The stress you and Marco have caused this family is speeding up the process considerably. 
I gripped the back of the couch. I'm sorry, that wasn't our intentions. Hildy rested her hand on top of mine. Have you spoken to your father? Evelyn sounded as if she was smirking on the other end of the call. Not since before we left for our honeymoon. What was I thinking? I should have hung up after she asked to speak to her son. I wanted to throw the cell to the gators, but I had a sinking feeling our time here would soon come to an end, with or without the phone. Honeymoon, right. She let out a polite chuckle. Are we really going to play this game, Nicolina? My mouth went dry. What does she know? It's not exactly luxurious here, but we're happy. You don't have to pretend with me, she chided. I'm not pretending. I love your son, and he loves me. I glanced at Hildy and sighed. She pressed her lips together and shook her head. Evelyn said, Regardless, this so-called marriage of yours has caused a considerable amount of trouble for your family and mine. Pacing the room, I tried to calm my spinning head enough to ask coherent questions. If the Abruzzos fall, which family will take their place? She laughed, the same humorless laugh as I'd heard from Enzo countless times. That's the billion dollar question. I honestly have no idea. I wanted to believe her, but I didn't trust her. Evelyn had spent too many years plotting and planning with my father. She had to have some idea. Her sharp voice pulled me out of my thoughts. What will it take to convince you and my son to come out of hiding? Her bluntness shouldn't have surprised me. Much like my father, the woman made a career out of speaking her mind, issuing orders, and expecting those around her to fall in line. I drew a breath and chose my words carefully. My father's word, he will honor my marriage and not stand in the way of Gabe's plans for the Marchionis to leave the Cosa Nostra. Evelyn sighed far too dramatically for my liking. Nico, you of all people should know it's not that simple. It's irresponsible to walk away from your duties without making sure the people who depend on you are taken care of. She's baiting me. But why? What can she possibly hope to gain? In this situation, I disagree. That's your right, but you should know. Your father and I have come to an agreement. Marco will take Gabe's place. It's time you both return to Sicily. Don't make this harder than it needs to be. My blood turned to ice. I'll speak to Marco about the party and, and, and the rest. Goodbye, Nico. I do hope you will make the right decision. She disconnected the call. Hildy stood and embraced me. My goodness, you're pale as a sheet. Sit down, I'll get you a glass of water. I needed to talk this through, but I wasn't sure how much, if anything, Hildy knew about the Marchionis. Do you know why my father and Evelyn wanted me to marry Enzo? She pressed her lips together. They wanted him to take over the business. My father had gone to great lengths to keep his employees from learning about his dealings. Sure, some of them knew bits and pieces, but none would outright admit it the way she had. Hildy must have picked up on my confusion because she said, don't look so surprised. Evelyn and I talk, or she talks and I listen but not much happens in that house without me knowing. The Marchionis do things very different than what I'm used to. I sighed and took her hand. Now that I am married to Marco, they want him to take Papa Joe's place in the Fratellanza. I wasn't happy when Gabe stepped in, but he's as slick as a greased pig. Enzo wanted it, but he wouldn't have lasted long. He has a tender heart. She tightened her grip on my fingers. But Marco, Marco will do well, too well. Hildy was obviously as worried as I was, but she made no sense. What do you mean, too well? 
His attention to detail is what makes him a good attorney and businessman, but my heart raced. He'd spent countless hours trying to figure out who was buying pieces of the Marchioni Corporation and had refused to give up. He's going to ask too many questions and not stop digging until he gets the answers. Hildy nodded. These aren't the kind of people who appreciate others knowing their secrets. Oh my God, she's right. I'll talk to him. Get him to promise me he won't accept the position. Even as I said the words, I knew what his answer would be. He'd do it. He'd step in. Not because he wanted the power, because he'd take the opportunity to set things right with my father and finish the job Gabe started. I could see the future laid out before me. A big house, a workaholic husband, and more funerals. Many more funerals. Chapter 27, Marco. Nick, for the hundredth time, I don't want to take over for Gabe. I grabbed her face and planted a kiss on her lips. She deadpanned. Your mother can be persuasive. My mother can bitch all she wants. Nothing is going to change my mind. We'd argued about her conversation with my mother for three days. I was sick of talking about it and frustrated that my wife wouldn't let it go. She walked into the kitchen, took the antacids from the cabinet and frowned. Can you pick up some more of these on your way home? Stomach bothering you again? I'd offered to take her to the doctor a week ago, but she'd refused. It's the greasy southern food we've been eating. I'm not used to it. She raised her chin as if daring me to argue. I held up my hands. No problem, I'll stop at the store tonight. I had a hunch her condition had more to do with our baby making practice, but she obviously knew more about female reproductive systems than I did. Nico nodded and glanced toward the window. Cyril's late. We're on bayou time. People down here don't believe in clocks. Are you sure you'll be all right? I hated to leave her behind, but taking her to the quarter was out of the question. I'd received a call from one of my father's men in Trapani earlier in the day. He had it on good authority, Giancarlo Lazio and his personal security team had boarded a private plane in the early morning hours. I made a call to my guy in IT, and an hour later, I had confirmation Nico's sibling was en route in New Orleans. Marco, for the hundredth time, I'll be fine. She mimicked my voice before draping her arms over my shoulders. There's no way my brothers can find us. We've lived here two months, and we still have a hard time finding our way back to the cabin. This party is going to suck without you. I placed one hand on the small of her back and held hers with the other. Singing her favorite Ed Sheeran song, I spun us through the tiny living room. When I get home, we're going to turn the lights down low and dance naked. Only if you sing to me. She melted against me. Anything for you. I brushed my lips across hers. I'm looking forward to it, but you're going to be late if you don't go soon. I frowned at the clock. That's the shitty part about surprise parties. You have to be on time or you look like an asshole. Nico laughed and followed me onto the porch. Be careful. You too. Stuart, the head of my personal security team, met me on the floating dock. He nodded to me and smiled up at my wife. I'll take good care of him. Don't worry. Thank you. Nico rewarded him with a smile. It shocked me when he spoke to her so casually. Security rarely addressed anyone except the person who'd requested their services. Then again, Stuart had been my bodyguard since Joe's murder. He knew I was far less formal than my father, or even Gabe. Cyril's boat rounded the bend, followed by a double-fingered, ear-piercing whistle. She waved to the crazy Cajun like a kid at a Mardi Gras parade. Love you, babe. Nico's expression softened. I love you too. I gave her one last smile and headed for a different marina. It was a pain in the ass to get to, and twice as far but with the Lazios looking for us, a little caution seemed warranted. Sir, we have word the plane touched down an hour ago. We have people on them. Thanks, I tied off the boat. We need to hustle, I'm running late. He nodded and led me to the SUV. Given the situation, it would be wise to put a team on Mrs. Marchioni. Climbing into the back seat, I said, the Lazio brothers aren't the brightest bulbs in the tree, but they aren't going to bother my mother. He grinned. I was referring to the other Mrs. Marchioni. You were the first person besides the priest to call her that. It's going to take some getting used to. 
I had to laugh at myself. Nico's safe tonight, but I'll think about it. Stuart didn't seem convinced. She'll be fine, he muttered. Yes, sir. There were several problems with having a team in the bayou. The biggest being there was nowhere for them to sleep, and I'd be damned if I had two or three guys camping out on our floor. I spent the hour and a half drive to the quarter catching up on emails, enjoying the quiet and missing the hell out of Nico. However, the silence ended when we turned the corner onto Dumaine. Cars lined the street and people filled the sidewalk in front of Enzo's building, which had more to do with tourist season and less to do with the surprise party. Stuart slowed, likely looking for a place to drop me. I spotted Dante heading inside and my mother stepping out of a town car. While I would have loved to catch up with my brother, I plan to avoid alone time with Evelyn at all costs. Circle the block. Better yet, circle the whole freaking quarter. She's seen you, he nodded toward my mother. Sure enough, Ma stood on the sidewalk with her arms folded, glaring at the SUV. Logically, I knew she had no way of knowing which of her sons was inside, but I swore the dirty look was for me. Shit. Stop here. I climbed out, but by the time I walked around the vehicle, my mother had gone inside. Let the games begin. Inside Enzo's condo, my mom stood ramrod straight with her arms folded and lips pursed. Draping an arm over her shoulder, I said, Lighten up, Ma. It's a party. She huffed and took a step away from me. There are no decorations, no food, nothing. Go look outside. I glanced at Shauna and bugged my eyes to make her laugh. She didn't as much as crack a grin. Instead, she chewed her lower lip and watched my mother. Evelyn walked to the courtyard doors, surveyed the area, and strode to Shauna. It's wonderful you're doing this for Enzo, but he doesn't care for people to make a fuss over him, nor does he like surprises. Thank you for your advice, but I disagree. She turned and smiled to an elderly woman who just entered. If you'll excuse me. Marriage had given me a new perspective on my family dynamics, especially my mother. I'd always seen her bossiness as a way to keep control of six rowdy boys, but we were grown men. Grown men with wives and girlfriends, and in Gabe's case, children. Lately, I saw her behavior as rude, but more than that, desperate. For what, I didn't know. I waited for Shauna to greet the newest guest and rested a hand on her shoulder. Sorry to interrupt, but I need to talk to you. Sure, what's up? I glanced around the room and lowered my voice. Nico's father sent her brothers to bring her back to Sicily. For her safety and mine, I won't be coming into the city again until things settle. She whispered, you should have a security team with you. Unless the Lazios follow me to the cabin, no one will find us down there. Shauna's gaze locked on my left hand. Congratulations, when did that happen? A couple of months ago. I'm surprised you didn't hear about it. And a little hurt. Then again, we hadn't exactly sent out announcements. Enzo and I have been keeping to ourselves. That I could understand. Less drama makes for a better relationship. Truer words. She gave me a quick hug. I'm happy for you, but you might want to take off your wedding ring before your mother has a coronary. Oh, shit. I forgot all about it. Thanks. I slid the band into my pocket. Ma already knows, but most of the people here don't. I'd rather not make a scene at Enzo's party. She smiled. Are you too happy? I shrugged and tried to play it cool. It's complicated. Shauna motioned to the new additions to the otherwise masculine decor, namely her things. Enzo and I are living proof that complicated can work. When are you leaving? I'll stay until the guest of honor arrives, but I need to get back as soon as possible. She hugged me. Be safe and call me if you need anything. I'll need a map, but I'd be happy to bring you supplies. Thanks. Don't tell Enzo until after the party. I don't want to argue with him on his birthday. I turned and headed for the courtyard. I heard the big news. How's it going? Maggie stopped me before I reached the door. I hadn't seen her in almost three months, and Lord Almighty, she'd changed. Her belly had swollen to the size of a beach ball. Good? Better than good. It's great. I patted her baby bump. You sure you only have one in there? Gabe joined us. Hey now, are you calling my wife fat? I held up my hands and backed away. I'm slow sometimes, but I don't have a death wish. A shadow crossed his expression. I heard about the Lazios. Do you have security? Excuse me. Maggie stepped away and joined Shauna by the door. Puzzled over her reaction, I watched her go. They'd been married three months, but she was already behaving like a good mafia wife, leaving at the first mention of business. It made my stomach turn. Two in from the marina, we're safe at the cabin. 
He frowned. Any idea what Ma is doing here? She didn't come with you on the jet? I couldn't imagine our mother flying commercial. No, and I'm not thrilled she left Pops alone. You don't think she came in with the Lazios, do you? He started to say something, but Dante slung his arm around my neck and dragged me away by the head. Cut it out. What are we, ten? Laughing, I slipped from his grasp and gave him a half-hugged back pat. Listen to you, already sounding like a boring old man. He elbowed my side. You look good, though. Marriage agrees with you. I hugged him again. Thanks, bro. I'm happy. Really happy. And I owe it to you for giving me so much shit I followed a woman halfway around the world. He winced and scratched his ear. Had I known the dumpster fire you were about to create, I would have kept my mouth shut. I glanced away. Of all my brothers, I was closest to Dante. That he could be so flippant about my marriage hurt more than I cared to admit. That didn't come out the way it sounded in my head. He sighed. You know I'm happy for you, but I hope it lasts. There's a lot of bullshit going down. Thanks, I think. Everyone, Enzo's almost here. Time to hide on the patio. Waving her arms over her head, Shauna said, stay out of sight until I bring him outside. Dante and I joined the rest of the guests in the courtyard. I couldn't help but feel nostalgic. The last time my family had thrown a surprise party had been for my brother Joe's 18th birthday. He'd figured out what was going on and ruined our fun by showing up an hour early. My mother had thrown a tantrum and sworn off surprise parties. I could have really used my oldest brother's advice right about then. He'd always been the most level-headed of us, even when he'd knocked up Rebecca before he was old enough to drink. He'd handled it like freaking Gandhi. Zach, Joe's oldest son, stood in the center talking to a girl I didn't recognize. Before I could puzzle out who she was, the teen kissed her. Holy shit. Zach has a girlfriend. I nudged Dante's side. Look at that. They grow up so fast. He pretended to wipe tears from his eyes. Asshole. Joe's younger two, Chloe and Ryan, darted past us with cupcakes in each hand. They went straight to my mother, who held Gabe's daughter in her arms. The thought of having a house full of rugrats with Nico made my throat tighten. She could be pregnant right now. Your biological clock ticking? Dante gave me side eye. Yeah, it is. I walked away. Leo stood with his friend, Dahlia. He gave me a curt nod and whispered something to her. How can he stand it? How can he pretend he isn't in love with her? How can he act perfectly normal, surrounded by kids, knowing he has one out there somewhere? I shook my head and looked away. Stupid SOB. It's all going to come back and bite him in the ass one day. Enzo walked outside with Shauna tucked close to his side. Everyone yelled, surprise! My brother startled too dramatically and laughed too loud. He knew. He knew about the party. I laughed. Some things never change in this family. Enzo kissed Shauna like it was his job. I'm talking backward dip, tongue the whole nine yards. Dante nudged me and motioned to her brother, the world's worst actor. I winked and folded my arms. Gabe and Leo nodded their agreement. Dante shouted, he's faking it. The guests groaned and the kids booed. Enzo took a bow. All right, all right. I knew about the party, but I have a surprise or two of my own. Poor Shauna looked like she wanted to run inside and curl into a ball. At least she did until Enzo dropped to one knee. Holy shit, another one bites the dust. Dante loosened his collar. I should propose to Nico. Do it right this time. Make a big to-do. Straining to hear what Enzo had to say, I whispered, Hush. Enzo said something about the cat, and I frowned, not getting any pointers from him. My mother moved to my side. I need to speak to you. Is she freaking serious now? Without taking my eyes off the couple, I whispered, later. Now. She tugged my arm, but she would have had better luck moving a boulder. I leaned close and whispered into her ear. Your son is proposing to his future bride. The least you can do is pretend to care. Shauna had her hands pressed to her mouth and tears running down her cheeks. My mother pinched the back of my arm, a move she'd perfected when we were kids to keep us in line. It hurt like hell, but I refused to react. Not that long ago, I thought it was funny that my brothers and I could make her so mad she'd resort to a bit of violence. Now, it just pissed me off. Shauna said, yes. I cheered and clapped my hands with the rest of our friends and family. Even Evelyn gave the couple a weak golf clap. Enzo stood and spun Shauna in a circle. You've made me the happiest man in the world. Gabe shouted, 
Enzo, you forgot something. The idiot forgot the ring. The fact I laughed was proof positive I needed my brothers. Sure, they pissed me off 75% of the time, but I could always count on one of them to do something ridiculous. Cursing under his breath, he set Shauna on her feet and pulled a robin's egg blue box from his pocket. The couple whispered back and forth before he slid the ring on her finger and kissed her again. Once again, everyone cheered. Please, everyone enjoy the food and drinks. I need a moment alone with my fiance. Enzo pulled Shauna into the house. My mother stepped in front of me and planted her hands on her hips. Will you speak to me now, or do I need to book an appointment with your secretary? I'm starving. Let me get some food in my stomach before you lecture me on what I should and shouldn't do with my life. I'd never spoken to her like that, and frankly, a part of me hated it. However, I come here to celebrate Enzo's birthday, not to deal with more bullshit. Evelyn, always one to have the last word, shouted over the noise of the crowd. It's rude to eat before the guest of honor. My brothers, niece, and nephews groaned as if choreographed. I turned back to her. I'm not taking the position, Ma. Let it go. She sighed and slumped her shoulders. I figured as much, but that's not what I wanted to speak to you about. No. I set my hand on the small of her back and guided her to a quiet corner. Then what? If this is about my marriage, you can save your breath. Marriage, Evelyn chuckled. You've had a crush on her since puberty, but Nico wanted no part of you. Ma, I glared, hoping she'd take the hint and shut her mouth. Don't ma me, can't you see? She only let you take her to bed because she's desperate. I turned on my heel and strode away, rather than risk cursing at my own mother. You deserve better, she grabbed my arm. Marco, please, we have more important things to discuss than your marriage. The sarcastic tone she used when she said the last word stopped me in my tracks. What the hell does she know? I'm listening. Evelyn met my gaze and blew up my world. Pietro is missing over a million dollars in cash. He's brought the thieves back to Sicily for justice. Blood whooshed by my ears. Thieves? Alessio and Maria Grasso. You remember Maria? She was Nico's nanny. This can't be happening. Nico is going to lose it but they haven't worked for him in decades. Ma, Enzo's taking forever, why can't we eat? Dante whined. She waved him away without taking her eyes off me. We both know they didn't take the money, but Pietro's men found it in the house where they were staying. Ryan, my four-year-old nephew, tugged her sleeve. Nana, I'm hungry. Go tell Uncle Enzo. She sighed and turned back to me. You know what happens to thieves in our world. I saw where this was going without her drawing me a freaking map. Yeah, I do. Next, you're going to tell me I have the power to stop their executions. There were rules in the mob. Don't hurt women and don't steal were at the top of the list. Along with, never spill our secrets and don't kidnap people. It was perfectly acceptable to kill them, but taking someone against their will and holding them for ransom was frowned upon. Go figure. Evelyn had the grace to look away. Gabe clamped a hand on my shoulder. Come with me to get Enzo before there's mutiny. I didn't trust myself not to say something to my mother that had earned me a trip to the confessional and a month's worth of penance. Sure. Once we were out of earshot, Gabe said, what the hell did she say to you? I gave him the gist of it. He tightened his jaw. Smile, pretend everything is copacetic for Shauna's sake. We'll handle this first thing in the morning. I'll handle it. I walked inside and flashed a happy freaking smile. Enough sucking face. We're starving and Ma won't let us eat without you. Enzo flipped us the finger. Go away, I'm busy. What was that you said to me before my wedding? Tapping his temple, Gabe turned to Enzo. I remember now. You called me a sap and asked if I was sure I was ready to be tied down the rest of my life. Funny how the tables have turned. You are a sap, Enzo grinned. Did you see tears on my face out there? Wait until she's walking toward you wearing a wedding dress. Gabe said as he and Leo pulled Enzo away from Shauna. Flashbacks of Nico in a white dress hit me like a sucker punched to the gut. I'd made vows to protect her, but I was helpless to honor them. The news is going to hurt her, but the remedy is going to destroy us. Chapter 28, Nicolina. Smoke poured out of every window of the fishing cabin, 
The stench of burning plastic, mingled with the night-blooming jasmine, made my stomach turn. I placed my hands on my thighs and leaned forward to stop the nausea. Cyril hadn't stopped laughing since we'd fled to the dock. Cher, you sure know how to do it upright. I glared, which would have been more effective had I not been bent in half. I told you I don't know how to cook. He held his hands up in mock surrender. Easy now. We'll try again, but next time we won't be leaving the spoon and dish rag so close to the fire. I righted myself and glanced toward the moss-draped trees on the far edge of the water. How soon can we go back inside? In the months Marco and I had spent at the cabin, I hadn't once looked over my shoulder for my brothers. Now that I knew they were in New Orleans, I couldn't stop. Stroking his beard, he glanced up at the windows. I reckon it's aired out by now. Saint, come. I patted my leg, but the old hound dog didn't as much as lift his head from the wood planks. Cyril whistled and pointed up the stairs. The dog let out a braying bark and bolted for the door. The Cajun caught me staring and laughed. Don't take it personally, he's stubborn as an ox and deaf as an error. Snakes are deaf? I followed Saint. Hell if I know and I don't intend to ask one. He nudged my side. Get it? Ask one? If they're deaf, they won't hear me anyway. Laughing, I shook my head. I can't decide if you're really funny or if it's because I don't understand what you're saying. English isn't my native language. He winked. Some say it in mine either. In the kitchen, I rinsed out the pan while Cyril picked bits of burned plastic spoon from the stove and cleared away the charred rag. Once we'd cleaned the mess, he pulled the bacon grease from the fridge. Remember how I taught you? Nodding, I set the pan on the burner. Would you mind if we don't tell Marco I melted a spoon and ruined three pans of roux? He arched a brow. I hate to tell you, but I think he's gonna figure it out. The smell's lingering more than a fart in church. Now that was funny. I melted the grease and added the flour in small increments. Cyril handed me a wood spoon. This one won't smell quite so bad if you torch it. I smacked his arm with it and stirred and stirred and stirred until the roux turned peanut butter brown. Perfect chair. Now add the holy trinity. I dumped the diced onions, celery, and bell peppers into the pan and continued to stir. Cyril leaned close and drew a deep breath. That smell always reminds me of my babette. Your wife? I glanced at him, but he pointed back to the pan. Never take your eyes off the roux. He folded his arms. Babette and I were married 40 years. Cancer took her last spring. I can't imagine losing someone after spending so long with them. Do you have children? Sarah and I had spent quite a bit of time together. He'd love to talk about other people's families, but never said anything about his own. I'd assumed he'd been single his entire life. We have four. They all moved to New Orleans, but they come back now and then to visit. He forced a smile. Time for the garlic and spices. Dumping the herbs in the pan, I said, it must have been hard raising four kids down here. We lived up in Baton Rouge until they were grown. This time when he smiled, it seemed genuine. I miss those days most of all, the chaos of it. I couldn't put it off any longer. I made my mind up to ask Marco to stop at a 24-hour pharmacy and buy an early pregnancy test on his way home from New Orleans. Cyril continued chatting, seemingly unaware of my inner turmoil. Being a parent was the hardest and most rewarding job I have ever had. But that's enough of that. We have a lesson to finish. I followed his every command until I had a pan full of what he called Creole gravy. Tomorrow, I'd add shrimp and rice. I couldn't wait to see Marco's face when I served his favorite dish. Marco walked through the door. What smells in here? Dang it, so much for asking him to stop by the store. That depends. Are you talking about the burned plastic or the shrimp creole? I turned to embrace him, but stopped short. His hard set jaw made my pulse quicken. We should shut the windows. I will when the smoke clears. What's wrong? 
Marco glanced at Cyril. Thank you for keeping your company, but would you mind giving us some privacy? My pleasure. He met my gaze. You know where I am if you need anything. I gave him a quick hug. Thank you for the cooking lesson. He whistled for the dog, nodded to Marco, and left. My mind raced with every possible scenario that would cause my normally laid-back husband to seem so concerned, but all roads led back to my family or his. Talk to me. He guided me to the couch. There's no easy way to say this. Okay. My stomach churned again. His frown deepened. Just know, Gabe and I are going to fix it. Fix what? I forced myself not to shout at him, to tell him to stop stalling and tell me what had happened. Your father knows someone emptied his safes. He stared, as if waiting for me to understand. It's been months. I'm sure he's known I took the money for a while. Marco shook his head. He's pinning the robbery on Alessio and Maria. What? This has to be a joke. A cruel, unfunny joke. I laughed. That's ridiculous. They had no way to get into the house, let alone know the codes to open the safes. He continued to stare. Say something, dammit. His men found the money at Maria's sister's house. Marco cleared his throat. He had them taken back to Trapani. My hands flew to my mouth. No, I'm going to fix this. He said it like he meant it, but what could he possibly do? I shook my head. I'd brought this trouble down on them. I'd make things right. This is my fault, all my fault. I shouldn't have involved them. Marco sighed. Nick, you couldn't have possibly seen this coming. I need to talk to Maria's sister. Shaking and unable to think straight, I searched the cabin for my phone. Here, use mine. He handed me his cell. The number is on the screen. I dialed. Hello? Maria's sister sounded as if she'd been sleeping or crying or both. Rosa, this is Nico. Tell me what happened. The woman burst into tears. Men came. They destroyed my house looking for the money you gave Maria. I could barely get the words out. Was anyone hurt? No, Alessio agreed to go with no trouble. She drew a shaky breath. Maria, she was so scared. Alessio too. I worry, they are old. Their hearts can't handle the fear. Me too, Rosa, me too. I'm going to tell my father I took the money. I'll make sure they are safe, I swear, on my mother's grave. She mumbled a prayer. Thank you. I disconnected and handed the phone back to Marco. You aren't going anywhere near your father. He stiffened his spine. I'll handle this. How? By beating him at his own game. He folded his arms. I'm sick of our parents manipulating us. I'm going to give them what they want and use it to stop this bullshit once and for all. The truth behind what he hadn't said stole my breath. No, you promised me. You can't take the position. You can't, not now. Nick, if I don't do something, Marco tried to hold me, but I pulled away. Don't you say it, don't you dare. I stood and paced the room. He was talking nonsense, and I needed to figure out how to help Maria and Alessio. I couldn't begin to imagine how terrified they must be. I'll agree to take Gabe's place on the condition your father release the Grassos. You don't want that life, and neither do I. I'd dreamed of the moment I'd tell him we were expecting a baby since I first realized I'd missed my period, but I'd never imagined it quite like this. I opened my mouth to speak, but he cut me off. Male voices and heavy footsteps on the dock filtered in through the open windows. Marco's eyes widened. He placed his finger to his lips and motioned for me to get down. Nicolina, I know you're up there. Come outside and talk to me, and no one will get hurt. I would have recognized Giancarlo's big mouth anywhere. My heart lodged in my throat as I dropped my hands and knees. 
My brother wouldn't kill me, that much I knew, but I wasn't so sure if he'd hesitate to put a bullet in Marco. Technically, murdering a member of another ruling family required approval from the others. However, my father was never one to let rules get in his way. Besides, killing wasn't the only thing they could do to him. There was a wide spectrum between being dead and wishing you were. Marco eased to the floor and reached under the end table for the gun Cyril had lent me. If they see he's armed, they'll shoot him and claim self-defense. Shaking my head, I mouthed, no. Marco checked the rounds. I'll distract them, run to Cyril's and hide. Are you crazy? There's one door, Giancarlo shouted. Nico, don't try my patience. I'd hate to mess up your husband's pretty face. Marco whispered, use the emergency ladder in the bathroom window. He could have the place around it. We didn't have time to argue. Sooner rather than later, my brother would come in and drag us out. It's too dark back there. For once, I was glad he'd refused to turn on the floodlights for fear of attracting bugs. I stared from Marco to the gun. Give that to me. You get help. No freaking way. He kissed me quickly and crawled toward the front windows. Go. Not without you. Marco glared, and I glared right back. He rolled his eyes. Fine. Let's do this. Giancarlo continued to shout from the front of the house. You have two minutes, Nico. Two minutes to come outside or we're coming in. We made our way to the bathroom. Marco peeked out the window and scowled. I can't see anything down there. That's probably a good sign. They'd have flashlights, right? Maybe. He slowly unrolled the rope ladder. You first. Ah, uh ah, -uh. no way. So you can turn around and create a distraction. Is this really the time to start bickering? He arched a brow. I folded my arms. It's a good thing I love you because you're starting to piss me off. He kissed my cheek before handing me the gun and climbing out the window. I stood and squinted into the darkness. If anyone or anything rushed him, I'd have no qualms about shooting first and identifying the body later. If I was pregnant, I had no intention of raising the child alone. I waited until the ladder stopped moving, ejected the magazine and stuffed it in one pocket before stringing my belt through the trigger guard. The last thing I wanted to do was accidentally shoot myself, my possible unborn child, or my husband. My hands were so sweaty, I slipped a couple of times on the way down the ladder. When I reached the ground, Marco pulled me toward the path leading to Cyril's. When we were a safe distance away from the cabin, I stopped and whispered, wait, let me reload the gun. Why is it unloaded? He crouched and tugged me down with him. I gave him a hard look. He sighed, just hurry. I'd managed to get the magazine back into the pistol when a flashlight beam blinded me. I found them. A man I didn't recognize called over his shoulder. He had his hand on his gun, but mine was in my palm. I had the advantage. More shouting came from inside the cabin. Giancarlo must have made good on his word and gone inside to get me. I raised the pistol. Put your hands up. The guy laughed. I fired a shot close enough to his head that the bullet would disturb his hair. His hands went up into the air. Christ, Nick, what are you doing? They already know where we are. Without taking my eyes off the armed man, I said, I'm going back with them, but I need you to run. If my father gets his hands on you, I don't know what he'll do. I'm supposed to run away while they take you hostage? Bullshit. No, you're going to take Gabe's place and demand my father return your wife. There are rules about how women are treated. Use them. Marco leaned closer. No, you were right. We don't want that kind of life. We don't always get what we want. I have you and that's enough. I stepped forward to put some distance between us and hopefully to stop an oncoming argument. The sickening crack of something heavy smashing into bone filled my ears, followed by a body hitting the ground. A split second later, 
a gun barrel pressed against my back. Drop it. The man stood close enough I could smell the garlic on his breath. With a pistol dangling from my fingers, I held my arms out to my sides, crouched, and set the gun on the path. I glanced behind me to Marco to make sure he was still breathing. He lay on his side, just outside the flashlight beam, but there was no mistaking the blood soaking the side of his head. Please be okay. Please, Mother Mary, look after him. I reached for him, but the man grabbed the back of my shirt and forced me to stand. Walk. He jammed the gun into my back again. Giancarlo, tell your men to stand down. I'm willing to talk. That's wise of you. My brother's smug tone grated my nerves. The guy shoved me. Move, keep your hands up and mouth shut. Though it killed me to leave Marco behind, I did as he said. Giancarlo stood on the dock under a pool of light. He held his hands up as if to show me he meant no harm. I'm here to take you back to Trapani. Will you come willingly or do things need to get uglier? Tears stung my eyes, but I blinked them away. I couldn't afford to appear weak. I will, once we've discussed terms. His jaw tensed. Where is Marco? Your soldier assaulted him and left him for dead. My stomach twisted. There were any number of creatures in the swamp who would love to find easy prey. Are you prepared to answer for murder if you leave him out there helpless? He glanced past me. He's a big boy. He'll be fine. You can't be that stupid, Giancarlo. I shook my head. Our father intends to see him become the new capo of the Marchioni family. If you leave him unconscious for the alligators, there will be hell to pay. Bullshit, Giancarlo spat on the ground. Gabe is running the family. Not for long. Call Papa and ask him. He pinched the bridge of his nose. Go get my sister's so-called husband and put him in the house. Two of his men turned and headed for the path. Giancarlo gave me a hard look. Get in the boat. I will, once you answer my questions. I swallowed hard. Are you the one who took Maria and Alessio Gracio from their home in Canton? His eyes widened a fraction before he smoothed his expression. Yes. It stunned me that he'd admit it outright. Why? You had to know they didn't steal the money. He hitched a shoulder. It was a means to an end. You are needed in Sicily. How did you treat them after you took them from the house? A wave of nausea hit me out of nowhere. I pressed my hand to my belly and drew deep breaths. What do you mean, how did I treat them? Did you lock them up in the cargo hold or shove them around like you did that flight attendant? I'd told him I was on the plane for two reasons. I wanted to know he hadn't hurt the Grassos, but more importantly, I needed him to know I had dirt on him. Our father didn't tolerate mistakes and Giancarlo had made a big one. This time, he didn't bother to cover his shock. Pushing past my sudden urge to vomit, I said, answer me. No, I would never hurt them, he sighed. Maria was like a mother to us. How can you think I'd hurt her or Alessio? The men taught me to drive for fuck's sake. Thank you for that, at least. I turned and stared as the man carried Marco upstairs. He hadn't come around, and in the light, the blood on the side of his head seemed much worse. I swayed and took a step back to remain upright. Giancarlo moved to my side and wrapped his arm around my waist. Relax, it's just a little blood, he'll live. I'm going to... Bending forward, I emptied the contents of my stomach onto the dock. Holding me upright, my brother pulled my hair back with his free hand. Jesus, Nico, you aren't pregnant, are you? His words hit me like a bucket of ice water. I couldn't deny it any longer. I think so, Giancarlo tensed. You're full of surprises tonight, baby sister. Chapter 29, Marco. 
I woke to the glorious sensation of a warm, wet tongue on my neck. Mmm, Nico must have really missed me last night. Last night? Memories of arguing with her, of climbing out the window, of running towards Cyril's flashed through my mind like mini hand grenades. I opened my eyes and caught a lump of reddish-brown fur in my peripheral vision. No, Saint. I bolted upright and immediately regretted it. My head felt as overinflated as a Macy's parade balloon, if said balloon was filled with hydrochloric acid. The hound dog sat beside me with his tongue lolling. Twin columns of drool hung from his jowls like shoestrings. I wiped the side of my face and cringed. The idiot dog had covered me in spit, pinkish, blood-tinged spit. Tentatively, I pressed my fingertips to the source of the ache. My hair was crunchy, and there was a lump the size of an egg just behind my temple. How did I get back here? Where's Nico? Panic set in. I stood too quickly and sank back to the mattress. Whoa there. Cyril appeared as if by magic. Take it easy. You've been out for hours. Hours? I glanced to the closed drapes. The thin lines of sunlight laser beamed my pupils. Where's Nico? Growling under his breath, he turned away. With the man who did that to your head. Right. Gian freaking Carlo. I'd failed Nico. We'd known they were coming. I should have had a security team on her around the clock, but I'd worried about privacy. I'd put getting my dick wet above my wife's safety. Cyril folded his arms and stared at me. Who were they? What kind of trouble are you two in? The ringleader is her brother. Ignoring the pain and carnival ride dizziness, I stood. The place looked like a herd of muddy elephants had passed through. That explains why they carried you inside instead of leaving you as easy pickings for the gators. I suspect that was Nico's doing. I patted my pockets. Any idea where my phone is? He reached into his pocket and handed me his cell. He was mine. Yours is at the bottom of the river, along with the house phone and your computer. Finding Nico was my top priority. I didn't give a shit about losing the gadgets, but he seemed to know a whole lot for someone who wasn't directly involved. You watched them take her and didn't try to stop them? Take. There was no taking. She went with them. He made a sour face. I couldn't understand why she was curled up on the big one. Struggling to understand what he was saying, I held up my hands. Whoa, start over. What do you mean, curled up? The guy had his arm around her, all cozy-like. Nothing he'd said made any sense. Nico wasn't close to her brothers, least of all Giancarlo. Was she injured? Not that I could tell but there was puke on the dock. Cyril shoved his hands in his pockets. Who puked? My imagination conjured up images of Giancarlo's men punching Nico in the stomach. Are you sure the guy wasn't holding her because she was hurt? Look, the whole thing was crazy. I heard a gunshot and came to check on y'all. Saint found you bleeding in the grass, then two of them carried you inside. I snuck around to the dock about the time Nico got into the boat and snuggled up with the big feller. Right. I stared at the phone, trying to remember any of my brother's phone numbers. You should have your head checked. Between my sluggish brain and my missing wife, my patience wore thin. Too thin to stand there and explain the situation. I'm not crazy. Nico may have saved my life by agreeing to go with them. Cyril chuckled. I meant that bump on your noggin. Don't have time for that. After three wrong numbers, I managed to get through to Dante. Marchioni, my brother mumbled into the phone. Dante, it's me. Giancarlo has Nico. Can you get in touch with Leo? Find out if their plane is still in New Orleans. If so, have him keep it there. Blow the fucking thing up if necessary. He cleared his throat. And if it's gone? I need to know when they left, where they're going, and the name of every son of a bitch on that plane. Also, call a family meeting. I can be in the quarter in two hours. That's easy. Ma's hosting a breakfast to celebrate Enzo's engagement. What the hell? She hates Shauna. Who knows why Ma does what she does? All I know is we were ordered to be at the mansion at 10. My invitation must have gotten lost in the mail. Or she knew I would show up without one. My breath caught. Had my mom set me up? I thought it was strange she'd left my dad in Sicily for a birthday party. It was part of her plan. It had to be. How else could Giancarlo have found us? Before that asshole clobbered me, Nico had told me how to get her back. She'd seen the pieces moving on the chessboard before I'd even noticed the game. I knew what I had to do for Nico and for the Grassos. I want Pops on the phone for the meeting. I'm taking over. 
Shit, Marco, do you hear yourself right now? Do it. I disconnected the call before he could argue. Cyril narrowed his eyes. Son, I don't know who you are or what you're into, but I have your back. Good, I need a ride to the marina. I walked into the bathroom and splashed water on my face. I needed a shower, but that could wait. Everything could wait until I knew Nico was safe. I glanced at the mirror and barely recognized my own reflection. Besides the dried blood and dog spit, I had a hell of a shiner, but that wasn't what made me hesitate. The hard set of my jaw and anger in my eyes reminded me of my father. Nico had accused me of having mafia in my blood. Maybe she was right. Maybe she'd hate this side of me. But I'd do whatever I had to do to get her back. Two hours later, I walked into my childhood home in the same filthy clothes I'd worn to Enzo's party. I followed the sounds of silverware and china and voices to the dining room. Dante was right. Our entire fam family, including the kids, was seated around the massive table. Hildy was the first to notice me. She gasped and pressed her hand to her chest. My goodness. Chloe, my nine-year-old niece, turned and stared. Uncle Marco, you're bleeding. All eyes turned to me. I'm okay, sweetheart. It looks much worse than it is. Shit, this isn't how I wanted this to go down. I met Gabe's eyes, nodded, and headed for my father's office. My brothers filed in behind me. While none of them seemed thrilled, Dante started some kind of staring contest. I looked away first, not because I had anything to be ashamed of, because I didn't have time for games. What the hell happened to you? Gabe folded his arms. Leo leaned close to get a better look at my skull. Jesus, Marco, you really should clean that up before it gets infected. Enzo rested his hip on the corner of the desk and remained quiet. I glanced at Dante. You didn't tell them? I told them about Nico. He smirked. You can tell them the rest. I turned to Leo. Did the Lazio's plane leave New Orleans? Yeah, a couple hours ago. Son of a bitch. Gabe's voice rose. Someone better start talking, starting with what the hell happened to your head. One of Giancarlo's guys clocked me. There's no way they followed me to the cabin. I would have heard their boat. They had to have help. I sank into my father's chair. All four of my brothers tensed, but I wasn't sure if their reactions had to do with what I said or where I'd sat. I'm placing my bets on Ma. The color drained from Gabe's face. What makes you say that? How can you think I had anything to do with what happened? Our mother stood in the doorway with a heartbreaking expression. I almost bought it, but not quite. How did you get to the States? I flew. She glanced at the others. Gabe said, we had the jet. There is more than one plane in the world. She sighed and waved her hand. I came on Delta. I didn't believe her. Perfect. Then you won't mind showing us your boarding pass or a ticket or your credit card statement. Dante held his hands up in a T-shave. We had people watching the Lazio's plane. They would have said something if Ma was there. Not necessarily. Some of them are in her back pocket. Gabe ran his hands over his head. I'd like to see proof. She narrowed her eyes. You would have me prove my words? I'm your mother. I absolutely would, because you haven't flown commercial since we were kids. Not to mention, the Lazio's plane landed in New Orleans about the same time you showed up. I sat back and let the fireworks begin. I'd like to see proof. Enzo said. After the bullshit you and Lazio pulled to force me to marry Nico, I wouldn't put it past you. Leo nodded. I'm sorry, Ma, but we know you've been undercutting Gabe's authority for months. I agree, Dante said. I want to see the ticket. I threw the boarding passes away, but I'd be happy to show you my credit card statement. When I prove my innocence, I expect apologies from all of you. I reached down and hit the power button on the computer. You can log into your account as soon as it boots up. Sniffling, my mother dipped her chin. Yes, fine, you win. I came with the Lazios. My brothers all spoke at once, but I remained quiet. She met my gaze. How can you think I had anything to do with you being hurt? I couldn't take any more bullshit from her, from Nico's family, or anyone else who felt the need to give me a hard time about my marriage. I refused to keep her secrets or sugarcoat the truth because you and Pietro Lazio want me to take over as cap over the family. Giancarlo kidnapping my wife has forced my hand. A ghost of a smile crossed her lips. She thinks she's won. We'll see how she feels in a couple of weeks. Gabe narrowed his eyes. 
You're still playing this game after Pops and I both told you to knock it the hell off. Her eyes widened. This is how you speak to your mother? Save it, he shook his head. I, for one, am sick of the bullshit. We don't want this life, and you've done everything in your power to lock us in. Evelyn winced. Not all of you, only one. The rest can walk away, don't you see? I did this for all of you. All of us, Gabe pointed at me. Marco was 26 years old. He's not a mobster, he's an attorney. You're feeding him to the wolves to save the rest of us? I slammed my hands on the desk and stood. Enough, I've made my decision. I will take the position as head of the family, Dante shouted. There are other ways to get your wife back. Leo and Gabe exchanged glances. Enzo sucked a breath between his teeth. Marco, he's right. There are easier ways to get her back. You two are married. There are rules about other men's wives. I wasn't going to sit there and debate my decision. Stepping up as capo gave me more power, and with it came leverage. That will take too long. I'm doing this. I refuse to step down. Are you going to kill me for it? Gabe folded his arms. You and Nico were married in a church by a priest, right? Yes. My head pounded hard enough to blur my vision. He held his arms out at his sides. Then Pietro Lazio has broken the code of honor. I will demand he return Nico at once. It's more complicated than that. I closed my eyes and drew a deep breath to get a grip of my physical pain. Lazio accused Alessio and Maria Grasso of stealing over a million dollars. Leo cursed under his breath. Let me guess, Nico took the money. Gabe frowned. I nodded and wished I hadn't. A slight movement made me see stars. To give Maria and Alessio a fresh start. So she confesses and returns it. Or better yet, Pietro can take it out of her trust fund. Gabe rested his hand on my shoulder. I understand what you're going through. When Maggie was missing, I thought I'd lose my mind. But you don't have to be capo to get her back. Let us help you. He's right. You have grounds to demand Pietro Lazio return your wife. Leo forced a smile. Thank God you two married in a church. None of that matters. Our mother sighed and pulled an envelope from her pocket. Marco must become the capo of this family and vow to remain in the Cosa Nostra before Pietro Lazio will return Nico. Of course, I figured she'd have an ace up her sleeve. Nothing she did at that point would have surprised me. Gabe ground his teeth. What are you up to now, Ma? Me? I may have told one little white lie, but I'm not the one who's been lying to you for months. She gave him an innocent smile, unfolded the contents of the envelope, and set the contract Nico and I had signed on the desk in front of me. I jerked away from it. How in the hell had she gotten her hands on the agreement? I struggled to remember the last time I'd seen it. Nico. I'd given it to Nico to sign. Evelyn made a show of staring at each of my brothers in turn. You want out of this life so bad? That's fine. Go. But you shouldn't underestimate Marco. He's more like your father than any of you. My world tilted. She'd not only set me up, she'd plotted to turn my brothers against me. Before my mother was through, I'd be locked into the position tighter than a camel's ass in a sandstorm. What the hell is this? Gabe grabbed the paper, skimmed it, and tossed it on the desk. The marriage is a sham? Leo threw up his hands. Is this true? You've been fucking lying to us? Dante hung his head. In the beginning, yes. I stared at my mother, wondering how to make the woman who'd given me life pay. But not anymore. We agreed to tear up the contract. I love her. Gabe ran his hands over his head. But you didn't? No, we didn't realize we wanted to stay married until we were at the cabin. I'll tear it up now. He pointed at the paper. That's a copy. Where's the original? I turned to my mother. She glanced at each of my brothers before settling on me. Pietro Lazio has it. Someone in this house betrayed you. Chapter 30, Nicolina. The white plastic stick sat on the bathroom counter, but I couldn't bring myself to look at it. I'd waffled between anger and wonder since Giancarlo had asked if I was pregnant. Anger because I couldn't help but wish I'd told Marco. He should be here, holding my hand, sweating out the test results with me. 
Thanks to my brother, my husband was bleeding and unconscious in the middle of the bayou. The wonder, I felt, kept me sane. I couldn't help but imagine what mine and Marco's child would be like. He or she would have dark hair and olive skin. That much was given. But would they inherit his startling green eyes? Would they be funny and carefree like their father? Or more reserved like me? Giancarlo knocked on the plastic lavatory door. Nico, are you okay? You've been in there for 10 minutes. We've been cleared for takeoff. I'm waiting for the results. I'd heard rumors about my brother since I was a little girl. People whispered his name the way they spoke of Luomo Nero, the Italian version of the boogeyman. As a child, I'd gone out of my way to avoid him when he'd come home from boarding school. As a grown woman, I'd done much of the same. Now that I'd spent a couple of hours with him, I wondered how much of the rumors were true. He'd held me while I cried and when I threw up. Not many men would do that, especially not ruthless killers. His voice softened. Open the door, I'll wait with you. I turned the lock. Come in. It's time, but I can't do it. Tell me what it says. Giancarlo ignored the pregnancy test and crouched in front of me. Are you afraid that pretty husband of yours won't be happy with the news? Marco, his name is Marco, and no, that's not it. He will be thrilled. I chewed my lower lip. And you? How do you feel about this? He reached for the stick without taking his eyes off me. I thought I wanted to have a baby, but now that it's a real possibility, I'm scared. I fought hard to keep my tears at bay. I don't know how to be a mother. I've never had one. He flinched, as if I had jabbed a needle into his chest. You had one, a wonderful one. We'd never spoken of our mother, or much else for that matter. But he was the oldest. He'd had more time with her than any of my siblings. What was she like? He drew a shaky breath. You. She was like you. Beautiful, stubborn, and strong. Nodding, I glanced away. Giancarlo checked the test and let out a little shout of joy or surprise or relief, I couldn't tell which. I shrank back from him and the stick. What does it say? It's positive. His expression grew serious. Nico, you don't have to do this alone. The family will support you. Alone? Is he insane? Thank you, but Marco is going to be as amazing a father as he is a husband. The warmth seeped from his eyes. He stood, tossed the pregnancy test into the sink, and folded his arms. We are leaving in five minutes. You should go to your seat. I stared after him, unable to make sense of his ever-changing personality. Pressing a hand to my stomach, I prayed for my unborn child, Marco, and for clarity in handling my brother. After splashing water on my face and pulling myself together, I took my seat in the main cabin. Giancarlo watched me clip the belt around my waist. I'd grown up surrounded by security guards. For the most part, I'd learned to ignore them and conduct myself as if they were nothing more than furniture. However, these men were loyal to my father, and given my current predicament, I didn't feel comfortable speaking in front of them. Forcing a smile, I said, I'm tired. Would it be all right with you if I slept in the master suite after we're in the air? Of course. He spoke without sparing a glance in my direction. Will you join me? I caught a couple of the security guards glaring and frowned. I'd like to speak to you alone. Giancarlo shut down their fun with a glare. Yes. We should talk. I let my head fall back and closed my eyes. Images of Marco, unconscious and bleeding, flashed through my mind, and the nausea returned. The stress can't be good for the baby. I have to be strong for both of us now. The aircraft leveled off, and the flight attendant entered the main cabin. As with most of the people who took care of us, she smiled and silently went about her duties. It struck me how much I'd enjoyed learning to do things for myself, and how I'd grown to hate sitting on my ass letting people serve me. I unbuckled, 
walked to the bar and reached for a glass. The woman's mouth fell open. Miss Lazio, allow me. It's okay, I can pour myself a ginger ale. Smiling, I said, it's Mrs. Marchioni now. Giancarlo gave me a curious look. Ready for that talk? Sure. I filled my glass with ice and grabbed a can of soda. Can I get you anything? He continued to stare. Marchioni, have you working for your room and board out there in the swamp? I drew a deep breath and swallowed my smart assed comment. I was being polite, forget I asked. A bottle of water, he frowned, please. I took a water from the refrigerator and walked to the back of the plane. Giancarlo followed me to the master suite and closed the door behind him. Look, I get it. You were in the middle of nowhere with the guy for months with nothing to do but each other, but you can drop the act. Not trusting my wobbly legs, I sat on the edge of the bed. What are you talking about? I know the marriage isn't real. He stared down his nose at me as if he were the judge and jury of my mistakes. It's as real as it gets, Giancarlo. We were married in a church by a priest, and I'm pregnant, so it was obviously consummated. I've seen a copy of the agreement you and Pretty Boy signed before you were married. A rush of adrenaline burst through me. My heart sped and hands trembled and, yes, my stomach twisted as if to wring out the last of my dinner. How is this possible? I remembered signing the contract, putting it in an envelope and sticking it in my pocket. Did it fall out when I was trying on Hildy's wedding dress? Did she betray me? Well, he tapped his foot like an impatient professor waiting for the correct answer, an answer I didn't have. You don't understand. You deny it? His nostrils flared like a freaking bull. No, I motioned to the chair. Please sit and let me explain. He folded his arms. I prefer to stand while being lied to. Well, that's great, just great. He's already convinced he knows the truth. I drew a deep breath and told him everything, and I mean everything, including Marco's early morning run to the store for condoms. Giancarlo sank into the chair, leaned forward, and rested his elbows on his thighs. Like I said before, you are full of surprises. Unsure if he believed me or if I'd overwhelmed him, I shoved my left hand in his face. Why would he go to the trouble of buying me this if he didn't love me? My brother studied the ring. I knew the second he made the connection by the way he sucked in a breath. I lowered my voice. It's almost identical to Mama's. He took my hand and turned it toward the light. How did he know? I showed him the real thing when we were kids. Giancarlo met my gaze. I'm so sorry, Nicolina. Papa showed me the paper and I thought, it's okay. One good thing has come from all of this. I smiled and squeezed his fingers. You're having a baby? Laughing, I said, yes, but I was referring to you and I talking for the first time. He winced and pulled his hand free. I should apologize to you for that too. We all should. I don't understand. We'd never been close, but I'd chalked it up to our age difference. I was a boy when you were born. I blamed you for Mama's death. He hung his head. My throat tightened. On some level, I'd known my brothers hated me because our mother had died giving birth to me. But to hear him admit it cut deep. Then, when you grew older, you looked so much like her, it was hard to be near you without thinking of her. I look like her? I'd only seen one photograph of my mom, and it had been taken at a distance. When I'd asked to see more, my father informed me he'd had them all destroyed because it hurt him too much to see them. If the rumors were true, her death had changed him. So much so, he'd threatened to kill anyone who tried to view her body. Is that why he kept me at arm's length? Do I remind him of her, too? Yes. Even your voice sounds like hers. My brother gave me a weary smile. 
Can you forgive me for the way I've treated you? I launched myself at him and hugged him tight. There's nothing to forgive. You were grieving. In some ways, we still are. He released me. I should let you rest. Giancarlo, please, now that you know the truth, turn the plane around. My place is with Marco. He sighed. I will, if that's what you want, but I wish you'd reconsider. Maria and Alessio need you in Sicily. You're the only one who can convince our father to let them go. Damn it, how could I have forgotten them, even for a minute? He arched a brow. You curse now? Don't look at me like that, I'm not a little girl anymore. I stood and paced the cabin. You're right, I should speak to Papa in person, but I need to check on Marco. May I use your phone? He hesitated. Please, I have to know he's all right. The stress of not knowing is making me sick, and that can't be good for your niece or nephew. I'd played dirty, but I didn't care. Until things are settled with Papa, you need to be careful. Ask about his health, let him know you're safe, but that's it. Don't say more than you need to. What else would I tell him? I puzzled over his reaction, and then it hit me. You don't want him to know you and I are on friendly terms? It's best if it seems as if nothing has changed between us. He slumped his shoulders. I can protect you as your enemy, but if people believe we have reconciled... You're worried someone will tell our father we've reconciled. What does that have to do with me calling Marco? My heart lurched. There's a spy in the Marchioni family? Someone close to Marco, is that how you found us? I'll call and check on your husband. Get some sleep, Nico. No, I need to tell him about the baby. I need to hear his voice. That's not a good idea. Giancarlo stood, walked to the door, and closed it behind him. I turned the knob, but he'd locked me in from the outside. This isn't a private cabin, it's a prison. Pounding on the door, I shouted, you have to tell Marco. So help me God, if anything happens to him, it's on your head, Giancarlo. My brother's laughter made my skin crawl. Is he pretending in front of his men? Or did he play me? I trusted him with the truth. Did I make a mistake? Chapter 31, Marco. The jet leveled off, and our pilot made the required safety announcements. Normally, I tuned Sanford out as he droned on, but after the night and morning from hell, everything grated on my nerves, including the sat phone, which started ringing the second the seatbelt signs turned off. The flight attendant answered the call with the same bullshit smile she'd used to greet us. Which Marchioni are you calling, sir? Gabe set his laptop aside as if he assumed the call was for him. May I ask who was calling? Yes, sir. One moment, please. The flight attendant's smile faltered as she turned to me. He refused to give me his name. Thank you. I spared a glance around the cabin. My brothers watched me, but my mother licked her lips and turned toward the window as if nervous. I walked to the master's suite and closed the door. Marco Marchioni. Ah, so it is safe to tell my sister you survived the bump on the head. Giancarlo's laughter made my head ache. You're a hard man to track down. Show no weakness. Be strong for Nico. That'd be because one of your men sent myself for a swim. Put Nico on the phone. The fact my voice came out as solid as it had surprised me. Between seeing double and the lump in my throat, I'd expected to sound like a 12-year-old. She's resting. He went quiet for a couple seconds. No need to worry. She's safe and sound. I want to hear it from her. Big threats from a man who could not protect his wife. Laughter erupted behind him. Threats? What the hell? Is he trying to impress his security team? You're seriously pretending to insult me so your men don't think you're a puss? He laughed again. Try all you want to flush out the rat. You'll never figure out which of your men betrayed you. My brain stuttered. You're speaking in code. Call me pretty boy if I'm right. 
You pretty boys are all the same, all looks and no brains. I bet you need a guard to hold your dick when you piss. One of my security team is a rat? That's right. It dawned on me this could all be a ploy to throw me off balance by causing me to doubt my men. How do I know I can trust you? You Marchionis make me sick. All that money and you force my sister to wear a secondhand dress on her wedding day? I pressed my hand to my mouth. My God, he's telling the truth. There's no way he could know that. I ran through my personal guards and my blood ran cold. There was only one who knew the location of the cabin. It's Stuart, isn't it? Yes, Giancarlo laughed again. Don't worry, my brothers and I will raise your son to be a real man. I grappled for the nightstand to stay upright. Nico's pregnant. He made a strange half choke, half gasp sound and disconnected the call. Son of a bitch. I hit redial, but the call went to voicemail. After four more tries, I gave up. Gabe knocked on the door and stuck his head inside without bothering to wait for me to answer. Was that about Nico? Yeah. I sat on the edge of the bed with my head in my hands, trying to figure out if Giancarlo was trash talking or if he was sending me a message about Nico. Is she okay? Close the door. I waited for him to come closer and lowered my voice. We have a problem. Stuart is working for the Lazios. He's the one who took Giancarlo to the cabin. Gabe let loose a string of curses. Did Nico tell you this? I relayed the bizarre conversation I'd had with my brother-in-law. I'm going to throw Stuart off the fucking plane. He balled his hands into fists and turned for the door. As much as I'd like to see if rats can fly, I have a better idea. I waited for him to take a seat. We can use him to feed Lazio bogus information. Right, and from the sound of it, Giancarlo may be an ally. He ran his hands over his head. Are you serious about taking my place in the Fratellanza? That depends. I cracked my first smile since Enzo's party. Do I have to fight you for it? Frowning, Gabe sat beside me. Not unless you tell me you intend to play along with Ma's plan to stay in so the rest of us can get out. Hell no. Nico and I both want out. Especially if we're going to bring a child into the world. The thought made me clammy. I talked a big game about knocking her up, but now that it might have happened, I was scared shitless. What's your plan? Gabe motioned in my general direction. Before you answer that, are you okay? You look a little green around the edges. Headache, it's nothing. I looked him in the eye. It's time the other families know Pietro Lazio has been playing both sides. Gabe gave me an odd look. Everyone knows Lazio set himself up as the deciding vote and thinks of himself as the unofficial capo de capi boss of the bosses, which is why everyone except Lazio and the Abruzzos are willing to let us walk. Us leaving breaks his stranglehold. Well, shit, there goes my plan. I didn't think the other families were aware. Tell me you weren't planning to expose Lazio. Okay, I won't. I tried to wiggle my brows, but it hurt too freaking much. How do I get us out without becoming Lazio and Ma's puppet? Gabe bristled at the mention of our mother. You won't have to worry about Ma. I'm going to take her cell, lock her ass in Pop's room, and cut the landlines to the house. If anyone as much as utters a word to her, I'll have them fired. Nodding, I said. We have to make sure Dante and Leo are on the same page. No weak links. Agreed. He rubbed his jaw. As for getting us out, we have to change the vote. To do that, one of two things have to happen. The other families have to vote to remove the Abruzzos from the table. That'll take concrete proof they were responsible for Joe's death. And the other option? We have to take Pietro Lazio down, or we get enough dirt on him to convince him to change his vote. Great. I thought I'd have the perfect blackmail material. I was not only wrong, but naive. I'll figure something out. Gabe clamped a hand on my shoulder. How do you feel about me stepping into a consigliere role? I can guide you while you're learning the ropes. I like the idea of Gabe being my advisor. It had cut my learning curve down considerably. I'd appreciate that. I'm getting the feeling it's best if I keep my head down and mouth shut for the time being. You? Good luck with that. He laughed. 
I'll send word to the other families about the change in leadership. They will want you in Palermo for the induction ceremony as soon as possible. Ah, yes, the freaking pomp and circumstance of the mob. While I hated everything the ceremony stood for, it was one of the only times wives and other family members were invited to an official meeting. Nico would undoubtedly be there. Not even Pietro Lazio would dare keep my wife from attending, and I'd be damned if I let her leave my side again. I couldn't help but wonder about Gabe's apparent change in attitude. He'd all but insulted me when I said I wanted his position. What made you change your mind about all of this? It'll be good for my marriage. With Maggie ready to pop any day, it'll give me more time with her and the new baby. The mention of popping and babies tied my guts in knots. How did you guys know Maggie was pregnant? The doctors ran a pregnancy test after those psychopaths poisoned and kidnapped her. He arched a brow. Why? During Giancarlo's ranting, he mentioned something about the Lazios raising my son. I gave him a half grin and waved it off. Probably nothing. Sore tits, bloating, tired all the time, lots of puking. He counted the symptoms on his fingers, furrowed his brow as if trying to remember the fifth one. And a one-way ticket to crazy town, crying one minute, laughing the next. Other than eating antacids like candy and gaining a little weight, Nico doesn't have any of that. Gabe rubbed his jaw. You know how these things happen, right? Or do I need to have the always wear a raincoat talk with you too? Two? I remembered the girl at the party. Zach's a little young for that, isn't he? I'd rather give it to him too early than too late, he frowned. You stink. Get a shower and some rest before we land. Pops wants to see us before we meet with Pietro Lazio. Something about a problem with the other families. You'll have to wait. We need to deal with Stuart first. Look at you, little brother. Already talking like a capo. Gabe winked and left me to my thoughts. I stretched out and closed my eyes, but it was worthless. No way in hell could I sleep. Besides the headache, I had too much on my mind. Namely, not screwing up an already impossibly complicated situation, finding a way to destroy Pietro Lazio, muzzling my mother, and asking my wife if she has a bun in the oven. Just another freaking day in paradise. Chapter 32 Nicolina I could count on one hand the number of times I'd sat in the saddle-colored leather chair facing my father's desk. The first time, my feet hadn't reached the floor. He'd called me into his office to tell me he'd decided not to send me to boarding school. To my young mind, that meant I'd been handed a reprieve. At the time, I hadn't realized that was the first day of my life sentence. As if to prove to my father and myself I was a grown woman, I planted my feet on the floor and straightened my spine. He pinned me with his dark brown eyes. I understand you have something you'd like to tell me. I took the money from the safes. Refusing to give him a hint of the turmoil inside me, I spoke in a calm, clear voice. You mean you stole the money? I folded my hands in my lap. Yes, I stole from you, but I'm prepared to pay whatever is missing plus interest from my trust fund. Nicolina, you know that is not how it works. He motioned for one of the kitchen staff to come in. The young woman set a tray of pastries and espresso on the table near the window. Will there be anything else, sir? My father crooked his finger at me to call me closer. Donna, would you be so kind as to tell my daughter what happens to thieves in this house? If the poor woman's eyes bugged any further, they would have fallen out of their sockets. Mr. Lazio, his frown deepened. Thieves are killed. She dipped her chin. I tried to keep my expression smooth, to not give him the satisfaction of seeing me react, but I was sure I failed. Thank you, Donna. My father turned his attention back to me. She hurried from the room. It amazed me how different life was here than at the Marchionis. I'd always sensed a low-level buzz of anxiety in these rooms, but I'd grown up with it. To me, it seemed normal to live under a cloud of fear. 
My time with Marco had showed me how different a house full of love could be. I will allow Maria and Alessio to go free, but they are not to leave Trapani. He spoke as if they were no more consequential as an afternoon rain. Why would you keep them here? They will be ostracized. The fact they'd be marked as thieves and traitors to the Lazios would make their already difficult lives impossible. They defied me when they helped you. He cut himself off. I believe the word you're looking for is escaped. I met his steely gaze. What will it take you to allow them to return to America? He smirked. Who says I want anything? I sat back and stared out the window. I knew this game. I'd seen him play it a million times. The more I spoke, the more he'd dig his heels in and wait me out. Once I'd grown desperate enough to make a deal, he'd take everything I offered and more. Your brother tells me he found you living in squalor in the middle of a swamp, and your fake husband was too weak to protect you. I bit the inside of my cheek to keep quiet. His voice rose. You don't deny it? What good will it do? I sighed. You've made up your mind. I'm content to listen to your opinions. He slammed his hands on the desk. You will remain on this compound until the day you die. I pressed my lips together to keep my chin from quivering. I'd spent the first half of my life following the rules, hoping he'd love me. When that had failed, I'd spend the second half breaking them in hopes he'd notice me. I was done trying to please him. I'm married to the capo of the Marchioni family. Marco will not let this stand, and you know it. My father jabbed his finger on the intercom button. Giancarlo, finish it with the grassos. No, please, God, no. My chest burned as if my heart had gone up in flames. Why hadn't I kept my mouth shut? My brother's voice came through the line. You can't ask me to do that. They are like family. I'm not asking, I'm telling. You do it, or I'll have them taken apart piece by piece while the other watches. Something inside me snapped. I believed, with every fiber of my being, he'd do as he said. I'd never forgive myself if I sat quiet while his men hurt Maria and Alessio. He'd win if I fought him, but I'd lose either way. I'll give him what he wants, anything he wants, including breaking myself wide open on his altar to save them. What do you want from me? Name it. I'll give it gladly, but let them go, papa. Let them go. Screaming like a lunatic, I fell to my knees. I'm begging you, please don't do this. Giancarlo said something, but I couldn't hear him over my pulse pounding in my ears. My father smiled a smile that sent shivers down my spine and came around the desk. Setting his hand on my shoulder, he leaned in to whisper, that's better. I could hear my brother breathing on the other end of the intercom. Thankfully, he'd stopped talking. My father walked back to his desk and pulled out the damned contract Marco and I had signed. He's going to force me to have the marriage dissolved. I pressed my hand to my stomach and prayed for the strength to let Marco go his gaze boring into me. He tore the paper in two, stacked it, tore it again, and again, until there was nothing left but confetti. Giancarlo didn't tell him. He doesn't know how I feel about Marco. I gave him my best, horrified expression. Your life or theirs, Nico. That is what I demand. You will remain here, in this house, married to a man you planned to leave. I hung my head, covered my face, and pretended to cry. For the first time in my life, I was glad my father had ignored me. He didn't know me well enough to know real tears from fake ones. As for where Marco and I would live, I'd worry about that another day. Giancarlo cleared his throat. The Grassos? Our father huffed. Return them to their home in Trapani. At least. They will be alive. Not free, but alive. 
My heart broke for Maria and Alessio, but I'd make it right as soon as I could. Yes, sir. The line clicked and went silent. For Christ's sake, get off the ground, Nicolina. He reached for me. I forced myself to remain limp and impassive. Cheer up. As you said, you are the wife of the Marchioni Capo. He smiled again, just as evil as the first. Think about it. A merger between the two strongest families. We will be unstoppable. I thought Gabe and the others wanted out of the Cosa Nostra. I played dumb in hopes he'd share more of his plans with me. He waved his hand. Once that old goat Joe and Gabriel are dead, that nonsense will end. You're going to hurt Gabe? My voice caught. I have no need to do anything to Gabriel Marchionni. He and his father have done it to themselves. They broke the omerta. Bile rose in my throat, and the all too familiar feeling of motion sickness while sitting still returned. I'd warned Marco about that damned statement about the mayor. They violated oath of secrecy. They released family secrets to the media in order to stop the Abruzzos from infiltrating New Orleans. He chuckled. It worked. Abruzzo heads will roll, but so will Gabe Marchionni's. But you control the votes. You can stop this. Think about it. Marco will be forever in your debt if you spare his brother. I hated myself for giving him any leverage against Marco. I only hoped my husband would understand I'd done it to prevent him from mourning another brother. The Abruzzo's place in the Fratellanza is tenuous. They no longer have a vote. Thanks to that stupid American waitress, the balance has shifted and my influence is limited. So that's it? Gabe dies? I needed to get out of there before I vomited on the antique Persian rugs. I'm very tired. May I go to my room? He curled his upper lip and looked me over as if seeing me for the first time since I'd walked into his office. Get some rest and find something to wear besides those rags. Your husband is being named capo of the Marchioni family tomorrow. His wife is expected to be by his side at the ceremony. I'll see Marco tomorrow? I caught myself smiling, but it faded as quickly as it came. I had a problem, and I hadn't seen this one coming. One look at the two of us together, and my father would know we were in love. He'd know I'd duped him. I had to get a message to Marco, or Maria and Alessia's lives would be in danger. Again. Chapter 33, Marco. Less than three months had passed since I'd sat on the pool deck offloading bits and pieces of the Marchioni Corporation, but it felt like years. Everything had changed, including me. Be it marrying Nico, taking over for Gabe, or the possibility of becoming a father, I didn't feel like the same guy. I'd grown up when I wasn't paying attention, and I wasn't sure how I felt about that. In fact, I wasn't sure how I felt about a lot of things, including my most trusted bodyguard selling me out to the Lazios. I pulled Gabe aside before we walked into the villa. Where is Stuart? He's locked up in the garage. His pinched expression told me he wasn't looking forward to the interrogation any more than I was. Let's get this over with. Gabe frowned. And after you have a little chat, what do you plan to do with him? Good question. I have no freaking idea. I'll figure it out once I know why he betrayed me. He grabbed my shoulder and shook me like he used to do when we were kids. It's good that you're honest with me, but not everyone deserves it. I'll remember that. Head high, I walked into the garage like a man who knew what the hell he was doing. At least, that's what I told myself. Stewart sat in a metal chair in the center of the concrete floor. He had his hands tied and head down, like every prisoner in every mob movie I'd ever seen. I stopped a few feet from him and folded my arms. The man I'd trusted to protect me for almost two years burst into tears. I like Nicolina. I never wanted to put her in harm's way. I tried to warn you. I told you to put security on her, but you didn't listen. He's blaming me? I thought the same thing, but I wasn't about to let this son of a bitch turn the tables. 
How long have you been working for the Lazios? Stuart Winston looked away. I'd spent enough time with him to know I'd gotten it wrong. If not the Lazios, then who? Gabe stepped forward. The Abruzzos? He shook his head. Look, I didn't know what to do. I need this job. She threatened to ruin me if I- She? My mother. He's working for my freaking mother. I turned my back to him and stared at Gabe. It took him a half heartbeat to catch on. You have got to be fucking kidding me. Our mother put you up to this? She's had me reporting back to her off and on since I was assigned to Marco. He stared at his bound hands. I nudged his chair with the toe of my boot. What exactly have you told her? Until the day you flew Nico out of Sicily, there wasn't much to tell other than one night stands and selling off parts of Marchioni Corp. And there it is. The reason my mother would pay someone to spy on me. She'd never wanted us to leave the mafia, and had lost her mind when she'd found out we were dumping illegal businesses. Did you by chance tell her which companies we were dumping? Yes. Stuart glanced between us. It didn't seem like a big deal. The sales were public knowledge. Gabe muttered enough curses to earn him a week's worth of Hail Marys and Our Fathers. I'll have Shauna dig into the buyers. Ten to one, she bought back everything we sold. I wanted to strangle Stuart with my bare hands, but like it or not, he was following freaking orders. My mother, on the other hand, would be dealt with. You said there wasn't much to report until I helped Nico. What about after? As little as I could, he shook his head. You have to believe me, I tried to help you. She was calling for information two or three times a day. I had to give her something. Had to, Gabe sniggered. Did it ever occur to you to come to me or Marco about this? She said she'd make sure I never worked again. I have kids and a wife. What was I supposed to do? I held a hand up to Gabe and turned to Stuart. Are you the one who sent the contract to Pietro Lazio? His eyes widened. No, your mother found it and accused me of withholding information. She had my pay cut in half until I proved myself by telling her where Nico and I were hiding. Stuart slumped in the chair. Yes, Ma lied. She stood there with tears in her eyes and fucking lied. Gabe rubbed the back of his neck. The reality of this situation was too much for me to wrap my brain around. She put Nico and me in danger. The side of my head throbbed, and I couldn't remember the last time I'd seen food. However, I had a missing wife, a terminally ill father waiting for me, and a shitload of mob politics to navigate in the next 24 hours. I didn't have time for this. Gabe met my gaze. Are we done here? More than done. I turned for the door. Stuart sat upright so fast the chair nearly toppled. Wait, what are you going to do with me? A punishment fitting the crime. I winked at Gabe before smoothing my expression and turning back to Stuart. You're being reassigned. Starting immediately, you'll be my mother's personal bodyguard. The color leached from his face. No, you can't, please. I walked outside without a backward glance. Jeez, from his reaction, you'd think we ordered his death. Laughing, Gabe followed me around the side of the villa. Guarding Ma is worse than death. I stopped at the wrought iron fence surrounding the pool. See to it she doesn't cause any more trouble. I've already got her on lockdown, but I'll limit who goes in and out of her rooms. He nodded to the pool deck. Let's go deal with our other parent. I took a seat between my brothers and father and stuttered when they all looked at me as if waiting for me to speak. Pops, you uh, wanted to talk to us? Papa Joe Marchioni had once been a formidable man, a shark in an Armani suit who could charm the underpants off everyone from nuns to starlets. I had a hard time reconciling the guy who raised me with the hunched back man with an oxygen tube in his nose and a blanket across his lap. And then he grinned, and I saw the predator staring out from beneath his bushy brows. If you're going to run this family, you need to learn to speak your mind, even when it's empty, capisci? Capisco. I tried again. What did you want to speak to us about? As if to prove his point, he wasted no time with small talk. Your investiture ceremony is tomorrow morning. My pulse raced. I'd see Nico in a matter of hours. Family members are expected to attend. Is it wise for all of us to go? Gabe asked. No, it's not. I'm going alone. 
I'll be fine with security. Damn it, security brought up an entirely different problem. I'd need a new bodyguard fast. Ma's been causing more problems than we originally thought. After 40 years of marriage, nothing that woman does surprises me. We have more important things to discuss than your mother's meddling. I completely disagreed, but chose to pick my battles. You will absolutely not show up for the ceremony alone. I'm not sure I can make the trip, and your mother is under house arrest. She won't be attending. My father deadpanned. Two of you should accompany him, but not Gabe. Why not? Gabe folded his arms. It will raise questions if I'm not there. Pops lifted his chin and dropped a bomb. I broke the Omerta when I released the information about Carter. Nico had warned me this would happen, but she'd also seen it as an opportunity to flush out our enemies. Right then, I had no freaking clue how to flush anything, let alone people who would be calling for my father's death because he'd blabbed about his illegal activities. Leo rubbed the creases between his eyebrows. Does it matter? Are they really going to send an assassin to kill a dying man? Dante's mouth fell open. Our baby brother lived in a constant but comfortable state of denial when it came to our father's lung cancer. How can you be so crass? It's the truth. Leo turned to our father. Pop's expression darkened. It isn't me they want, it's Gabe. My brothers let out a collective gasp, followed by muttered curses. Why me? His voice cracked, and he took a step back as if to maintain his balance. I hadn't seen Gabe so visibly shaken since Maggie had gone missing. Because, like Leo said, Pops is terminally ill, and they will have their pound of flesh. Since you were the capo, and your wife wrote the press release, you are responsible. I hated every word I said, but it was the truth. Pops broke into a coughing fit that silenced all of us. When he regained his breath, he said, Marco is right. How do we stop this? I set my hand on my thigh to keep it from bouncing. By breaking the Omerta again, Pops grinned. Gabe threw up his hands and proceeded to pace the deck. Christ, first the bullshit with the Lazios and the Bruzzos, a Ma, now this? Leo went to him, slung his arm around Gabe's shoulders and whispered something I couldn't hear. Shell-shocked, Dante stood and walked to the bar. I moved my chair closer to my father and lowered my voice. Go on. He gave me an appraising look. You've changed. I'm the capo, a married man, and possibly a soon-to-be father. I had no choice. His eyes widened a fraction of an inch before he narrowed them. Does your father-in-law know Nico might be pregnant? Puzzled by his reaction, I said, I don't know, but I doubt it. Pops let out a long, slow breath. He's going to go ballistic. It's none of his business. My words came out more defensive than I'd intended, but this wasn't the reaction I'd been hoping for from my dad. Not to mention, I couldn't give a rat's ass what Pietro Lazio thought about it. He will say some terrible things. I need you to know they aren't true. He shook his head. There have been too damned many secrets. Maybe it's time to share them. You're right, it's past time. Squeezing his hand, I said, spill your guts, old man. Pops hacked out a laugh. They aren't all my secrets, son. Some aren't mine to tell, and some belong to your father-in-law. Even better, I nodded. His tone grew serious. You will need to convince one of Nicolina's brothers to go with you to the convent in Riesi. They will need to speak to the mother superior. You've lost me. What does Lazio have to do with nuns? He gave me a patient smile. One of them knows Pietro's secrets. He couldn't have her murdered, so he put her away 26 years ago. Holy shit. Pun intended. How do you know this? He glanced toward the house as if looking for my mom and motioned me even closer because I loved her. Whoa, Pops. As angry as I am at Ma, I don't want to meet your mistress. Marco. More coughing stole his words. Something felt off about the entire thing. 26 years ago was around the time I'd been born. Were you cheating on Ma while she was pregnant with me? He patted my cheek. 
I said I loved her. Not that I was her lover. She was like a sister to me. Besides, she was married to someone else, and so was I. I thanked God that Nico and I had married each other. I couldn't imagine living my life watching her with another guy. He stared out over the water. Not a day goes by that I don't regret not doing more for her. I visited and sent money to the nuns to keep her comfortable. But I should have gotten her out of that place. At least she was safe there. My father dipped his chin. Yes, she was. But I was a coward. I was too afraid I'd lose her for good if Lazio found out she'd escaped. Unsure what to think of his confession, I whispered, And now? Is it too late to make it right? My father turned and met my gaze. No, it's not. If anything, this is the perfect time. Pietro's stranglehold on the other families is finally loosening. He's desperate. Desperate men do desperate things. I thought of Nico trapped in that house and balled my fists. Pop shook his head. Desperate men make mistakes. Lazio made a big one when he went after your brother. Is he aware you know where this woman is? By the way, does she have a name? Of course she does. But it's her choice whether or not she wants to share it, he sighed. As far as I know, Pietro has no idea we've kept in touch over the years. His ego would never allow him to realize his plan didn't quite work. I felt like I'd entered some sort of alternate universe. We asked for the mother superior, and then what? Don't worry about that. She will know what to do. Another coughing fit robbed him of what little energy he had left. My father's full-time nurse came out and wheeled him back inside. Gabe motioned between Pops and me. What happened? What did he say to you? He's sending me on an errand. I stood, surprised by how off-kilter I felt, but I didn't think it had anything to do with my concussion. I'm not sure what, if anything, will come of it, but I'll go. I'll get a security team ready. I won't need them for this. At least, I hope not. You don't happen to have Giancarlo's phone number, do you? Leo scoffed. Why would you call that asshat? Because I need him to go with me to Riesi. I spoke plainly, as if my explanation should have made sense to piss him off. I might have grown up, but I'd be dead before I stopped enjoying irritating my brothers. Leo glared. My new right-hand man, a.k.a. Consiglietti, pulled out his phone. I'll text you the number. Wincing, I rubbed the back of my neck. I'm going to need a phone, preferably one loaded with contact information. Gabe motioned to the wrinkled shorts and t-shirt I'd found on the plane. It's a good thing you left most of your clothes here when you went to the States. You're going to need a suit. Hook me up, bro. The capo thing had its perks, but I gladly traded all in to have Nico back by my side. Gabe handed me his phone. Use this while Leo sets up a permanent replacement, and Dante gets your clothes ready. Leo smirked and Dante groaned. Yep, being the head of the family definitely has its perks. Chapter 34, Marco. That old saying, keep your friends close and your enemies closer, played through my mind. The trouble was, I didn't know which category to place my new brother-in-law. Regardless of what I called him, I had to convince a man I didn't know or particularly like to accompany me to the convent without telling him where we were going or why. Giancarlo picked up on the first ring. Pronto. How's Nico? I planned to introduce myself, fill him in on the bare bones basics, and say whatever I needed to in order to convince him to come with me. However, my mind went blank the second he answered the phone. Marco? He spoke in a hushed tone. Yes, I should have led with that. How's my wife? Worried, he sighed. She asked me to get a message to you. Tell me in person. I had one shot to get this right and no clue how to appeal to him, other than to use Nico as an excuse. I need to meet with you here in Comiso. It's a five-hour drive, and we are both expected in Palermo in the morning. The tiny town tested my rusty knowledge of Sicilian geography, but we could reach Riesi from the villa in about an hour. We'd arrive at the convent late, but nuns didn't exactly keep visiting hours, did they? 
Giancarlo, it's urgent. Drive to Comiso. We'll fly to Palermo together in the morning before the ceremony. What is this about? Skepticism dripped from every word. Nicolina, of course. I search for something more to say, some nugget of inspiration to lock him into coming. She's the wife of a capo now. I need to understand how your father runs his household, so I know how to structure my staff. I want her to be comfortable. Shit, that sounded lame. Might as well throw out a net while I'm drifting aimlessly. Since she's going to be a mother. You love her? He made the statement into a question. Come on, man, give me something. He hadn't corrected me, but he hadn't confirmed Nico's pregnancy either. I do. Good, because if you hurt her, I'll cut your balls off and feed them to my dogs. I grinned because that sounded like something my brothers and I would say if we had a sister. You'll come? Yes, but I'm not driving. Meet me at the airport and call me so. Call me from the plane with your ETA. This sounds like a load of horse shit, but I'll be there. Alone. Now you're starting to piss me off, he laughed. Yeah, alone. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I would call Giancarlo a friend, but stranger things had happened. Hell, they'd happened today. I arrived at the airport in time to watch the Lazio jet touch down. It struck me as odd they owned a newer and much splashier plane than we did considering Marchioni businesses had laundered Pietro Lazio's money for the previous two decades. I thought I had a handle on his net worth. It seemed I was wrong. The doors opened and Giancarlo stepped out onto the stairs. He looked so different without his security team and expensive suit, I barely recognized him. Once again, I felt as if I'd entered the twilight zone. The guy I'd either feared or disliked my entire life seemed like a normal dude. Holding my arms out wide, I walked toward him. Welcome to Comiso. He glanced around as if waiting for my guards to appear out of thin air. You got me here, now what? Now we take a ride. I have an errand to run. We can talk on the way. I motioned to the armored SUV. He gave me a hard look, strode around the vehicle and climbed into the front seat. I understood his nervousness. I'd probably act a little squirrely if the Italian leather loafer was on the other foot. Sliding behind the driver's seat, I said, that was your flight, good. How's your head? He motioned in the general direction of my injury. Nothing a couple of aspirin couldn't take care of. I pulled out of the airport and headed toward Riesi. You said you have a message from Nico? Small talk's over, huh? You don't seem like the type to waste time. I glanced between him and the road. He fidgeted in the seat as if trying to get comfortable, or more likely to buy himself time to decide how much to tell me. She's playing a game with our father. I didn't like the sound of that. What kind of game? Long story short, he has the contract the two of you signed before you were married. My mother had told me as much, but I didn't want to tip my hand just yet. I see. He believes forcing Nico to stay married to you is punishment, Giancarlo grinned. She's worried you'll blow the charade tomorrow. With good reason, I had a hard time keeping my hands off her under normal circumstances, let alone after a freaking kidnapping. Thanks for the heads up. I'll make sure to limit the public displays of affection. Glancing at him again, I said, how are Maria and Alessio? His shoulders bunched. I returned them to their home in Trapani, but my father has forbidden them from going back to the States. Why do I get the feeling there's more to it than that? Giancarlo frowned. This conversation never happened, right? You have my word. The haunted look in his eyes freaked me the hell out, but I did my best to remain impassive. He wants them close to use his leverage against you and Nico. The big guy stared at his hands. They would be dead right now, had Nico not agreed the two of you would live in Trapani. Like hell we will. The SUV swerved, but I managed to straighten the wheel before we ran off the road. Want my advice? Sure. I didn't give a rat's ass what Pietro Lazio wanted, but I'd take all the advice and insight into the man I could get. My father will destroy anyone and anything to maintain control of the other families. Until you're in a position to bring him down, you should give him what he wants. If you don't, he'll take everything you love from you, one piece at a time. I shook my head. I can't do that. Not if it means sacrificing Nico's happiness. Good answer.
Giancarlo smiled his first real smile since he'd stepped off the plane. She's afraid, you know, about the baby. My chest tightened even as I grinned. Is this what parenthood is like? Joyous terror for the next 18 years? She's really pregnant? I saw the results of the test with my own eyes. I should have been there, holding her hand. I'd be damned if I let Pietro Lazio or anyone else steal another moment from us. One way or another, he was going down. Are your brothers really going to walk away from the life? It took my brain a couple of seconds to adjust to the change of subject. That's the plan. I left it at that for a couple of reasons. Leaving the mob was a complicated process involving everything from a change in tax brackets to security concerns. It was too much to get into in the short amount of time we had. Not to mention, I didn't completely trust him. My brothers and I are interested in seeing how it goes. I tightened my grip on the wheel and forced myself to stare straight ahead to hide my shock. While he hadn't outright admitted it, I took the hint. The younger generation of Lazios wanted out, or at least were considering it. Giancarlo glanced at a sign for the convent and furrowed his brow. Where the hell are we going, Marchioni? To see a woman about a secret. I turned onto a dirt road leading to the ancient building on top of the hill. With its thick stone walls and tall, narrow windows, the place resembled a medieval fortress. For all I knew, that's exactly what it was. A woman or a nun. He gripped the dashboard as I navigated the steep terrain. Same difference. I had to tell him the truth before we walked in there, but I wasn't sure how he'd take it. The last thing I needed was another concussion. Your father sent a woman here years ago. My dad seems to think she knows something that can help us. Giancarlo narrowed his eyes. You mean give you leverage. I parked the SUV and pulled the keys from the ignition before turning to him. Us leverage. Me, Nico, you, your brothers. I have no idea what we're going to learn in there. This entire thing might turn out to be a dead end, but I'm curious enough to find out. He scrubbed his hands over his military short hair. You're right. Let's go. Giancarlo strode to the heavy wood door and pulled the chain. Bells rang somewhere inside the convent. The entire thing reminded me of an old movie. I half expected to see Al Pacino with a machine gun on his back right up on a freaking donkey. A nun in a full habit and heavy wooden beads opened the door. She couldn't have been more than four and a half feet tall, and from the looks of it, she might have been around when the place was built. We stood there staring. The nun arched an eyebrow and motioned to her mouth and to us. Right, vow of silence, I grumbled. We'd like to speak to the Mother Superior. She motioned to herself. You're the Mother Superior? Giancarlo asked. She nodded. He threw his head back and laughed. What was that you were saying about a dead end, Marchioni? I debated between throat punching him and laughing. Interestingly enough, I had the same reaction to my brothers on a daily basis. Kiss my, I mean, go bless yourself, Lazio. Wide-eyed, the nun pressed her hand to her mouth, stepped back and motioned for us to come inside. Giancarlo and I exchanged glances as we followed her. I whispered, must have said the magic word. Yeah, Lazio. He pressed his lips into a thin line. The mother superior held up her hand, signaling for us to stop before hurrying down a corridor. I have a bad feeling about this. He wiped the sweat from his forehead. Same here. We turned at the sound of fast footsteps. A woman with long, dark hair shot through with streaks of silver ran into the courtyard, but stopped short when she saw us. Her dark eyes swept over us several times before settling on Giancarlo. I stared, unable to look away. She was beautiful and familiar, hauntingly familiar. My stomach clenched. My God, it can't be. She fell to her knees, clasped hands held up to the sky. She repeated one word over and over. Grazie, grazie, grazie. Giancarlo took a tentative step forward. Mama? Chapter 35, Nicolina. I had visited the estate where Marco's investiture ceremony would take place many times over the years. It was one of the few properties the ruling families shared, a designated neutral ground where violence was forbidden. The place was massive. Besides the formal hall where the families would welcome Marco into the fold, each capo had a private wing with smaller meeting rooms, offices, and bedrooms. 
Normally, I loved visiting the beautiful grounds, but that day was anything but normal. Giancarlo and Marco were both over an hour late. I refused to assume the worst, but my fears were getting the better of me. To make matters worse, my father's anger bubbled closer to the surface with each tick of the clock. I did my best to stay quiet and still to avoid his wrath, a trick I'd learned as a child. Where the hell is Giancarlo? He shouted into his phone. The man hadn't stopped pacing the private office since we'd arrived at the estate. Find him. My dress's stiff collar made the back of my neck itch, and my stilettos felt as if they'd shrank a size or two in my absence. Adding insult to injury, I hadn't eaten anything since dinner the night before. My stomach felt like it was digesting itself. What do you mean he took the jet? Why am I only hearing about this now? The veins in my father's forehead bulged. What the hell is he doing in Comiso? Giancarlo went to see Marco? I sat straighter. Pietro turned and glared. Do you know why your brother went to visit your husband yesterday? Perhaps the Marchioni jet is out of service? I hated how timid my voice came out. I wasn't a scared child anymore, but I had a role to play. A role that would keep people I loved alive. He scowled. You will call him. Oh shit, he's not going to like this. I swallowed hard. I would be happy to, but Giancarlo's men destroyed mine and Marco's phones. Pietro wiggled the receiver in his hand at me as if I were too stupid to realize there were other telephones in the building. I only know Marco's cell number. He strode across the room, grabbed my arm, and jerked me to my feet. You're lying to me. Instinctively, I put my chin on my chest, curled my shoulders forward, and wrapped my free arm around my middle. He raised his hand as if to strike, but stopped when footsteps echoed on the marble floors. You will take your hands off my wife. Marco strode into the office. Pietro shoved me back into the chair and turned toward him. Who are you to speak to me in that tone? Marco pushed into my father's personal space. If you ever touch her again, I'll cut your fucking hand off. I held my breath, praying one or the other of them would back down, there were armed guards within earshot, and unless protocol had drastically changed, Marco had been searched for weapons before he was allowed to enter the estate. We were defenseless. Pietro motioned to Giancarlo, who'd remained near the doorway during the exchange. Get him out of here. My brother folded his arms and leveled a glare at our father. I agree with Marchioni on this one. You have no right manhandling Nico. You walk in here an hour late and speak to me like I'm a dog. He took a step in my brother's direction. I stood and insinuated myself between Marco, Giancarlo, and my father. Papa, please. It was a misunderstanding. Why don't you join the other capos? It's past time for the ceremony to start. Nick, I need you to stay out of this. Marco nodded to the far side of the room near my brother. I stared unable to make sense of his cold expression. Sure, I'd asked Giancarlo to warn him not to be overly affectionate, but he hadn't as much as spared me a glance. Marco met my gaze and the corner of his mouth lifted. It was a quick gesture. Had I not been staring, I would have missed it. Wobbling on the ridiculous shoes, I crossed the room. The closer I came to my brother, the faster my heart raced. From a distance, he'd seemed irritated, but up close, I could all but feel the anger radiating off him. However, his puffy red eyes troubled me more than his thinly veiled rage. Has he been crying? I whispered, are you okay? He shook his head, a fraction of an inch. A man dressed in an ill-fitted business suit walked into the office. He took one look at Marco and sighed in relief. Mr. Marchioni, you're here. If you will come with me, we need to get started. After I have a moment with my wife, Marco met my gaze, alone. I'll be just outside the door, sir. Please hurry. The corner of his left eye twitched, but he forced a smile and left the room. Nicolina, you will accompany me into the hall. 
Pietro snapped his fingers as if calling the family pet. She's not going anywhere, Marco glared. My stomach twisted. I felt like the rope in their tug of war, a game I knew my father would win because he'd play dirty. Giancarlo folded his arms. There is no need for Nico to accompany you, father. Only capos are allowed into the ceremony itself. I'll stay with her until the party begins. Pietro growled under his breath. Nicolina, you will. Before you say another word, there's something you should see. Marco shoved the phone in front of my father's face. A woman's voice carried through the room, but the volume was too low for me to make out her words. Pietro took a step back. His complexion went from tan to white to an alarming shade of red. He gasped and pulled at his tie. Where? How? What is he looking at? I turned to Giancarlo and sucked in a breath. He wiped the tears from his face. Now isn't the time. I'll explain after I escort our father to the ceremony. I wanted to demand he tell me what the hell was happening that instant. But between the hard set of Marco's jaw and Giancarlo's emotional state, I bit my tongue. I trust you recognize her? Marco slid the phone back into his pocket. Yes. Pietro's voice cracked. What do you want? Name it. Want? Who is this woman? I couldn't make sense of what was happening. We'll discuss that later. Marco motioned to Giancarlo. My brother crossed the room, took my stunned father's arm, and marched him out of the office. Marco waited until we were alone before pulling me into a tight embrace. Are you okay? He didn't hurt you, did he? No, he didn't. I drew in his freshly showered scent, and the world suddenly didn't seem as frightening. I'm tired and missed you like crazy, but I'm good now. And the baby? A wave of disappointment crashed over me. He or she is good, but I wanted to be the one to tell you all of our practice made perfect. I should have been there when you found out we were expecting, but I swear to you, I'll be there for every other big moment. He eased back and met my gaze. Are you absolutely sure you're on board with me going through with this investiture ceremony? I winced before I could stop myself. It's what has to be done, right? More than you can imagine. He sighed and frowned at his watch. Just know, this is temporary. I can't promise we'll be free in six months or a year, but we will get out. We'd only had a few seconds together. I wasn't ready to let him go. I trust you. I'll make sure I keep it that way. He nodded to who I assumed was the man in the ill-fitted suit. Who was that on the phone? Nick, I wish I could stay with you and explain everything. God knows I should be the one holding your hand through what's about to happen, but I'm already late. Marco placed a quick kiss on my lips. Dante and Leo are here. They're going to make sure you're, they're here if you need them. Hold my hand through what? He made absolutely no sense. I followed his gaze to Dante standing in the doorway. Marco cupped my cheeks. This is going to be a shock, but I swear to you, everything is going to be okay. I opened my mouth to ask one of the hundred questions bouncing around in my head, but he placed a finger on my lips. Your mother, Vittoria, is alive. What? Is this some sort of cruel joke? I glanced between him and Dante and half expected them to laugh. Giancarlo walked back into the room, wiping his eyes. I'd seen him cry three times in my lifetime. All three were in the previous 24 hours. He choked back a sob. It's true, and she would very much like to meet you. My mother wants to meet me? My voice quivered. Where is she? The guy in the bad suit cleared his throat. Mr. Marchioni, I have to insist you come with me now. Marco pulled me close. Sweetheart, I'm so sorry, I have to go. They'll explain everything. I stood, dumbstruck as he hurried out of the office. 
Nico, you should sit. Giancarlo guided me toward a chair, but I stopped moving halfway there. I don't understand. Where has she been? The old familiar feeling of not being enough washed over me. Had she left me with that monster because she didn't love me? Our father had her locked in a convent to keep her from telling anyone he was embezzling money. He caressed my back. And evidently because he thought she was having an affair. My knees went out from beneath me, but he caught me before I fell. You need to sit down. Have you eaten? Shaking my head, I pulled away from him. I want to see her. Giancarlo turned to Dante. She's pregnant. Get her some food before she passes out. Dante gaped like a fish, inhaling air for the first time. I don't want to eat. I want answers. I grabbed his lapels and forced him to look at me. Where is she? With Leo in the Marchionni's private office. He offered me a watery smile. Would you like to meet her? I don't know what to say to her. My heart hammered against my ribcage. What if she doesn't like me? What if she's awful like my father? What if she thinks I'm awful like my father? She asked a million questions about you on the way here. He kissed my temple. I'm sure the two of you will have a lot to talk about. We should go to my family's rooms. It's safer there. Dante stepped closer, sending my already racing pulse into a frenzy. I glanced between them. Stay with me, okay? Don't leave me alone with her until I give you the sign. When you're comfortable, tell me you want a cup of tea and I'll leave you two alone. A slow smile crossed Giancarlo's face, and he nodded toward the door. Ready? No, but we should at least get out of here. Sighing, I followed them through the estate. People filled the hall, waiting to meet the new capo of the Marchioni family. I recognized several of my father's business associates. Three of my brothers turned and frowned when I hustled through the room. I ignored them, along with my aunt on my mother's side and Sofia Abruzzo. We reached the Marchioni offices, but I lingered, unsure if I was ready to face living proof of my father's cruelty. Dante swung open the door before I had a chance to gather my thoughts or my courage. I glanced up, but I couldn't see past the two of them. Standing shoulder to shoulder, they completely blocked my view inside of the room. I rose to tiptoe, leaned to the right and then to the left, but couldn't as much as catch a glimpse of my mother. For a second, I wondered if she'd changed her mind about meeting me. Dante said something to my brother. Giancarlo nodded and spoke in a low voice. Now? They're having a conversation now? I took a step forward. Scusi? A velvety voice cut through the men's conversation. A heartbeat later, a tall, dark-haired woman elbowed her way between them. She met my gaze and froze in place. My hand flew to my mouth. She had my eyes, or I should say, I had hers. The same shape, same color, same thick eyebrows. Chin quivering, she smiled, frowned, and smiled again. Nicolina? I nodded too quickly. Vittoria made a pained sound, closed her eyes, and did the sign of the cross before closing the distance between us. She stopped in front of me and alternated between lifting and dropping her hands as if she didn't know what to do with them. Up close, the gray in her hair and lines around her eyes were more noticeable and more troubling. For me, they were a reminder of the time we'd lost. I couldn't imagine what must have been going through her mind. I'd been a newborn the last time she'd seen me, if she'd seen me at all. Mama, I couldn't take it another minute. I threw my arms around her and buried my face in her hair. My mother choked out a sob and wrapped her thin but strong arms around me. Tesoro mio, my treasure, my sweet treasure. 
We remained in each other's arms, sobbing, until I'd soaked the shoulder of her dress. I eased back and smiled. We should sit, Mama. Yes, yes, of course. She glanced at my belly and gave me a shy smile. Your husband tells me you are expecting. I nodded again, because I didn't trust myself not to babble like a lunatic about how happy I was to have a mother to help me through the pregnancy. Instead, I turned to Giancarlo. I'd like a cup of tea. He and Dante laughed. Leo stepped closer and rested his hand on my shoulder. Marco is planning to call a meeting immediately following the ceremony. He wants us to join him. Until that moment, I hadn't stopped to think about everything Marco had said or the repercussions. I glanced at the men's stone-faced expressions before turning back to my mother. You're not safe here. Papa had you held prisoner. He'll, he'll kill you before he allows you to speak to the other families. None of us are safe until he is stopped. I must do this. She drew a deep breath. For you, and your brothers, and my grandchild. I pressed my palm against my belly and prayed we'd all make it out alive. Chapter 36, Marco. In the movies, the hero grinds his teeth or hisses when a blade bites into his flesh. Unfortunately for me, Hollywood got that wrong too. It hurt like a bitch when Tommaso Abruzzo sliced my palm open and forced me to bleed on what looked like a tarot card with a freaking skull on it. Welcome to the Fratellanza. Abruzzo wrapped my wound with a bandage, kissed my cheeks, and hugged me. I glanced at my father over the other man's shoulder. He gave me a quick nod and slow smile. Welcome to the Brotherhood. My son is now my capo. The men in the room, with the exception of Pietro Lazio, laughed and took turns kissing my cheeks. I hadn't endured that much backslapping and congratulatory nonsense since I'd scored the winning goal on my college soccer team. When it was my father's turn, I leaned down and whispered, How are you holding up? Well enough to enjoy the fireworks, he croaked out a chuckle. That's my cue. I turned to face the men in the room. Before we join our families for breakfast, I'd like to invite a special guest to speak to you. I believe you will find what she has to say very enlightening. Pietro Lazio choked on his own spit or tongue or disbelief. It was hard to tell which. I object. My father, God love him, flubbed his lips. Shut the fuck up. This isn't the goddamned courtroom. Lazio continued to bellow as I walked to the door, poked my head out and motioned to Leo. He nodded and strode away. Raising my voice over the din, I said, I understand there was a vote regarding my brother Gabriel breaking the Omerta. Mikael Salvo, a capo who tended to side with the Abruzzos, frowned. The vote is final, unless there is new evidence. Nodding, I shoved my hands in my pockets. I don't have new evidence. I only want to go on record as saying that my father, I motioned to my dad, and my brother did what they had to do to prevent another family from taking over our territory. Tommaso Abruzzo's eyes widened, as if the news surprised him. Odd, considering Tara had told them all Sophia had blackmailed her into trying to take out my entire family. Lazio glared, but there was no mistaking the fear in his eyes. Outside the room, a woman screamed. Everything went quiet for a heartbeat before more people shouted. I lunged for the door at the same time Leo opened it and ushered Vittoria Lazio, Nico, and Sophia freaking Abruzzo inside. Leo gave me a hard look, nodded in the direction they'd come, and mouthed, fucking chaos. The people outside the room might have freaked out when a supposedly dead woman walked into the hall, but the men inside had gone stone still. Even my father stared as if he'd seen a freaking ghost. Tommaso stood. Vittoria? Her gaze fell on him, and she brought her hands to her mouth and nodded. Nico stood on one side of her, Sophia on the other. Between the two of them, I wasn't sure who was more likely to break the no-violence rule. Where? How? Tommaso turned his head toward Lazio. What did you do to her? Pietro had the sense to lower his head. Why don't we have a seat and allow Vittoria to tell us what she's been through? I motioned to the table with a bloody skull card. 
Tommaso nodded several times, grabbed the closest chair, and collapsed into it. Nicolina, please join me. I'd appreciate your input. I held my hand to her and ignored the surprised expressions of the other capos' faces. Screw them. The times, they are a changin'. She seemed to actively ignore her father as she seated herself. I took her hand and brought it to my lips before turning my attention to Vittoria. Rather than sit, she stood facing her husband with one hand on Nico's shoulder and the other on Sofia's. Pietro had me held prisoner at the convent in Riesi for the last 26 years because I learned that he was stealing from all of you. Lazio inspected his nails as if the entire situation was preposterous. She is lying to get revenge. I gave her to the nuns because she was, she was unfaithful. She betrayed me with him. Pietro pointed at my father. Oh my God, what does this mean for the baby? Nico whispered. Please, tell me your parents weren't lovers. You're pregnant? Lazio's eyes widened. She frowned. Yes. He threw his head back and laughed. Do you know why I never loved you? You were a constant reminder of your mother's infidelities. Giancarlo stood. That's enough. Pietro spat on the table. Enough, enough would be a kick in the stomach to kill the abomination growing inside her. He pointed at Nico. You married your brother. You married your goddamned brother. Vittoria squeezed Nico's shoulder. Joe Marchioni and I are close friends, like siblings, nothing more. Pops leaned forward to meet Nico's gaze. My dear, you have nothing to worry about. Your father could never understand how a man and a woman could be friends. Shell-shocked, Nico turned back to me as if for confirmation. Sweetheart, he's lying. Why would he try to force you to marry Enzo if he thought you weren't his? She furrowed her brow. The discussion went on around us, but I only heard every third word or so. Right then, I was far more concerned about my wife and child than mafia drama. Nico finally nodded and squeezed my hand. Mikel Salvo shouted, Enough! Vittoria, please, tell us about the theft. She drew a deep breath and squared her shoulders. Before he had me sent to the convents, I was responsible for keeping our books. Back then, Pietro collected the dirty money from each of the families and sent it to be cleaned. Salvo nodded. Yes, that is still how it is done. The money is sent to the Marchionis in the United States. I discovered that Pietro had two sets, one he shared with the Fratellanza and a second private record. She chewed her lower lip. When I asked him about the discrepancies between the two ledgers, he became violent. The beating caused me to go into premature labor with Nicolina. Oh, mama. Nico took Vittoria's hand. Hours after I gave birth, I was told I needed to go to the hospital. Her chin quivered. The nanny took my daughter from my arms, and that was the last time I saw my family. Sophia said, he will pay for this, Zia Vittoria. I will make sure of it. The room went deathly quiet. Everyone except Vittoria stared at Lazio with varying degrees of disgust. I'd heard the story the night before, but it didn't make it any easier to hear it again. As her husband, I had every right to send her away. He glanced from one capo to the next. When he received nothing but contempt, he slammed his hands on the table. I am not a thief. She's lying. She has no proof. Leo cleared his throat. But we do. The room went quiet again as my brother handed each of them a fat financial report the Marchioni IT wizards had retrieved from Lazio's private computer network, thanks in no small part to Nico. She knew most of his passwords. Tommaso flipped through the pages before pegging Lazio with a glare. You stole from us, led me to believe my sister was dead, and turned my daughter into your personal guard dog. Sophia hung her head at the accusation. I held my breath and waited for her to spill her guts. She was the one person who could potentially save Gabe's ass. Vittoria whispered into the younger woman's ear. Sophia nodded once, cleared her throat, and stood. I thought I was acting with your blessings. I did what I did because my uncle told me the Fratellanza wanted the Marchionis pushed out of New Orleans by any means necessary. Lazio looked as if he'd swallowed his tongue. My father's voice filled the room, strong and proud. There is your proof. My son and I were justified in breaking the omerta. 
We did what was necessary to protect our territory. It had been so long since I'd heard him shout, he took me by surprise. I turned to find him sitting taller than he had in months. Victoria turned and stared at my father as if she'd only just recognized him. Tears filled her eyes, and his too. He winked, she smiled, they drew shaky breaths. The long lost friends seemed to have an entire conversation in those precious seconds between them before they glanced away. Tomazo winked at me before turning to the others. I motion to dismiss the charges against the Marchiones. They were justified in breaking the Omerta. Remembering Nico's advice to take advantage of the situation to flush out our enemies, I leaned forward to get a better view of the Ricci and Salvo family capos. Both men nodded their approval. While they didn't smile, neither seemed upset by the turn of events. I turned to whisper a thank you to my wife, but was stunned into silence. Dark circles had formed under her eyes and her shoulders slumped. She'd been through a lot in the previous 48 hours. I needed to wrap things up and get her someplace quiet as soon as possible. Unfortunately, Nico wasn't the only one who needed a break. My father broke out into a coughing fit that silenced the room. He shouldn't have come, but once he'd learned that Vittoria had agreed to speak to the Fratellanza, there had been no stopping him. He'd insisted it was worth the risk to see Pietro Lazio get what he deserved. Only that hadn't happened yet. Since Vittoria had walked in, everything had devolved into shouted accusations and tearful confessions. For Lazio's part, he sat ramrod straight, taking it all in, or more likely, looking for an out. I needed to bring the meeting back to order before it was too late. Releasing Nico's hand, I stood. Because my family was targeted, I have the right to ask for justice. All eyes turned to me. That was all eyes except Pietro Lazio's. He'd evidently found something interesting to stare at on the tabletop. Speak your mind. The capo of the salvo sat back and folded his arms. No surprise. Nico had warned me he'd sided against us when Gabe had made it clear we wanted out of the mob. My brothers and the Marchioni Corporation will no longer be considered part of the Cosa Nostra. Abruzzo and Salvo shook their heads, but remained silent. Pietro Lazio took the opportunity to drop a freaking bomb. What my son-in-law isn't telling you is that they have already liquidated the vast majority of their holdings. They can't support our operations, even if we demand they remain. He is a capo in name only. The Marchioni seat at this table is forfeit. My heart stopped. Gabe had ordered me to sell off any business supported by illegal activities. Had he known doing so would put us in serious hot water with the other families? Once again, Leo stepped forward and saved the freaking day. Actually, we've moved the businesses out from under Marchioni Corp and put them under a shell company owned by my mother. Nico sighed. I didn't need a crystal ball to know what she was thinking. For every step toward freedom we took, someone pushed us back three. I resisted the urge to pinch the bridge of my nose. Ma and her freaking meddling had saved our collective asses, but she'd locked me in tighter. Does anyone have any objections to my first proposal? They remained silent. I took that as a good sign. Anyone else want to throw accusations at me, or may I move on? Tommaso Abruzzo grinned. By all means. Chapter 37 Nicolina My breath caught in my throat. Marco had made a mistake. A big one. The capos hadn't agreed to allow his brothers to leave the mafia. With these men, silence did not mean agreement. Before I could warn him, he flashed me a quick grin. Darling, I feel as though I'm forgetting something. Wasn't there someone else your father wronged? Alessio and Maria. I loved this man. Even though he was juggling more than humanly possible, he'd remembered them. Yes. As a matter of fact, there is. He ruined the reputations of two people by accusing them of stealing. He should make a public apology to the Grassos. My father narrowed his eyes. Tommaso Abruzzo nodded. Considering his crimes, I believe that is a reasonable request. I want you to think of them happily spending your money every day of your miserable life. It was petty but I couldn't resist hitting him where it hurt, in the wallet. 
Marco cleared his throat and tightened his jaw as if he expected an argument. Pietro Lazio has stolen millions from everyone at this table. We all know what happens to thieves. I smirked, remembering my father saying something similar the day before. He continued to glare at me, but I held my chin high. I refused to allow him to intimidate me ever again. The first rule in our code of honor states we don't hurt women. Doing so is a higher crime than stealing or even breaking the omerta. Personally, I think death is too good for him. I prefer a sentence that is more fitting to his other crimes. Marco motioned to Vittoria to drive home his point. Abruzzo's lips curled into a mean smile. What do you have in mind? I took the liberty of speaking with an abbot. He's agreed to shelter Lazio for the remainder of his days in exchange for an annual donation. It's a small monastery, but after hearing what Lazio did to his wife, the abbot is rather enthusiastic about teaching him the ways of our Lord and Savior. I covered my mouth to hide my smile. I had never been prouder of Marco. He had every right to call for my father's execution, but he'd managed to keep his hands clean while extracting justice. You can't be serious. Pietro stood and kicked his chair against the wall. The other capos ignored the tantrum and spoke amongst themselves. Pietro continued to shout obscenities about his lying wife, Marco and me, his traitorous daughter, all of which seemed to make their decision easier. Salvo walked to a door on the far side of the room and spoke to the guy in the cheap suit who'd shown me to the ceremony. A few seconds later, armed men came into the room and pulled Lazio out, kicking and screaming like an overgrown toddler. Great. If there's nothing else, I'm taking my wife home so she can spend some time with her mother. Marco squeezed my hand. I had no clue where home would be, but I needed to get out of there and hold my husband. Please, I'd like to come too. Sofia Abruzzo went wide-eyed, as if she'd realized the absurdity of her request. She had, after all, tried to have three generations of Marchionis killed and played a part in Joe and Rebecca's murders. My mother sighed as if someone had handed her a heavy load. She'd only just returned to find her family split in two. I couldn't force her to choose between me and her brother and nieces, Marco's expression darkened. I shot him a quick look before turning to Vittoria. We'll stay here tonight. I'm exhausted, and I'm guessing Marco hasn't slept in days. You can visit with your family while we get some rest. Thank you. That would be lovely. Marco held his hand out to me. Let's go. I had a feeling he absolutely hated the idea of staying at the estate overnight, but we both had done things for our families the other didn't like. Joe Marchionni cleared his throat. Marco, they didn't agree or disagree with your prior request. Don't walk out of here without their word. I mentally groaned. I'd forgotten to warn him. He glanced between the remaining capos. Do I need to call for a vote? Giancarlo stood. Since my father no longer has a seat at the table, as the eldest son, I claim the position as capo of the Lazio family. My first order of business is to vote to allow Marco's request. The older men stared at Giancarlo and Marco. If I had to guess, I'd say they'd seen the future and didn't like it, not one bit. Tommaso Abruzzo glanced between my mom Sofia and me, as if weighing his words against our likely reactions. With Marco at the table and the promise that operations will continue as usual, we no longer need Gabe and the others. I say we let them go as a show of our willingness to compromise. Compromise my ass. The way he'd worded his response locked Marco into the mafia so tight Houdini couldn't get him out. I disagree, but I am outvoted. Salvo threw up his hands. Thank you. Enjoy my party. I won't be attending. Marco all but pulled me out of my chair, 
and ushered me from the room. Marco. But why didn't your father get my mother out of the convent? Nico had spent the previous half hour machine gun firing questions. My eyes had glazed over five minutes into the barrage. He was concerned about her safety. I yawned, wrapped my hand around the side of her head, and forced her to rest against my shoulder. We'll get the answers eventually, but you should get some sleep. What he said about me marrying my brother, it makes no sense. If my father honestly believes I'm the result of an affair between your father and my mother, why would he try to force me to marry Enzo? Her voice thinned. He's either lying, or he thinks Enzo isn't a Marchione. My God, should we tell Enzo about this? I couldn't bring myself to consider the possibility for a number of reasons. One, thinking about my mother having sex, in or out of marriage, was gross. Two, Pietro Lazio was a paranoid son of a bitch with a complicated relationship with the truth. I didn't believe a word out of his mouth. Three, if it were true, it would crush Enzo and my father. I'm kidding. I forced out a laugh for her sake. We all look too much like my dad for any of us to be illegitimate. That's true, she sighed. I think Maria knew what happened to my mom. I had the same thought. I'm not upset with her. I mean, I am, but I understand. She was too afraid of my father to do anything to stop what had happened. Maria wouldn't have had any idea where he'd taken my mother. Maria cared for you like you were her own flesh and blood. That's the best thing she could have done for Vittoria. She nodded. I rolled to face her. Since you're obviously not going to sleep, we should talk about what comes next for us. Nico furrowed her brow. How do you feel about being a father? I mean, we spoke about it, but now that it's... Rather than let her work herself into a panic, I pressed my lips to hers. The kiss went from a whisper to a moan faster than the speed of light. Laughing for real this time, I pulled back enough to rest my forehead against hers. I've wanted to do that since I got here this morning. Me too. To answer your question, I'm scared shitless but excited. It's the same for me. She brushed her fingertips over my jaw. I tucked my chin to get a look at her flat abs, glanced back to her eyes, and set my hand on her belly. Are you feeling okay? You were pretty nauseous at the cabin. I wondered if you were pregnant. Her shy grin told me she'd suspected the same thing. I still have morning sickness, but it isn't too bad. I'm also exhausted, starving, and seriously horny, but all of that can wait until after we've had our talk. We can talk while you eat, or I eat you. She smacked my arm. It's rude to talk with your mouth full. God, this woman. What did I do to deserve her? I forced thoughts on my face between her legs from my head and went for a serious topic. All this stress isn't good for the baby. I know. I promise to take it easy as soon as things settle. We have no clue when that will be. You'll take it easy starting now. I kissed the tip of her nose. It's official. You're the Marchione Capo. You did great in there today. I'm proud of you. But you need to watch out for Salvo, Nick. I sighed and brushed her hair from her face. Let me worry about business. Don't start treating me like I'm made of porcelain. I'm pregnant, not fragile. I held my hand up in mock surrender. Sweetheart, I didn't mean forever, just for the next hour. I'm smart enough to know I need that brilliant mind of yours. I feel like I jumped into the shark tank, and I have no freaking idea how to swim. She sighed. You'll learn, in time. Like I said earlier, I know you don't want to be a mafia wife, and you're worried the business will change me. I'm going to get us out, I swear. I'm not upset. I understand your ass was against the wall. Back. My back was against the wall. Laughing, I cupped her butt and pulled her hips against mine. But now that you mention it, I wouldn't mind putting your ass against the wall. Nico made a purring sound in the back of her throat that went straight to my dick. I like the sound of that. But you need sleep. I'd said the responsible thing, but I couldn't hide the fact I was rock hard. She wiggled closer. We have time for a quickie. No sex until after you nap. Once again, I'd said the right thing, but my body hadn't gotten the memo. I caught myself grinding against her like a teenager on his parents' couch. She whispered, 
Are you sure? I jerked my hips back and cleared my throat. Yes, we have some decisions to make, like where do we want to live? Personally, I had no idea where we'd end up. My place in the French Quarter was a full-on bachelor pad, not exactly conducive for raising a family. You'll need to be close to Palermo until things settle, but I'd rather make our permanent home in New Orleans. Same here. I want our kid as far away from Sicily as possible. I frowned. What about your mom? Do you want her to live with us? That you thought to ask means a lot, but not really. I'd like to set up a room for her when she visits, but her family is in Sicily. I blew out a sigh of relief. Thank Christ. Nico curled against me and closed her eyes. Less than a minute later, she drifted off to sleep, complete with soft, girly snores. For the first time since I'd left the bayou, I took a quick inventory of my life. Married to the woman of my dreams, baby on the way, two awesome new in-laws. As for my job, I might be a little fish swimming with apex predators, but my brothers were free. After the previous 48 hours, I'd take that as a win. Not bad, Marchione. Not bad at all. Chapter 38, Marco. Two months later. It had rained for the previous three days, and from the looks of the sky, the storms would continue. I stared down at people running for cover under the enormous white tent in my parents' backyard and frowned. What the hell was I thinking? Shaking my head, I turned from the window. Dante clamped a hand on my shoulder. I've been asking myself the same damn question since you came up with this bullshit plan. Gabe shoved our younger brother out of the way and helped fix my bow tie. You were thinking about making your wife happy. My point exactly. Why go through all the fuss when you're already married? Dante talked a big game, but he'd taken it upon himself to arrange not only the un-bachelor party, but the cake, flowers, and music. The catering fell into Enzo's capable hands, and the rest of the planning was split between Leo and Gabe, though I suspected they'd enlisted the help of their women. I slid into my tuxedo jacket and took one last look in the mirror. What if Nico hates this idea? Enzo chuckled. Six months ago, she would have, but she's not the same, not a hair out of place designer clad supermodel she was before. I disagreed. She might have given up the sky high heels and the couture fashion, but those things were only the wrappings. Deep down, she was still the girl I'd fallen in love with when we were kids. She was perfect. For me, anyway. Okay, I guess it's time to go ask my wife to marry me and spring a wedding on her. I turned to Leo who'd remained fairly stoic during the typical Marchione pre-wedding razzing. What time do you pick up the surprise guest? He made a show of glancing at his watch. About now o'clock. I'll walk you out. Sure. I headed for the door, stopped, and grinned at the four of them. Before I forget, thanks for your help. I love you guys. Go. Enzo threw a dirty sock at me. Dante rolled his eyes, and Gabe grinned like a proud papa sending his son out into the world. I followed Leo down the stairs. My parents' garden district mansion wasn't my first choice of venues, but it was available and large enough to hold our enormous families. Speaking of fam damilies, voices carried from the front of the house. The last thing I needed was to be stopped by well-wishers. I signaled for Leo to detour us away from the guests and duck out the servants' entrance. By some miracle, we made it out unseen. Any trouble in Sicily? Leo cocked his head. The hard set of his jaw concerned me. He obviously had something on his mind, but I knew my brother. He'd torture himself for days before he finally broke down and talked to one of us about whatever the hell was going on with him. Nope. With Lazio under lock and key, the Capos are pleased with their increase in revenues. He nodded. Ma's behaving herself. I gave him a yeah right look. She's driving Stuart crazy, but he's keeping her in line. I'm thinking about letting him off the hook. Two months is long enough. Isn't that the truth? Speaking of crazy, Leo cracked a grin. Giancarlo was serious about giving back the money his father stole. It'll damn near bankrupt them, but yeah. I pulled my keys from my pocket, but hesitated. I saw the news last night. How's Dahlia holding up since her father announced he's running for president? It's a fucking zoo over there. She's on paparazzi watch 24-7. I'll be amazed if she makes it to the wedding today. He leaned against the limo. You're out now. The company is 100% legal. Why not put yourself and her out of your misery already? 
I had no doubt in my mind he was in love with Dahlia, and vice versa. Hell, they had a kid together. A kid he hadn't bothered to claim. She's seeing someone. He jerked the car door open. I'd expected him to tell me to mind my own business or to fuck off, but I hadn't seen that one coming. Whoa, dude. I'm sorry, is it serious? Hell if I know. He's some blue blood politician her father approves of. Leo hitched a shoulder. She seems happy enough. Screw that. Have you told her how you feel about her? He tapped his watch. Would you look at that? If I don't leave now to pick up your special guest, your entire plan will be ruined. Think about it. Women aren't mind readers. I called over my shoulder as I slid into my cherry red antique Maserati. The car would have to go once the baby was born, but I'd enjoy every second of her until then. Despite the power under the hood, I drove to my apartment in the French Quarter like a responsible adult, mostly. What can I say? I was running late. I told Nico we were going out to dinner at a new frou-frou restaurant she'd been dying to try. We'd get around to it one day, but I was in no hurry to drop hundreds of dollars on a meal that consisted of food that looked like it had been hit with a shrink ray. Tonight, we'd dine on filet mignon, lobster, and wedding cake. I pulled into the drive and waited while the gate groaned and creaked its way open. I'd been meaning to call the super about getting the damn thing fixed, but I'd been a little busy, running one-fifth of the mob and planning a wedding. For crying out loud, hurry up. I'm right here. Laughing, Nico planted her hands on her hips. Wow. My brain backfired. The woman was carrying my child, but you'd never know it from her slinky black dress. The filmy fabric hugged her chest and hips without revealing as much as a hint of skin, as if it had been spray glued to her body. I thought I'd save a few minutes and come downstairs so we didn't miss our reservation. She hurried to the passenger side, and I caught a glimpse of the back and the dress, or lack thereof. Except for a thin line at the top, she was bare from her shoulders to the swell of her ass. Jesus, Nick, are you trying to kill me with that dress? She slid into the car and ran her hand over her chest. You don't like it? I love it, but it's sexy. Smooth, Marco, real smooth. I couldn't exactly tell her 250 of our nearest and dearest would see her in it. Then again, what did I care? She was absolutely stunning. Like you with this car, I'm going to enjoy it until I'm too round to wear it. I'm not complaining, and for the record, you'll be the sexiest round lady ever to waddle the planet. I put the car in reverse and headed back to the garden district, the opposite direction of the restaurant. I have never and will never waddle. Nico turned and stared over her shoulder. You're going the wrong way. We've had a slight change of plans. My parents are throwing a little get together tonight. I told them we'd stop by before dinner. I avoided making eye contact. The woman could ferret out a lie like a bloodhound on a rabbit. You change the reservations? Pursing her lips, she continued to stare. Yep. I reached for her thigh, but thought the better of it. She'd know something was up if I left a palm-shaped sweat stain on her dress. My dad is doing surprisingly well. He was out of his wheelchair for a while today. That's wonderful news. She sighed and folded her arms. Shit, I'm messing this up. Nick, I was thinking, we should get away before the baby is born. Somewhere tropical, just me and you. No security, no phones, a real honeymoon. We had a real honeymoon in the bayou. Besides, we can't go anywhere without security, now that you're a capo. Once again, she sighed. I opened the glove compartment and pulled out two passports. Maybe not, but Mr. and Mrs. Frederick Fossbender can go anywhere they want. Nico rolled her eyes. All right, Mr. Fossbender, I'll go on a second honeymoon with you, but it might have to wait a few weeks. I sent the designs to some friends in Paris. And? I held my breath, waiting for her to continue. Launching her new clothing line meant the world to her, which meant it meant the world to me, too. They want me in Paris next week for a meeting. She glanced at me as if worried I would tell her she couldn't go. That's fantastic, Nick. I'm so proud of you. I brought her hand to my lips. I could tag along if you want. Kick around Paris while you work, then head to Corsica and soak up some sun. Her eyes brightened. I'd love that. I turned onto my parents' street and frowned. Despite giving everyone specific instructions where to park, some of our guests hadn't followed directions. Nico leaned forward and studied the cars lining the roads. I thought you said this was a small get-together. Small is a relative term. 
I pulled into the back entrance on the opposite side of the mansion from the tent and pretended my hand slipped onto the horn. Nico startled. What's wrong with you tonight? You seem nervous. Nothing. Does this sound weird to you? I hit the horn two more times for good measure. With any luck, my brothers had heard the signal and were in the process of quieting the crowd. It sounds loud. She shook her head and reached for the door. I love you, babe. My voice came out thinner and higher than I would have liked, but Nico didn't seem to mind. I love you too. She turned back to me and smiled her cover girl smile, and then it morphed into a kiss me grin. I jerked back. We didn't have time for kissing, not yet. Well, okay, now that I got that off my chest, let's go inside. She arched a brow. You're definitely acting weird. What's going on? Nothing. I hopped out, jogged to her side of the car, and opened her door. Nico folded her arms. I'm not moving until you tell me what's going on. I let my head fall back and squinted at the night sky. Damn it, think, Marco, think. Okay, fine, you got me. Maria and Alessio are here for dinner. I held my arms out at my sides. Surprise! Here? She climbed out. Why on earth would you have them here? Your mother is a complete snob. You're killing me, Nick, killing me. I forced a smile and took her arm. You're right, dear. We walked through the back entrance and into a dark house. Evidently, my family thought surprise proposals and weddings happened without lights. At least the place was completely quiet. Nico stopped walking. Where is everyone? Why aren't the lights on? Maybe the power's out? I tugged her toward the kitchen stairs. She pointed toward the microwave. The clock is working? I missed the first step, cursed, and forced myself to take several deep breaths. Sweetheart, please. I have a really big surprise for you, but I need you to trust me, okay? Nico slid her hand into mine. Why didn't you say that in the first place? Honestly, Marco, for a mafiosi, you can't lie very well. I bit my tongue and led her to the balcony overlooking the garden. The second we walked through the French doors, white twinkling lights illuminated the railing and trees. A handful of strategically placed spotlights lit us and helped to conceal our friends and family below. It's beautiful. Nico turned and gasped when I dropped to one knee before her. I took her hand. I should have done this the first time I asked you to marry me, but, well, I was an idiot. She pressed her hand to her mouth and laughed. Nick, a long time ago I told myself if I ever fell in love, it would be to someone who laughed at my jokes, even the bad ones, who wasn't afraid to kiss me in public, who understood why I hated spiders, and didn't tease me about it. She laughed again, but this time she did it through her tears. I promised myself I'd marry someone who loved movies as much as I did, who knew when I was bullshitting them, and was strong enough to call me out, who accepted my crazy family, who knew my secrets, but never shared them. Nico cut my cheek and sighed the sigh that told me I'd done something very right. I stared into her gorgeous brown eyes. The thing is, I promised myself I'd marry you, my best friend partner in crime, shoulder to cry on, and the love of my life. It's you, Nick. It always has been, and always will be. Will you marry me, again, tonight? The lights came on below. For the first time, Nico could see our friends and family standing on the soggy grass waiting for her reply. Maria and Alessio stood arm in arm, waving like a couple of excited children. Vittoria and my father beamed up at us. Even my mother cheered and blotted her eyes. Nico's hands flew to her mouth as she glanced between our loved ones and me. My, how? After what felt like an eternity, she gasped. Tonight? You've planned an entire wedding for us tonight? Dipping my chin, I grinned. I promised you we'd do it again. Yes, you crazy, wonderful man, yes. I stood, lifted her from the floor, and spun her in a circle. The crowd below cheered, and a band started to play Nico's favorite song. When the singer belted out the first few words, she whipped her head toward the sound. Oh my God, is that Ed Sheeran? Yes, it is. I love the way her eyes lit when she was happy, truly happy. Knowing I'd put the smile on her face made every bit of the aggravation and stress of planning a secret wedding worthwhile. How did you get Ed Sheeran to sing at our wedding? She jumped up and down, seemingly more excited about the pop star than her husband, but I wasn't worried she'd leave me for the ginger. 
A love like ours didn't come around often, and Nick and I were finally smart enough to hold on to it. Humming along with her favorite song, Perfect, I wrapped my arms around her from behind and swayed to the music. A few years ago, he did a duet with Andrea Bocelli. I called in some favors and got his personal cell phone number. Nico turned in my arms and pressed her forehead to mine. You're incredible. So are you. Nico rose on tiptoes and kissed me. Her lips tasted like warm blueberry syrup and promises whispered under the blankets. She tasted like my past, my present, and my future. My man Ed switched things up and belted out the next chorus in Italian, thrilling the crowd below and my beautiful wife. Sing to me, she whispered. I pressed my cheek against hers and did my best to harmonize with the man I'd paid a small fortune to perform. Nico sighed that special sigh again and melted against me. When the song ended, I gave her another lingering kiss. Maggie and Sean are inside waiting to get you dressed. I'll see you at the altar. She laughed and buried her face in my neck. You bought me a wedding gown? You know how much I love white dresses. This has been Single Malt Drama, a mafia romantic comedy, Bourbon Street Bad Boys Club, book three. Written by Catherine M. Hurst. Narrated by Charlotte Claremont and Aaron Shedlock. Produced by Bookworm Audio. Post-production services provided by Eric Sinestvet. Text copyright 2020 by Catherine M. Hurst. Production copyright 2021 by Catherine M. Hurst. All rights reserved. Be sure and check out Hot Mimosa, book four in the Bourbon Street Bad Boys Club. Thanks for listening.